Uh, hello, everyone, and uh, good morning from Alabama, United States. Uh, my name is Junlu. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Alabama, and um, uh, I'm a uh, my research interests. Uh, I mean, related to uh, ITS, service planning, operations, and uh, sustainable transportation. And I spent hey, Kara, and I spent two years. Uh, as a child demand mother at, at Vidal, Virginia Department of Transportation. And before that, I worked as a postdoc work with, uh, working with uh, Professor Carol Kogama at University of Texas Austin. And uh, I'm a member of the organizing committee and uh, welcome everyone and thank you for joining this online session and the presenters, thank you for being part of the program. And I'm so looking forward to your presentation. Uh, so meeting participants, if you have any questions during the presentation, please type your question in the chat box and we will try our best to monitor the box and get presenters notified about your questions. And again, thank you for being here. And we have also a co-chair for the session. Uh, uh, Christine, can you uh, introduce yourself? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, June. Uh, my name is Christian Jara. I'm a master's student at the University of Melbourne in Australia. Uh, I'm from Peru. and my research interest is in, in travel behavior, uh, how the, the, the automated vehicles are going to impact on the, on the travel behavior and in the public transport share. Um, well, I think we, we, um, we can start. Uh, our first uh, speaker is Jim Fu. Uh, he's a transportation PhD student at the University of Alabama. Um, he finished graduate work at the Chang'an University in China. Uh, he has engaged in several urban transit planning projects and crash modeling projects. In his research interests include the transportation planning and simulation, crash modeling, and trajectory data analysis. And he also has experience in using GIS and deep learning, deep learning solving transportation projects. Uh, enjoy the presentation. Jin, are you are you ready? Yeah, I'm right. Let me sh let me share my screen. Okay. Okay. You can see my screen, right? Yeah. Yeah, we can see. Okay. It. So thank you for the introduction and uh, good morning, good evening, or good afternoon to everyone. So my research topic is about constructing the spatial temporal driving volatility profiles for the connected and autonomous vehicles in the existing highway networks. And um, uh, what you need to remember is the driving volatility profiles. I'm going to introduce what it is and uh, how it can be used uh, in used for the connected vehicles and the autonomous vehicles. So let me introduce some background. So we are all talking about the autonomous vehicles. Here comes the first question: that how far we are autonomous vehicles? If you just ignore all the commercials issued by, released by the manufacturers and just concentrate on the reports and the research. You may draw the conclusion that the current automation, it might be somewhere between the level two and the level three. And the level two is defined as the partial automation and the level three is the conditional automation. In my words, I would say that level two is like a hands-free you don't need, need your hands when you're driving in the level two automation, but you have to keep an eye on the driving surroundings. And for the level three, it's just like uh, eyes free. You don't need to um, concentrate on the driving environment all the time. Just to get prepared to take into control and the sum of the situation. If you just uh, play with the words, you find that the level two, the partial automation, the level three conditional automation. They are all referring that uh, all these automations can operate safely under a specific or under a safe situation. So this kind of situation is required throughout the level one to level level four. And um, they have another word to describe this kind of situation. It is called the operational design domain for short, ODD. So so what is the ODD? From the definition uh, uh, defined by the SAE and the National Highway Safety Administration, it means the operating uh, safe operating conditions that uh, provide for the 
autonomous vehicles to operate safely. So here are two figures that can show the concept of the ODD. So the first one, okay. So the first one, oh, sorry. So the first one we could find that the um, traffic is very complex and um, we don't have enough confidence uh, to say that the autonomous vehicles can operate safely on these roads. So this kind of situation is not an ODD. But for the second one, we find that it's like a freeway and there are not a lot of cars and we could suppose, assume that it is safe for the autonomous driving. So it is an ODD. So, um, let, uh, so here comes another question that so how could, how can we describe this kind of situation? Um, you know, when we are trying to describe these figures, we may use the words like the road type, the traffic density, and also even the weather. And if you, you want to define ODD or describe ODD in your own city, you may, might use a lot of words to describe it. Uh, thanks to the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, they have issued a full or the comprehensive ODD feature taxonomy for this concept. And this is the um, this is the taxonomy they have, and we could find that they have they have the features from the physical infrastructures to the environmental conditions, uh, and like the weather and even the Illumin illumination. And with all these features, we can use this kind of feature to describe ODD. But here comes the question that if you really want to describe ODD or find or define ODD in your own city, you might need a very long list showing all the features and the details uh, to define it. And let's see what the manufacturers did uh, what the manufacturer, manufacturers did to describe their ODD. So here are two reports from the manufacturer. The first one is from Revo and the second is from GE. Before they uh, test and put their vehicles into application, they have to issue, they have to define their ODD. And from the Revo, we could find that they have some features like the road type, the speed range, and the, the weather and time of day. And if you just go through the GE report release, it's very simple. It only talks about the time of day and maybe a geofence geo, geo of the vehicles. So we could find that so when we are trying to uh, use this kind of ODD, uh, ODD in the real world, we have only have a limited uh, description to describe, it, to describe it. And the problem, another problem that is we cannot compare this, uh, the ODD defined by different manufacturers. Or we could say, okay, the light, is the light ring defined by Waymo the same as the GE? We don't know. So here comes the question that, what if we introduce some quantitative metrics to describe the ODD features? Here is a simple uh, instance. So suppose that we have a matrix or some values to evaluate the driving, driving surrounding. Or we will say, okay, from this value, we could find that it's volatile, the very strongly, and uh, it's not safe for the autonomous driving. But for this one, the value of the metric is very stable, and we could suppose, uh, assume that the automobile vehicles can drive safely in this situation. And this one with this value is an ODD. And this one with this value is not an ODD. So we have quantitative metrics and it makes it possible to compare, compare it between different uh, manufacturers. So here is the, the re key research question of this project. So the first one is what kind of metrics can be applied to describe the ODD features? And the second, and the second, how could we make sure whether the metric is a significant indicator of the traffic safety? So for the answer of the first question, I, I, I'd like to, to introduce the concept of the spatial temporal volatility. 
the driving volatility concept is raised by my advisor, Dr. Junyu, and also his advisor, also Khan. So it's actually, it means the, uh, uh, this kind of volatility mirrors the variability of the driving performance. And for the spatial temporal volatility, it captures the extreme maneuvers at a specific time and location. And here, the extreme maneuvers are identified, uh, are identified by comparing the, with the majority of the maneuvers. Here, I used a volatility score to describe this uh, volatility. And it defines as the time of extreme maneuvers over the total driving time as a spatial temporal cell. So here is the figure that's showing our concept. So we split the spatial and temporal space into very small cells like that. So for each cell, we have a volatility score. So with all, with after we mapping all of these cells onto a real map, we could identify the okay. At this time and this location, the volatility score is very high. That means at this time and this location, a lot of extreme maneuvers may happen, and this is not safe for the autonomous driving. So the second question we're talking about, okay, we already have metrics as the primary data. Can we make sure that our metric risk is associated with the safety concerns? Here, I'm going to use the crash data to testify our idea. So what I did is to plot all the crashes onto the spatial and temporal map we have from the previous part. And for the, um, for the yellow, yellow dots, these are crashes. And if the crashes are very close to a close to a cell that with a very high volatility score. That means the high volatility score may lead to uh, crashes. It may lead to crashes. And I use the linear regression to testify their correlations. So the data set I use is from the animal safety pilot model deployment, deployment project. They collected the connected vehicles data from a citywide, and uh, I just used the freeway and the expressway system to uh, test it, to show our results. And uh, I used the 2013 crash data the same year as the uh, Connect Vehicle Project. I used the crash data to testify the model. So here are the results. Mm, the first way I identified the thresholds of the extreme maneuvers. What I did is to plot all the accelerations and decelerations for different speed ranges. And for each ranges, we define the threshold as the mean, mean acceleration plus the standard one standard deviation. And then the acceleration above this value, they are considered as the extreme maneuvers. And for the deceleration below this the value we consider as the uh, extreme maneuvers. So here we, after we identify the thresholds and we developed the volatility files on the map, and here is a here is a short animation to our results. So here is a snapshot of the uh, one of the interchanges, and we could find that this map they contains the spatial information and also the temporal information. We could identify the blue color means uh, this the volatility scores are very low, and the red and the yellow means the volatility scores are very high. And with this map, we can uh, clearly identify the weak points of the network. So for the illustration, we just choose three typical uh, sites to uh, to illustrate our result. Uh, in the chain, the ramps and also the normal, the common segment segments. So we could find uh, here. Take this for the instance. Um, the we could find that uh, at the ramp. As the hour of ramps, the vertical score is very high, and we could find that these uh, areas are 
typical a uh, challenge for the autonomous driving, but for the most of the common elements, uh, the volatility scores are very low. So we could regard this as ODDs and uh, maybe stay for the autonomous driving. So here is the model results. And uh, from the model results, we could find that the volatility score has a negative impact on the spatial temporal distance between the crashes and the analysis zone. So we could con conclude that the high volatility score means a more close to the crashes. And the high volatility score may lead to a high risk of uh, safety concerns. So here comes the question that so what this kind of profiles can use to for. Here I list the three potential applications. The first one, the this kind of volatility profiles can be compiled into the vehicle system or also the semantic maps for autonomous driving. So they can help to identify the uh, potential on-road risk to remind the drivers to take control of the vehicle at this time or this location. And also we mentioned before that so this provides a um, kind of unified matrix for different manufacturers. They can compare their defined ODDs or compare their performance of their vehicle, autonomous vehicles uh, according to this matrix. And for public agencies or for the tra traffic planners, it is very useful to identify how many or uh, where are the uh, potential ODDs in your uh, in your network uh, network systems, and for the weak points of the system, uh, for the weak points of the networks, you can have some uh, improvements uh, of the facilities to meet the requirements of the ODD, and uh, all these uh, segments, all this ODD defined you can use them to test all the application of the autonomous vehicles. And then in the future studies, I'm going to explore the ODD features from the wheel of autonomous vehicles. Since the uh, Ford and the Waymo, they have released their autonomous driving data, and we can analyze their uh, ODD features from the wheel of the, from the uh, data sets of the autonomous drivers. Here are the major references. And uh, this is my presentation, and uh, your questions are welcome. Thank you, Shin. Um, we have some questions in the, in the chat box. Yeah. Um, let me check. Richard asked, uh, what do you think the effect of COVID-19 is on the future of automated vehicles in the US? Oh, yeah, this is a very challenging question because uh, when talking about the COVID-19 and the automated vehicles, we're not concerned, only concerned about the technology, but also the uh, people's public views towards the this kind of COVID-19 because the autonomous vehicles they can provide as the provide the services like the taxis and maybe there can be a boom in the use of autonomous vehicles as the taxis but the problem is that the sanitize the sanitization of the vehicles of the shared mobility is a big concern to these publics. Uh, some people may show concerns about the um, uh, maybe concerns about um, they may might be affected because of using this kind of shared mobility, and they may show also show concerns. Okay, mm -hmm. Dr. Kakama has um, a question, and uh, she's asking if you uh, can define volatility some more. I'm sorry, what is the question? Uh, if you can uh, define volatility some mm -hmm. more. Oh, yes. Let me... 
Let me show this screen. Okay. So volatility score is just like, uh, okay, when we are driving on the roads, and uh, mm, we all know we are human drivers, and uh, due to the uh, complex complexity of the driving environment, our speed and acceleration are not that stable. If there are a lot of uh, extreme values of acceleration or deceleration, we may think that they, this is because uh, the complexity of the driving environment, and maybe there is a potential risk. It's just like when you are driving in the floor and suddenly all the vehicles approaching this area, all these vehicles just suddenly um, decelerate because of uh, maybe a crash or something. And uh, this is a potential risk. And this can be manifested uh, uh, in the uh, deceleration or acceleration. And you, this kind of value, we can find out the uh, frequent, fre frequent deceleration or accelerations on the road. And uh, you, this, we can, um, mm, mm, we, mm, we can marry it as the volatility score and uh, use this to manifest the potential risk. Okay. Um, uh, Dr. Kogaman said, um, how correlated are volatility and crashes in space? Mm, in space. Oh, let me answer that question. Uh, in, in our model, we, uh, we, captured, we captured the volatility in each a uh, special temporal sale, that means at an occasion there are 24 sales. I mean, for each hour there's a sale. So, and now we, for each sale, we try to find the, there a crash there than special temporal sale. I mean, there's, I mean, of course, for at a, at a very tiny location, tiny location, a tiny special sale and one hour, of course, there's no crash. But there may be some crash nearby, I mean, either the temporary nearby or the special nearby. And our model, I um, mean, uh, kind of models the relationships with the, I mean, the distance from the spatial temporal cell to the actual spatial temporal cell was crashes. And our our kind of model results shows that if the spatial, spatial temporal cell is, has a high volatility and there is highly likely to have, a, there's, uh, there's a high likelihood to have a crash nearby. So that's our model result. I mean, it's kind of, I mean, it's kind of special temporary related. Thank you. Okay, if there is no more questions, uh, thank you, Shin. Um, we can continue with um, with our uh, next speaker. Um, let me check. Ian Tao, you can start sharing your screen, I think. Oh, yeah. Yeah, sure. Can you help me clearly? Otherwise, I need to put on my headset. Yes. OK, cool. How many of you? Yeah, two of me. The one is the host, the other is the speaker. Uh, I think Yantel is our tech support. And my doctoral student. You guys can go ahead and introduce him. Oh, uh, yes. Okay. Uh, well, I thought the question is going to introduce. Yantel is a PhD student working with Dr. Carl Kokeman at the University of Texas Austin, and he's interested in shared automated vehicles, electric vehicles, and network, network simulations. He has contributed to traveler behavior modeling and analysis research under a Texas tech sub sponsored research project on the topic of smart transmission systems for Texas, and also ASF sponsored work on the sustainable transmission systems and a national renewable energy net work on shared automated vehicles for the first mile mass mile services to the public transit connection. Okay, welcome, Yen Tong. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thanks for being here. I'm glad to give this presentation. 
that I did with my advisor, Dr. Carl Kochman and Dr. Uh, Long Chong from uh, Latrobe University. It is about the shared automated vehicle operations on a bus line and corridor, and we investigated the variations in cover demand service frequency and vehicle size. As we know, the automated vehicles can fundamentally change the future uh, traffic pattern by providing cost, environmental, and safety benefits. Shared automated vehicles has uh, have the potential to offer uh, benefits through more benefits through a low cost on demand service that can be flexible in both schedules and routes. And here is a chance also for SAVs to um, replace public transit with better interactions with human-driven vehicles and riders, especially when we have different um, sizes of vehicles on, uh, of SAVs on road. So in this work, um, we, uh, we want to figure out uh, which size of the SAV is the best. So what, what we did, um, is based on a simulation. We used the microscopic traffic and passenger simulation called a Sumo software. We have uh, detailed interactions between SAVs, or we also called uh, A buses, with human driven vehicles, providing direction for best vehicle choices under different uh, travel demand levels. And we also did sensitivity analysis of uh, different scenarios including the traffic signal, adding um, parking base so that the, like the vehicles uh, do not all obstruct the, like the flow, and we also vary the service frequencies. Here the, um, the basic settings, um, the SAVs run on a fixed route by fixed schedule, in which case we mean the fixed free frequency. And the network is a 4.5 mile two lane one way roadway with speed limit of 30 miles per hour. We have two types of vehicles here. One is SAV and the other, is, uh, the other type is the background human driven vehicle. We um, dispatch them uh, into the corridor um, based on a Poisson distribution of 1260 vehicle per hour per lane which is about 1.4 vehicles per second. We have evenly spaced SAV stations every a quarter mile. We randomly generated the origins and destinations of the passengers. And our average trip distance is 2.37 miles and standard deviation is 1.4 miles. For those um, passengers or the SAV users, they will walk to the nearest station for next available SAV and alight at the station that is nearest to their destination. We have a simulation for three hours with a 15 minute uh, warm up time period. And we simulated using half a second time step. For the SAVs, they will um, stop at station when people are waiting or want to get off and any stop SAVs will wait for approaching passengers who are within 20 yards. And here I want to note that the, the, we assume the riders should uh, signal their interests um, in the SAV so that they know to stop at the station. And at high SAV frequencies, some SAVs will take the other overtake the other SAVs. And we also assume that uh, all the travelers have a value of travel time for different status, including when they are uh, in route, when they're waiting for SAVs, and when they walk to SAV stations or uh, le uh, leaving stations to their final destination. Now here is a figure of the uh, simulation I, I, I did. So here is the whole framework of my simulation. The orange boxes are the like the main framework. The blue boxes are the status of the shared automated vehicles. The green boxes are the like the judgments we need to check for SAVs to make decisions. 
and the um, yellow boxes are uh, the, uh, yeah the yellow boxes are the um, decisions of the like the final decisions of the essay ways to make. So at the beginning of the simulation, we read the network and travel demands information that uh, we input into the model. And then we created the itinerary plan of the riders, which include the origins, destinations, and their origin station and destination station. So in the in the main part of simulation, which, which is basically the, the logic, we manipulate the shared automated vehicles. Um, I want to mention three, uh, like basically the most important are the three um, status here. So when the SAV ha ha um, has stopped at the bus station, we check whether the riders are approaching. And if yes, we will wait for them. Otherwise, the SAV will, will leave the station. If the SAV is leaving the bus station, we check all the riders that's on board, <laughs> are on board and we uh, take a record of all the destinations they want to get off. And for the third case, which is a little um, complicated, when the SAV is driving toward the bus station, and there are a few things need to check. And I just briefly, uh, I'd just like to mention that we need to um, check whether a rider is going to get off, whether the riders are waiting at the station, and on top of that, we will check whether the seats are available so that the SAV can decide whether to say stop at the bus station or skip the bus station. So after that, um, after checking all the SAVs, we come, uh, we come to the next time step and until we reach the, uh, the stop criteria of the simulation. So here is the um, framework of the simulation. And now we come. We can come, come to the details of the vehicles that we used, as well as their uh, capabilities. So as I mentioned, we have two types of vehicles. One is the background uh, human-driven vehicle, and the other one is one type of SAVs. So here, um, the thing I want to highlight is, is that we have a uh, and the SAVs will start and stop slower than the background uh, human driven vehicles to protect the passengers. And we also assumed a reduced minimum gap for those um, automated vehicles. But for generally, we just assume the same uh, lane changing model and half holding model there. And also, we have um, boarding duration per passenger. We assumed a uh, 3.5 seconds for small size SAVs and four seconds for um, large, uh, relatively large size uh, SAVs, because we assume that uh, like the transaction for small size SAVs will probably be made through like smartphone, but for large SAVs, we we have chance to use like cards to to touch on when when uh, riders get on board. And I also want to talk about the travel demand we simulated and the way we dispatch SAVs into the corridor. For the, for the riders, uh, we um, assume six levels of demands from 100 passengers per hour to 600, uh, 600 passengers per hour. And for the uh, headway of the SAVs, we assume a fixed relationship between the level of the uh, passenger demand, the size of the SAV, and the frequency we dispatch the SAVs. So here we we introduce um, like a new parameter called load factor. It it is the desired desired uh, seat utilization of SAVs, or we call A buses. When we assume a lower load factors, uh, it means we need more frequent service. And the example is if we have uh, six, 600 passengers per hour and we assume load factor is one. And for five person uh, at SAVs and assuming that they are all fully loaded, we need 112, 120 SAVs per hour, which means we need to dispatch them every 30 seconds. And we cannot achieve this because all these SAVs cannot be fully loaded. 
So in our uh, simulations, we assume a 0 0.7 loss factor there, and we varied it from um, 0 0.5 to 0 0.9. For base case scenario, we simulated background flow of 1,260 vehicle per hour per lane, and we, we varied that in our sensitivity analysis, and we also test whether we have uh, uh, traffic signals and the parking base for the SA based. And I will talk about the details of them later. So here are the here now we show the results for the baseline scenario. The results are generated from the averages of five runs over the three hour simulation. We have average trip distance of 2.37 miles with standard deviation 1.4 miles. So the figure here shows the average wait time per SAV rider. You can see that small SAVs with small frequent services reduce riders um, waiting time at all passenger uh, demand levels. And then we can see that the gaps or the discrepancies uh, between uh, different SAV sizes shrinks with the increase of the travel demand, which, should, which is because of the like um, more frequent uh, a frequency that we dispatch the SAVs. The next is the average um, background vehicle travel speed. And we use this to show that how SAVs obstruct the background vehicles by stop and go. For each SAV size, the average background vehicle travel speed decrease, uh, decreases with increasing travel demand. This is because of more SAVs in the corridor and SAVs stop more frequently to accommodate more passengers. But we can see that the, uh, although we have a decreasing trend, uh, we don't have much uh, substantial uh, decrease here. So they are very close to each other. And I want to further talk about the total time here. And the total vehicle travel time here um, is the time of both background uh, vehicle and the uh, SAVs. And the total ride time is uh, the sum of the rider's walk time, ride time, and wait time. For these scenarios, we have um, background vehicles over uh, uh, 7,400, and the total SAVs dispatched depend on the demand and the uh, vehicle size, which I mentioned like there is a fixed relationship we assume between them. And from the total vehicle travel time, we can see that the relationship between the like different vehicle size and the increasing trend is quite obvious because uh, when we have smaller uh, vehicles and a larger demand, we have more vehicles dispatched. And the, and the, the SAV stop more frequently at, at, when we have a larger travel demand. And for the rider travel time, the increasing trend is quite obvious because we have more uh, travel demand there. At, at, um, and also when we have uh, large size SAVs, we have more uh, like a longer rider's travel time because of the infrequent service, which lead to a longer wait time. And we have uh, more stops at the stations for those uh, large size SAVs. So when we use uh, small size SAVs, we reduce the passenger wait time, but it can also increase the total vehicle travel time in the system. So we want to come up with a new magic to uh, analyze the total system performance. So here we introduce the total travel cost, which include the um, human, uh, human cost and the vehicle cost. For the human cost, we um, consider the driver's cost and the rider's cost. Uh, um, <clears throat> we assume that the rider's walk and the weight cost are twice the um, cost of the drivers. And uh, when the riders, uh, I mean the value of travel time, and for the cost of the, when they are on board, it's half of the drivers. And for the vehicle cost, um, we assume a larger cost per mile for the large size SAVs. The value of travel time we assume is uh, $15 per hour, and we assume there are uh, 1.2 persons per, per conventional 
uh, vehicle. And in our simulation, we have uh, 3% to 5% of all coil users are SAV users. And we further um, divided the total cost by the number of uh, persons in the system, which are the, um, the people on, uh, in the human driven vehicle and in the SAVs. So here we can see that there is a decreasing trend when we're increasing the SAV demand, which shows that the costs are more, um, can be split by more uh, riders uh, if we have a larger size, uh, larger SAV demand. And the 40 seat SAVs are outperformed by smaller SAVs at all passenger uh, uh, travel demand levels. And compared to the 40 seat SAVs using smaller SAVs would reduce the system cost and up to, uh, up to 5%. And we also see that the for the five seat and 10 seat vehicles, they are better at, the dim at a smaller demand, which is less than uh, 300 uh, riders per hour. And for higher demands, uh, over 40 passengers per hour, uh, it is uh, the 10 seat and 20 seat SAVs are better in the total system cost per capita. So that's for the <coughs> Uh, our base case scenario, and we further added base to uh, to our simulation. Here uh, we have the similar settings for all the others, except we added one lane um, besides the station, so that the SAVs can park at the extra lane. We assumed, and because we have an extra lane, we can like accommodates more than 10 vehicles at the same time. So here we assume that we have unlimited capacity there, but we follow a five-four uh, principle, which means that the first SAV comes into the corridor should leave the first. So here we um, presented the time reduction and the total system cost reduction. Um, the first figure, the background uh, uh, vehicle travel time, we can see that they reduce a lot because the um, SAVs has have uh, like a little obstruction for the background uh, traffic, and we see that um, the 46 SAVs are, uh, can benefit more from such implementation because, like the um, accelerate and um, accelerates uh, more uh, slowly, and they have more stops uh, along the corridor. It is the same that happened to the total system cost. Um, but I want to mention that um, if we look at the scenario itself, we can see that the 46 seater SAV still performs the worst and the trend keep the similar with the base case scenario. Although we see that the 46 SAVs see so a great improvement. So the next scenario is the case when we added traffic signals. Um, we have the same settings for the background flow, the load factor and value of travel time. <clears throat> we further added um, 90 seconds, uh, cycles of traffic signal, and we set them every uh, one day's miles, which is about two signals per uh, SAV station. Um, we can see that the decrease for uh, the, in because we added traffic signals, we definitely gonna see increase in the average background vehicle travel time and the increase in the total system cost. And we see that for different um, size of SAVs, the increase for them are like generally, generally the same for all, all types of uh, size of vehicles, except for smaller size of vehicles at a higher demand. And when we look at the total system cost per capita, generally it shows the same trend with basic scenario, but we see that 
uh, for small size vehicles, and we also have traffic signals there, they perform the worst when we have a high demand, which is like um, 500 passengers per hour and 600 passengers. So the last, we let's uh, take a look at the <clears throat> background flow and uh, load factor variations. The background flow, if we uh, have a higher background flow, we're definitely going to see a higher cost there. And we also showed the uh, showed the um, points by the color of the SAV to show um, a which kind, which size of vehicles that we can achieve the a minimum total system cost. So here we can say that for smaller demand, we would prefer to use um, <coughs> five seat SAVs, and for larger demands, uh, ten seat and twenty seat SAVs are more preferred. It is also the same when we vary the frequencies that we dispatch the uh, at the SAVs. So I didn't show the uh, the cost here because the <coughs> Um, because the co the cost is close to each other when the, when we um, change the uh, frequency of dispatching the SAVs, because um, because I think it's because we assume the fixed relationship between the uh, frequency, the size of the vehicle, and the passenger demand. And here we also observe the same trend that um, which uh, about which SAV is pre is preferred that we have um, smaller SAVs preferred at the low demand and tenses and tenses SAVs preferred at the higher demand. Okay, for conclusions, this study uh, evaluates the benefits of different SAV size uh, in a <laughs> SAV transit coil, and we simulated the interactions between SAVs and background traffic and SAVs uh, between SAVs and, and, and the transit uh, passengers. We tested uh, various traffic conditions and different configurations, uh, including the signals, the parking base. So for the take takeaways, we uh, the use of smallest, most frequent SAVs lowers uh, uh, passenger wait time and ride time, but results in more total vehicle travel time. Uh, 10 seat and 10, uh, 10 seat and 20 seat SAVs offer lowest total system cost per capita and 46 SAVs across most scenarios. Five seat uh, scenar uh, scenarios had a low system cost per capita at low passenger demand, but high SAV frequencies at high SAV passenger demand uh, slows the traffic and increase the total system cost. And for our future work, we will test higher percentage of SAV users in corridor, and we will vary the station spacings and testing higher load factors. Uh, we, there is also a chance to, uh, to optimize uh, relationships between the headway and demand, which now we just assume they are fixed. And uh, we can also allow SAV users to stand and increase the capacity of 40 seater SAVs. And we can also uh, partly simulate partly or fully automated background traffic with different uh, AV penetration rates. So that's it. I'll take any questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Gentile. Um, yeah, we have uh, some questions in the chat box. Uh, can you tell the difference if we replace the SAV, SAV yeah, with the regular shuttles or buses we have now. Um, you mean the difference in my simile? Um, I don't know. Uh, Dr. Liu, would you like to to explain the question? I'm just saying if we are doing the same the simulations, but we are saying those vehicles are regular human driven human mm -hmm. human driver buses. What's the difference? Where are the results be different? Yeah, yeah, I believe so. The first, the first is um, if um, if those SAVs are human-driven vehicles. The first is um, I, I think they were they were um, 
as I mentioned, it, they will um, accelerate and decelerate faster than the and as there is, we are assuming, and we assume um, um, a reduced minimum gap there, because uh, in that case, vehicles can stay close to each other when they are driving in the corridor. And and further, I want to mention that we don't we like we have few like uh, middle size vehicles now running in a corridor. And we will probably have those um, size of vehicles in the in the future. So that will cost a uh, cost like a different situation there. Because if we have different size of vehicles, we may have um, different um, like um, travel behavior. Like you will feel different when we have like a, si a large size vehicle beside you. Or a smaller size vehicle beside you when you are driving when you are uh, driving on road. Thank you. Okay, um, I I have a question of my own. Um, in the travel assumption, in the travel cost assumptions, mm -hmm. you say that um, walk and weight has uh, twice the 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 cost of the background flow mm -hmm. right uh, yeah. it's just an assumption or or do you estimate that it was twice the the cost um so um we assume that the, the there is a difference in the value of travel time so if we if we have that already that the the final result will be will be doubled because we assume that the value uh, value of travel time is doubled. And uh, yen yen thousand. I mean, I mean, because I I worked with Carol Kukman and uh, I mean, we 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 did similar studies. I mean, looking at the value of travel time. I mean, in vehicle, out of vehicle, and this those uh, those numbers are kind of from 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 surveys. There are reports telling, I mean, ask people how do you feel like when you are standing outside or walking, or when you feel like are you when you are driving or when you are sitting in the car, you can read and I mean, I mean, watching videos or work on your presentation. Exactly. So people have their ratings for their values there. So that is how we got this kind of two and a half of the vehicle, vehicle, what value of travel time in vehicle, auto vehicle. So walk means auto vehicle, ride means in vehicle, weight also auto vehicle. You just uh, think about it. It's rainy. It's so hot out there. When you are waiting, mm -hmm. you just think that the time is different. <laughs> waiting, waiting on the bus station or sitting in a car. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, actually, this assumption uh, is um, pulled out from the, I think, a uh, paper that you did with Salk Salkman. Yes. Yeah, that yes. paper. Yes. Yeah, that assumed uh, like what can. Uh, out vehicle travel time to test that for drivers inside the vehicle. Okay. Um, another question is in that in one of your conclusions, you said that use of the smaller, the smallest and most frequent TV uh, lowers passengers' wait times and riding times, right? But it, I, I, my question is if there is a automated vehicles and schedule um, trips. Are uh, the waiting times the wait times um, uh, are are not close to to zero since they are scheduled on automated vehicles? So how could be um, the, the 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 low the lowest the the headway it can can impact the the wait time? Um. I'm quite not follow the the question. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. So my question is, if there is automated vehicles mm -hmm. uh, and schedule uh, trips, so and the the people that is using the services is aware of the of the of the arrival time of the SAV, uh, so the waiting time it will be close to 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 zero. So uh, the most frequent, the most frequent uh, SAVR doesn't affect the wait time. 
right? Yeah, yeah. If if we if we dispatch the SAVs to the corridor more often, the riders will ex experience a shorter wait time. Um, yeah, because th there there is a more chance to come to an available SAVs in that case. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay, I think that that's all the questions. Um, uh, Dr. Liu, could you please uh, introduce? Thank okay. you, Jen Tao. Right. Could you uh, please? Uh, Sorry. Uh, Yen Tao, there's actually a, a either comment or question from Professor Hanadet uh, uh, asking about the what then the, the the cost of travel increases when the travel time increases, right? And also the travel time is related to the congestion level. So, I mean, I'm not sure. I'm I'm not sure about the question. I mean, uh, not possible to also model situations. I mean, so, I mean, my understanding is if if we are saying this is a small rural area where there's no congestion, so that means there's no traffic time differences uh, for different cars. Uh, so that means the, the the travel cost may be same to different for all the for all the people in the different vehicles. Um, I'm I'm not sure the question there, but this I mean, if you just have something to add to that, I mean, that would be very appreciated. Yeah, yeah. Th thanks for the comments. I, I think that's that what what we observe in the simulation, uh, which is showing this figure. Um, with that's um, we do uh, we did observe the congestion there, but that 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 was small, and we mentioned that the SAVs can obstruct the background. Uh, and uh, traffic, and here we 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 didn't see um like a big difference when we were varying the uh, SAV demand, but we did see that they they decreased. And and this kind of shows the like the congestion along the corridor, but gen generally the like the speed are quite stable. So yeah, it's it's not that um um that much like congestion we will see along the corridor, but we do see the SAVs obstructing the, 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 the background uh, traffic. Yeah. All right, thank you, Yen Tao. Thank you for your presentation. And uh, now let's uh, transition to the next one. Uh, uh, Dr. Kai Huang, uh, who received uh, his uh, doctor degree from Monash University uh, in Australia. And his his research interests focus on shared mobility, op, shared mobility optimization and travel behavior analysis, including the car sharing, car pooling, uh, tax sharing, customized bus studies. And he has published uh, over 20 journal or conference papers in the topics related to shared mobility. And he was also awarded uh, the Australian Re Road Research Board Transport Research Prize in 2019. And currently, uh, Dr. Huang is a postdoc research, research fellow at the University of Austin, and uh, his research project is to explore the connected automated shared electric vehicle planning and operations. Okay, welcome, uh, Dr. Huang, and please start your presentation. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Uh, and the audio volume is a little low, but I can hear you. Okay. Okay, guys. Uh, hello, guys. I'm Kai. Uh, now I'm in doing the postdoc fellow with Professor Carl Cockman. Uh, today I will uh, show one published paper in EGOA. Uh, I'm the first author, and the co-authors uh, co are the Professor Queen Ai in Monash University, and Dr. Gonzalo Curry from Tio Delft. Okay, uh, uh, the title of research is uh, Planning State Synchronicity and the Free Size of One-Way Electrical Cassering Systems with Continuous State of Charge Functions. Uh, this paper is an uh, optimization paper, maybe a little boring. <laughs> Let's have a look at the research. In the presentation, uh, I will give five parts. Uh, they are the background of the car development, 
and the, the research aim and objective of this paper. Uh, so the way is uh, mode, model formulation, and then I give a case study to verify the mathematic model. Last one is the conclusion. Uh, my research in my PhD focuses on the Bemek Kassem studies. For such a study, we should consider the upper level, uh, which is the network planning, and the lower level, uh, it's the operation strategies design. Um, uh, I will explain the details of the two levels later uh, and have a look at the benefits. Um, the Bemek Kassem have a uh, benefit to save the parking spaces. A survey shows that uh, about 55% um, uh, uh, answers will give up buying a new car if the car series provides service in the next five years. And, uh, okay. and the second one is to reduce the greenhouse gas emission. Another survey in five cities of America shows that uh, oh, uh, uh, about uh, 80 uh, at some of the time per year of the net uh, emissions will be reduced. And the last one is the uh, uh, Wemeka service is, uh, can provide the community service. Uh, it's, uh, it plays an important role to bridge the public transport and the private car trips. And uh, Here's through the case study, uh, we can see the very cassery uh, in many cities, uh, like the electric cassery in Shanghai, China, and, uh, uh, and the ICV cassery and the green sea car cassery in Melbourne. Uh, also, the Melbourne Council have decided to uh, set up the free park spaces in um, the city, uh, in the city area. Um, for the uh, for the car steering, if we consider its uh, operation mode, uh, we can uh, we uh, we can divide it uh, into the road trip and the one way car steering. Um, for the uh, road trip, it asks the users to return vehicle to the original pick up station, but for the communicators, they have they can't return vehicle to their uh, pick up station during their work time. In this way, the one way car steering is proposed that uh, allow, uh, allows them to uh, return vehicle to their destination. Uh, and then for the one way car steering, we can also divide it into the uh, a uh, station based and a free floating. The station based means uh, users should return vehicle to the fixed parking stations. And uh, for a free floating means uh, users can return vehicle or pick up a vehicle uh, in the free parking spots, like the uh, social free parking stations or the roadside parking spaces. Here shows the uh, well, considering and uh, my considering. Uh, now I will give a uh, example of how the very considering system operators. Um, uh, firstly, we can find uh, uh, people uh, want to use the uh, considering from S5 station at times four, but the vehicles is not enough in such a station. And then the operator will find uh, there will recall a row at a S3 station at times step three. In this way, he may uh, ask the uh, driver, his dri uh, hide driver, to relocate the vehicle from S3 station to S5 station. In this way, uh, the people in S5 station can use the car to his destination. Also, uh, for the remaining vehicles in S3 stations, some of them can be relocated into other spaces. Also, uh, they can uh, just be uh, parked in the same station waiting for 
use in the next uh, or next time step. Uh, for the two levels of the study, we can see in the uh, right figure, uh, the upper level is a strategic planning. It uh, should the planning the station location, station capacity, and the free size, because it means the number of vehicles in the system, and the personal size, and the charge station location within the given upper level planning decisions. We can optimize the uh, lower level, uh, it's the operational decision, like the uh, vehicle relocation, personal assignment, uh, decided to pricing, recharging behavior, and the reprocessing for recharging. Here, uh, I introduced the background of the Vimec custom study. Uh, now have a look at our published paper, the research aim is that uh, we, we are going to uh, maximize the total profit uh, for the customer operator uh, by deciding the long-term network planning, uh, like the station capacity and the free size. Uh, here through the contributions, the first one is how to check the vehicle state of charge. We call it SOC, means the battery capacity of vehicles. The first kind, first kind of uh, existing study uh, assumes that uh, vehicles should be fully recharged before its departure. Actually, it, it has the advantage uh, um, of a simple formulation, but uh, its, uh, its disadvantage is not realistic. The second kind of study is to check the associate of its vehicle. Uh, it can exactly estimate the SOC but it has a heavy computing burden. So our work uh, to handle the above gaps, our work proposed a uh, continuous associated distribution model. Uh, in this way, we can both exactly uh, check the associated vehicles and, uh, and then uh, we can save the computers, computation burden. The second contribution is that uh, we divide the large scale mixed intelligent nonlinear program into two sub problems. In this way, we can handle the computation difficulty here through the contributions. Uh, now, have a look at the model formulation. Um, uh, first, way is uh, uh, okay, let's let me introduce the continuous SOC model. Uh, in such uh, assumption, we assume vehicles in packed in one station can follow a, a continuous distribution. Uh, in this way, we just need to track the total number of vehicles packed in the station and uh, their mean value and the uh, mean value and the variance of the uh, SOC of vehicles. In this way, we can estimate their SOC uh, and then arrange vehicles to service the demand. For example, the longer, uh, the larger SOC of vehicles can use the to service the longer trips. Uh, here, so the an example, uh, suppose that there are 21 elect electric vehicles parked in traffic room 5 at uh, time is 10. Um, we assume the vehicles follow a uniform distribution. The upbound and lower bound of the electric uh, battery capacity is 60% uh, and 100%, and uh, we have the average value of 80%. Uh, the right figure shows the demand. First step is to uh, rank the uh, rank the uh, destinations. Uh, for example, for the first one, the destination uh, the traffic zone one, its total time is uh, one point two is the largest. So we give the highest rank. Uh, in this way, for the vehicle with the highest battery capacity, can use the two services such a demand. 
the uh, the next uh, two is the uh, total demand uh, uh, total demand of the vehicles living uh, uh, between the distancing and the origin of the traffic zone five. And then we assume that uh, it follows a uniform distribution. Uh, the upper one on the uh, left, right. Uh, we divide the vehicles into five uh, boundaries according to their destination. And uh, last uh, one through the right, uh, we can find the uh, red box. Uh, we find the uh, traffic room one, uh, which rank is four. The largest, uh, we can arrange vehicles with uh, whose battery capacity is larger than uh, 75 can service uh, those demand. Here's the example of how the continuous continuous SOC model uh, work. Uh, here's the mathematical uh, model of the uh, distribution. Firstly, we give a uh, uh, recharging and uh, discharging function, we assume that uh, they follow the linear function with the return time and uh, the travel time. Uh, the second equation, so last equation shows uh, how, how to calculate the average SOC uh, in the next time step. We can use the recharging and the discharge function uh, and based on the vehicle limit or arriving in the setting at the current time step. And then we can take the SOC in the next time step. Uh, here it shows the uh, completed model of, uh, of this paper. Uh, actually, the objective, objective function is to maximize the profit. And that this variables are the satisfied customer demand. We could do the casing the full size the static capacity and the uh, SOC of vehicles. Uh, uh, the last one shows the key constraints. It's a uh, continuous SOC model, uh, SO, as shown in this figure. Uh, here shows uh, how we solve such a uh, complex uh, model. In the upper level, we firstly give the uh, for the size upper bound and lower bound. And then we give a uh, static capacity in the up, up level. Up level. Uh, those uh, upper bound and lower bound for the size and the static capacity can be uh, seen as the potential values. Uh, within such a value, we can uh, conduct the optimiz optimization in the lower level. Uh, for the lower level, it's a nonlinear program. We use the uh, ruling horizon method to solve it step by step. And then we can get a local optimal result. The right one shows the right one shows the flow chart of research. Um, we can find the uh, as beginning, we give the free size and the capacity. We and then we use the ruling horizon method to solve the uh, low level uh, and uh, with a uh, set of price to update the strength capacity with the uh, golden section of them to update the free size. Uh, with this uh, ruling, we can get the optimization route. Uh, there are the free size, stressing capacity, and the vehicle relocation. Uh, next one is the case study. Uh, we conducted the case study in Sudo, uh, China. Uh, in this area, it has uh, 34 traffic zones. Its area is 278 kilometers square, uh, square. It has a population over 1 million and a total 620,000 trips per day happening uh, for the pri private cars. We divide the 30 hours operation into 20 and six time steps. Uh, the upper one on the right is the departures. Uh, uh, 
uh, factors and uh, the lower one, uh, the bottom of the right, uh, right shows the uh, growth factor to simulate the traffic congestion in the uh, network at the peak hours. Okay, so that for the uh, upper level, the strategic level decision, uh, we found uh, one week to the service uh, 11 chips per day with an uh, average drive time of 7.4 hours. Uh, the average um, uh, vehicle use can be up to 50% during the operation hours. <clears throat> and then um, we can also find the low satisfied travel demand rate happens at the peak hours. Like the morning peak hours, we find the uh, certified demand leaving the residential room is the lowest because too many people use the car center at, this, at such a time step at, uh, at, the peak, at the morning peak hours. Also, we can find that in the afternoon peak hours, due to many users will use the car center in the industrial room and the commercial room, the certified demand is very low. At the uh, at those two zones, uh, at the afternoon peak hours. Here's the result in the lower level. And we can find we can find in the morning peak hours lots of vehicles should be relocated into the residential room. Uh, and in the afternoon peak hours, lots of vehicles should be relocated into the industrial room and the commercial room. The real case in place uh, can handle the imbalance problem between the vehicle supply and the car demand. Here's through the SOC analysis. We find that the SOC, average SOC of vehicles in the peak hours is uh, low, lowest. And uh, we, uh, in the morning peak hours, mon uh, in the morning peak hours, as the average associate vehicles in the residential room is the uh, lowest. Uh, and uh, in the uh, afternoon peak hours, uh, the lowest hemp is at the industrial room and the commercial room. Um, okay. Uh, also, we tested the charging speed. If we use the fast charging uh, technology, we can find the average SOC is uh, high and the service rate is high. Uh, but if we use a, a fast charging technology, it, uh, the cost uh, for the operator is very high. So the operator should wait the uh, uh, considering income and the uh, operation cost. The last method is how we verify such uh, uh, assessing the continuous SOC distribution. Firstly, we give a simulation uh, model. We track the uh, SO, uh, the vehicle movement uh, one by one in the simulation, and then compare it with our results uh, get from the continuous SOC distribution. We found the difference of uh, the battery capacity of uh, uh, most of them are within negative or positive 10%. And then we use, uh, we built another exact um, optim optimization model to track the SOC of its vehicle. Uh, uh, when compared to our results with the continuous, continuous SOC, we found the profit and the average SOC are similar. It means our work uh, can give a uh, High reliability to solve the electrical carcinoma system. Here, so the concluding, um, uh, in this research, um, uh, to uh, solve the nonlinear program in the mixed internet nonlinear program, uh, we uh, use the lonely horizon method. Uh, good intersection search algorithm and the set of price. 
actually those uh, relaxants uh, makes the largest model can be solved. And uh, uh, the proposed model, uh, method in this study uh, enables us to handle the large scale network, which has over 5,000 vehicles in the case. Uh, and then uh, when compared to the simulation and exact uh, optimization model, we found that our SOC model can capture the SOC distribution uh, of vehicles at a station. The last one, the uh, last conclusion is that um, uh, actually we just can get the local optimal routes uh, because we use the golden search line, uh, golden section line search algorithm in this study. Uh, it's uh, the future research uh, to uh, use the uh, um, heuristic search algorithm to find a better route. Okay, it's the presentation. Thank you, uh, guys. All right, thank you. Thank you, Kai. And uh, yeah. thank you for this inter interesting presentation. And we have uh, we have questions from me and Dr. Professor Kokeman. Uh, I was, uh, well, sometimes I got the answer from your presentation. Uh, you, um, in one of your slides, you, you said the travel time was zone, and uh, I was just curious about what then travel time from where to where. Is the within the zone of the average trip distance travel travel time? I mean, from that zone. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, for the travel uh, for travel time uh, in 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 this study, uh, it means the uh, travel, travel between the OD pairs, we give a growth factor uh, to all the trippers uh, at the peak hours with a higher factor, maybe 1.5 in the morning peak hours, maybe 1.3 in the afternoon peak hours. Um, uh, we use such a simple way to simulate the, uh, simulate the traffic congestion in the network. It, it, uh, is, is, is the answer. All, all right, all right. Uh, where did you got the total time? I mean, between uh, the OD pairs? Uh, yes, between the OD pair, uh, we get is, uh, it's a real network in, uh, in SRP in Sudo, China. Yes, we have the uh, related data. Oh, you mean from a travel survey? Um, Do you mean? Uh, no, it's get from a GIS. Um, um, from uh, yeah, yeah, GPS from GIS. Um, sorry? I mean, where did you get information about the travel time between OD pairs? Oh, yes. Oh, it's, it's, uh, yeah, from the GIS. We, we, we get it. From the GIS? Do you mean GIS? Yes, GIS. Yes. Yes. Oh, so you calculate you calculated the travel time based on the distance between O and D. Uh, yes, it's uh, it's it's uh, uh, we did it in a simple way. We just uh, give uh, the average speed and uh, uh, get the distance from a GIS and uh, calculate the travel time. Yes. Now I understand. Thank you. Yes. And, and Kara has a, a question, I mean, actually two questions. How were your methods are uh, impacted by self-driving shared fleet? I mean, are you working on those of applications now? Mm. I mean, it's for the, uh, no, no, it's not, it's uh, optimizing based on the virtual network, it has, it's does not be used in any. No, no, not used in any city. Yeah, actually, I have a question. Oh, sorry. Oh, 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 I can I can find the current uh, question. The message in that fast Oh yes, uh, it can be used as a 
in the self-driving shared free rights. And uh, I think uh, if we use the uh, subtle uh, Cassarian research in the self-driving, um, it can make the uh, business uh, more easier because we don't need to consider the uh, personal movement. I mean, uh, the hard driver, after he uh, relocated the vehicles, how uh, they return to the uh, company? Oh, is there a technical issue? Yeah, he's in Shanghai. Oh. <laughs> yeah. We lost you for a second there, Kai, so we didn't get the end of your answer. Sorry. Um, oh, I, I yeah, I uh, hear hear that I mean, he's, he's, he can't do something. I mean, replacing those I mean human driver vehicles with the self driving vehicles. But I I mean I, I have a question following that is you 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 talk about the relocation of the vehicles. Who relocated those vehicles? Because right now yes, I mean, oh, they okay. cannot self drive. Yes, in the American Cassarian, uh, relocating uh, vehicle relocation is a, a big problem. Means. Uh, uh, the customer operator should hire some drivers to relocate the vehicle from the um, high supply zone to the high demand room. And uh, after the vehicle relocated to the after the, uh, the vehicle relocated to the high demand room, uh, the drivers should return to their company uh, or their working space. So, I mean, it's, uh, it's uh, we call it the personal movement. Um, who, uh, yeah, yes, I mean, um, the hard driver uh, relocated the vehicle. Uh, thank you, thank you, Kai. Uh, that, that's great. Yes. And uh, we just received a message from Perfect Talk from you, you, you am in, uh, Minnesota. And there is a special issue, transducer part D, about I mean related to this session, and everybody feel free to check it out. And now let's transition to the next speaker, our last our last speaker. Uh, let me pull up my little note. Uh, Sakio Ken, if I'm pronouncing it right, uh, is a translation research associate at the Cross Border Institute, University of Windsor. Uh, Canada. His areas of expertise include traffic simulation, discrete choice modeling, application of EIS in translation analysis and fluid modeling. Sakio has participated in several translation projects since joining this uh, the Cross Border Institute in 2012. And he holds a Master of Science and a PhD degree in translation engineering, and he is a member of registered professional engineers in Ontario and Canada. All right, welcome Sakio, and now it's your time. Uh, please uh, share your screen. You see my presentation now? Yes, we can see it. Yeah, we can see yes. it. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you for the introduction, Dr. Liu. Um, very warm, warm, warm welcome to everybody, and uh, many uh, thanks to all the organizer, uh, organizers of the conference. Uh, the, my presentation is uh, a component of my PhD dissertation, uh, uh, which looked at the demand of electric vehicles in Canada uh, that I completed under the supervision of Dr. Hannah Ma of University of Windsor. And uh, as a part of the research, we also looked at modeling the determinants of the battery electric vehicle acquisition timeframe in Canadian fleets. So um, whenever we uh, hear the term EV or BEV, uh, more often than not, uh, we think uh, of the lower tailpipe emissions associated uh, with these vehicles. And uh, when, I look, uh, when we look at the transportation emissions in Canada, uh, we see that they have been on the rise uh, for uh, many, many years. Uh, in fact, for the last three decades, they have increased by nearly 50%, and right now they are the second largest uh, contributor to the national greenhouse gas emissions. And uh, both passenger and freight travel have also uh, substantially increased uh, over the same time frame. 
So uh, as a solution to combat these emissions, uh, EVs uh, have been considered in the past and they have gone through the revival phases, but due to the lack uh, of battery performance, uh, they haven't been able to gain much uh, attention, um, both on the consumer side and as well as in the fleet side. Uh, but more recently, we see the battery performance has increased uh, um, considerably. Uh, and by battery performance, I mean higher uh, energy density and uh, lower cost. So it has brought the focus back on, uh, on, the, on the EVs as a viable solution to combat the traffic emissions or the transportation emissions. Uh, when we consider the EV suitability uh, in fleets, uh, we look at uh, various aspects. Uh, so in the Canadian context, uh, first of all, we see the energy that will be needed or electri electricity uh, to power these uh, vehicles. Uh, a major proportion of that is coming through uh, renewable sources, uh, as much as 99% in the province of Quebec. So. Um, in terms of uh, this issue, we, we, we don't have any um, imperatives uh, or any um, uh, deterrents. And uh, Canada also has uh, uh, a vast charging network, public charging network, uh, with more than uh, 5,000 uh, electric vehicle charging stations. Um, they are both level two EV charging station as, as well as the DC fast charging station, as many as 18 networks of public charging uh, stations are operating in Canada. So, uh, and this, uh, uh, this elliptical uh, um, sketch I, I'm showing here basically uh, shows the Montreal Detroit corridor, um, and it has uh, coverage for these uh, charging station all, all along. And the second thing uh, is that the most EVs that are available in the market have this extending range and the range anxiety issue is, uh, is no more. Uh, and tied with this to the fixed out uh, operations of uh, a majority of fleets uh, makes it a very uh, viable candidate to be adopted in fleets. And then uh, we know for sure that EVs have this potential of uh, reducing the emissions uh, as much as by 80%. Uh, of course, uh, this, uh, this does not include the power that they are going to be, uh, or the electricity they are going to be operated with, how that electricity is generated. But overall, if you, uh, if you compare it uh, with a gasoline vehicle, uh, over a course of uh, 300,000 kilometer, we see that uh, they are able to generate 80% uh, lower emissions than the gasoline vehicles. And now this, uh, this is an important factor for many mega organizations, uh, which basically are always trying to improve their corporate image in the public domain and thereby promoting their products. So we see uh, uh, an evidence of that uh, in, uh, you know, for instance, like Amazon that has decided to uh, acquire 100,000 electric vehicles to, for their fleet operation. So all in all, uh, the right conditions uh, are there. Uh, and uh, we wanted to see why without these conditions, uh, despite these conditions, we still have very negligible uh, EV uh, rate, EV, uh, EV market shares in, in Canada, in Canadian fleet. So with that, uh, the overall objective was to, uh, uh, to investigate the potential of uh, Canadian fleets uh, and for, for the acquisition of EVs and uh, identify the factors that could lead to early acquisition timeframe, as well as uh, look at the factor which could which could delay the utility of uh, acquiring these vehicles. And to answer, uh, to achieve this objective, we, uh, we, we looked at the answering the following questions. First of all, we wanted to know what is the uh, status quo for the fleet operation in Canada. Very little uh, to, to no data is available uh, in terms of uh, answering these questions. So in order to do that, we needed to collect data. And for that purpose, we, decide, we designed a survey. Further, we wanted to see uh, what kind of uh, um, attitudes uh, exist towards electric vehicles in Canadian uh, fleets. Uh, are the stigmas that are associated with electric vehicles still around? Uh, are there predictability or reliability in question? So we wanted to answer those kind of questions as well. 
And then uh, we wanted to investigate uh, whether this tech acquisition time frame would vary by sector. And by sector, I mean um, the type of organization uh, which uh, operates the fleet. Uh, so uh, we generally categorize them into two uh, for profit and non profit or corporate and government. So we wanted to uh, look into that as well. And then um, we also wanted to see if uh, the time frame would vary by fleet types. And by fleet type, I mean car fleets, uh, pickup truck fleets, and utility fleets, and so on and so forth. And finally, we wanted to come up with policy guidelines to enable fleeting fleet uh, to adopt these uh, vehicles in their fleets. So as I mentioned, uh, uh, in order to uh, do this research, uh, there was no data available. So we uh, designed a survey, CFAS, short for Canadian Fleet Acquisition Survey, uh, which uh, was, uh, which took about two years to design, including a stated preference component as well. So uh, in that survey, we collected information uh, from fleet operating organizations uh, on various aspects uh, from the general characteristics to the, uh, the, to the operations of their existing fleets. Uh, it was a very detailed survey and, uh, and, and we also calculated the perceptions and attitudes over various issues uh, related to uh, electric vehicle. So the final sampling frame, we, uh, we had a little over 1,000 organization coming from um, uh, Eighty-three percent of uh, which were from uh, Ontario, Quebec, British Columbia, Alberta, four main three uh, provinces, which account for nearly eighty-eight percent of uh, Canadian GDP. So, in that respect, uh, we have uh, we believe that we have adequate coverage of uh, these organizations who operate fleet. In terms of uh, the distribution by sector, we see that uh, our sample had what was predominantly. Uh, uh, for uh, corporate or for-profit firms, nearly two-thirds of the uh, sample. Uh, but uh, we had representation of uh, non-profit entities, which included various uh, agencies, uh, government agencies, and non-profit organizations like universities and uh, uh, agencies or municipalities at different levels. Uh, and by exploring the data, we, we, we had uh, we see some novel insights that we, we didn't have uh, information about beforehand. Uh, first of all, we see that uh, um, a significant majority of all these entities had no Im regulatory imperative in terms of procurement. So they were free to acquire these vehicles either uh, through local manufacturers or uh, maybe uh, through imports. So uh, it was quite uh, contrary to our perception in which we thought uh, there, might, there might be some regulations as well. Uh, although we see some government agencies uh, uh, who indicated that they are bound to require from uh, locally manufacturing, um, lo locally manufactured automobiles. Uh, in terms of EV prospects, uh, uh, nearly 20% of uh, all operating entities, fleet operating entities, they indicated that they had no plans to acquire electric vehicles in, in the next two years. So we don't see any, um, any race for uh, these uh, organizations to acquire EV uh, uh, quickly. And then around 16% uh, had absolutely no plans to acquire EV, EVs in the next five years. Uh, so there is some, uh, uh, there are some issues that, that, that makes these organization um, think that way. So we wanted to investigate those as well. And uh, in terms of charging infrastructure, uh, we have nearly 61% of all entities indicating that they have some, some form of charging infrastructure on all their fleet locations. So the, these, this, this kind of information help us to uh, guide the research uh, um, and it progressed uh, and, uh, in terms of model estimations. So uh, with respect to EV attitudes and perceptions, uh, we um, presented uh, various statements to uh, the, uh, the fleet operating entities, uh, the person who were filling up the survey uh, on their behalf. And uh, these uh, pertain to uh, key aspects of EVs, their, uh, the issues that they, 
there are with the EVs and as well as the benefits they can bring. So, for instance, uh, uh, EVs are likely to reduce uh, dependence on foreign oil, and we see 16% uh, uh, strongly agree. And um, similarly, we see uh, cost effectiveness um, also uh, had a favorable responses. Uh, the important issue here is to see that uh, overall the responses uh, were more on the green side as opposed to the disagreeing side. So this indicated that there is potential for uh, EVs uh, in fleets. Uh, however, there might need to be uh, conducive uh, uh, conditions for, for this uh, potential to be realized. So we took these responses and uh, ran an exploratory uh, factor analysis on them. Uh, in order to uh, find out some meaningful patterns in the observed data and uh, to be able to uh, interpret uh, uh, these responses in an intuitive and, uh, way and explain uh, the observed covariance. So uh, the relationship between variable and factor is indicated by a factor loading, as we uh, all know, and uh, higher loading implies a stronger relationship as indicated by these uh, line, uh, lines of various thicknesses. And uh, factor loading communicates how much of uh, variable uh, variance is accounted by the factor. So um, through, uh, through the uh, outputs, uh, we were able to, uh, this is a subjective technique, so it's a data driven. So uh, based on the results uh, of the factor analysis, uh, we, we came up with the following the constructs to describe the thought process of these fleet operating entities. So uh, we see that early adopter attitude, uh, which basically ties to uh, the fleet operating entities believing that the emerging technology, adopting emerging technology is not always a risky decision and that a fleet of uh, EVs uh, is, should be able to meet their operational demands. Uh, while the economically driven attitude uh, represents a thought process where these fleet operating entities have a positive attitude towards adopting EVs, uh, to read the economic benefits. Uh, while the obligatory uh, attitude basically uh, speaks of a mindset in which they feel like they, they are not convinced of the EV, um, EV's uh, effectiveness, uh, but they might feel pressure to be adopting them uh, uh, to improve their public image. And similarly, EV technology believer attitude uh, speaks of a mindset in which they, they feel like uh, they they have faith in EV technology, but they are not yet uh, willing to, uh, to adopt it in the fleet. Well, for them, it's probably too risky. So uh, the method of analysis we uh, used in this uh, part of the research uh, used the uh, ordered logic model uh, for the reason that the response variable, uh, that is the BEV acquisition timeframe, uh, for each model organization in our case uh, had uh, four observed levels. So the response variable in the specified model is uh, linked to the latent variable um, tau and star, which uh, could be thought of as a continuous measure of uh, VV acquisition time frame, And it is linked uh, uh, through the cut points or thresholds, uh, which the model estimates for us. Our V in here is the observable systematic utility of the model organization, which is a function of their general characteristics as well as the characteristics of uh, their existing fleet uh, or, and the information that we collected from them. Um, and if we assume the uh, error term, the double distributed, uh, the model becomes ordered logic in which we can calculate the associated probabilities of uh, different acquisition time frame categories. So uh, here, are the breakdown of uh, these categories in terms of the responses. Uh, so we see uh, that we, we, broke it, we broke down our sample into two subsamples of corporate and government uh, free operating entities just to see if there are uh, differences, uh, vast differences in their, in their planning to acquire electric vehicles. Uh, there, we don't see much differences. Uh, so, um, um, this is likely because uh, uh, it's just uh, the overall environment uh, for these uh, vehicle uh, to be acquired in fleet uh, requires some impetus from the government as well. And so far, we haven't seen that uh, uh, as such. Uh, so in terms of uh, the dependent variables, uh, we used uh, uh, 
various uh, uh, variables, and we broadly categorize them into two uh, two groups. Uh, the first one uh, belonged to or represented the general characteristics, uh, uh, for instance, number of employees, uh, dedicated uh, employees uh, taking care of fleets, uh, availability of on-site charging infrastructure, how many fleet operating sites the organization is operating, uh, uh, what was the decision-making uh, role of the person who uh, provided this information. We had all kind of uh, uh, personnel uh, responding to the service, including CEO, fleet managers, and uh, operational manager. And then um, the attitudinal constructs were also used as, uh, as the dependent variables. Along with that information, we used uh, the information coming from the, the, the existing fleet uh, in which we uh, have acquisition condition, uh, which condition they normally like to acquire their EVs uh, is used or that uh, new extent of fleet operations, uh, meaning the geography, whether it's uh, within site or whether it's uh, intercity, uh, uh, intra-province, all kind of uh, operational extent was uh, uh, collected from, uh, from the model organizations. Uh, fleet purpose, whether the fleets are used for delivering goods or whether it's for uh, providing services. Annual mileage and replacement cycle information are also used in, in the model estimation. Here I am uh, uh, presenting the results in terms of uh, what they employ. Uh, so rather than any coefficients or numbers, I'm just uh, presenting the takeaways. Uh, so for 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 a BV acquisition to, to be materialized under a shorter time frame, we see that uh, fleet operating entities in Quebec, they, 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 they show high tendency of acquiring BEVs in a shorter time frame. And there are a variety of reasons for uh, these, um, this result uh, mainly uh, is because BE, uh, Quebec is a, a very, um, Quebec electricity generation is uh, very clean and also they have a very aggressive uh, zero uh, emission vehicle mandate program. And uh, similarly, we see the entities that use car fleets for providing services, they are likely to acquire uh, uh, BEVs uh, more than any, any other type of uh, fleets and uh, for trip purpose. Corporate utilities uh, that have SUVs already existing in their fleet would like to replace their existing SUVs uh, with electric vehicles, BV electric vehicles, uh, in the shorter time frame. And uh, the government entities uh, that have charging uh, infrastructure at all locations, uh, they are likely to acquire it uh, under a shorter time frame. And uh, surprisingly, uh, the regulatory imperatives uh, that exist uh, in, in fleet operating entities uh, they are bound to acquire it uh, uh, locally manufactured or uh, vice versa. They are also likely to acquire it in the shorter time frames. Uh, on the other hand, under longer time frames, we see uh, uh, smaller size uh, fleet operating entities. Naturally, they won't want to invest. Uh, they don't might have not the capital to go for the electric vehicles. Uh, FOAs uh, with only one side, again, limited operations, uh, so they don't, side, they don't see a value in uh, uh, acquiring electric vehicles. And fleet, uh, fleet operating entities with CNG-based utility vehicles, which already think that uh, their, the fuel consumption of the performance uh, provided by these uh, CNG-based vehicles is, uh, is not going to uh, is, is, is going to be uh, more than uh, what the EV has to offer. So in terms of policy recommendations, uh, we see that uh, incentivizing FOEs with climate action plan is, uh, could be a real trigger for early EV adoption. And also subsidizing on-site charging infrastructure is very important. Uh, awareness campaigns highlighting uh, EV cost effectiveness, especially uh, in the light of recent uh, battery development is, uh, could be could also pave the way for EV adoption and also harvesting positive attitudes towards fleet electrification because there's a lot of stigma attached to the EVs uh, still and um, any campaigns on uh, providing more information uh, could result in uh, early EV adoption. Uh, in terms of key economic contribution, uh, we are now able to understand a little better uh, about Canadian fleet, including utility fleets. And uh, we were able to assess uh, some prevailing attitude, perception and concerns of uh, uh, fleet operating entities. 
uh, regarding EVs. Uh, this information never existed before. Uh, assessment of uh, acquisition time frame of PVs in Canada, uh, some uh, insights to that, and overall uh, uh, valuable contribution to the electric mobility uh, in Canada because this project was part of a major undertaking by McMaster University, which looked at the EV adoption uh, from consumer, from fleet, uh, from transit. So it, it, it lent itself into that, uh, completing that picture as well. And with that, I thank you for your time. and. Uh, if you have any questions, please uh, feel free to ask. Uh, thank you, Shaquille. This is a very interesting presentation and the, the survey itself, I feel like it's a very significant contribution. It's a unique, uh, it comes with a unique data set. And uh, I have several questions I mean, myself. I mean, uh, there's, a, there's a slide showing the responses, I mean, about the attitude perception towards the BEVs, I mean, showing for different questions, they have those strongly agree, strongly disagree. And I don't see a very significant difference between the, I mean, significant difference in the responses between the questions. It seems like they have, they provided the same attitudes for the different questions. Uh, can you explain? Um, I think it's the reason is that uh, these, uh, these uh, perceptional issues have been around for many, 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 many years, you know, and for the most part, uh, they they are kind of uh, in agreement uh, to these uh, the statements that we provided them to gauge their responses. And if you look at the description of these uh, uh, statements, they, in a way, uh, speak to the uh, speak to the viability of electric vehicles. So one way or another, uh, either you understand uh, EV, uh, EV feasibility or EV uh, the benefits of electric vehicle as such or not. So in that terms, uh, if we had, uh, and since the, since the survey was uh, you know, screened for people who literally uh, manage the day-to-day -day operation of fleets, so we were not surprised to see the consistently, uh, you know, um, agreeable results, uh, because uh, most likely, if EVs are to be adopted, uh, they will take care of these issues, provided the, the the supply side is taken care of. So I'm not I'm not surprised to see, uh, you know, uh, quite consistent responses uh, to those questions. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I mean, I see you have a variable showing the number of vehicles are uh, already uh, CNG, those uh, compressed natural gas um, uh, uh, adoption, uh, adopted. And uh, do you have a variable showing the number of DEVs they already have? In the model, you are asking uh, if we... Yeah, in the, the, in the model, in the model. Uh, the thing is that uh, we had a very little representation of uh, electric vehicle in the existing fleet. So uh, we used it as a dummy, but uh, it did not uh, uh, provide us any meaningful results. But, but, but you say there is a, there is a, I mean, 61% of those entities, they have some sort of on-site charging facilities. I'm, right. I'm assuming if they have the charging facilities, they at least have one BEV. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, they do. I mean, they, but again, as if you compare it to the overall uh, the share of, uh, you know, other uh, vehicles, uh, it's like uh, insignificant. I'll give you an example. Uh, the 2018 registration uh, for Canadian fleet, uh, which are available, uh, mm -hmm. basically indicates the share of uh, cars, electric cars in Canada is about 1% of 100,000, 106,000 uh, registration. So this is basically about uh, uh, one th 10,000, um, sorry, 1,000 vehicles. So, uh, but in terms of trucks, the share is 0.01%, which is very, very low, which, which is about 30 vehicles. So since our sample does not represent the whole universe of these uh, uh, fleet operating entities, so um, for that reason, uh, we might not have this kind of representation even. Even if it was, it's just too low uh, and it didn't, uh, again, uh, 
provided any meaningful result when we uh, when we ran it in the model. Uh, right. Thank you. Thank you, Shakil. I think uh, I think that's it. And uh, uh, we have just one minute to the I mean to the next session. Uh, uh, thank you, everyone. And uh, we have four uh, very great uh, presentations. Thank you, presenters, and thank you, audience. And uh, hope you can stay for the next session. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay. So I think we'll get the next session started. Um, <clears throat> my name is Jason Hawkins, um, and I'll be the moderator for this session. Um, my co-moderator, Elizabeth Sal, unfortunately had to back out because she had um, another previous obligation. Um, <clears throat> so this is track six, um, and the session is on land use, um, which I think you'll see over the course of this section, session, we are having a pretty broad definition of, of land use here. Um, a bit of an introduction of myself. Um, I'm a PhD candidate in civil engineering at the University of Toronto, <clears throat> and uh, I have sort of a background in, in civil engineering and transportation engineering. Um, I'm actually very excited for this session um, because I think we're really sort of displaying a wide range of methods and applications. And also, um, geographically, um, we're going to have presentations that are both urban and rural. Um, and interestingly, we actually have a couple presentations on um, applications in African countries, which I think is very interesting um, and sort of underrepresented in a lot of transportation conferences presentations, particularly sort of given um, the rise of a lot of those countries in terms of population and development, you know, they're going to be very important going forward. So I'm very excited about this session. Um, and so without any further ado, I think we'll get started right away. The first uh, presenter, uh, Gabrielle Lefebvre Ropars, is a PhD student um, in sustainable transportation planning. Um, and holds previous degrees in urban planning and civil, engineer, or, yeah, civil engineering. He's worked as a transportation planning analyst for the Quebec Ministry of Transportation and as a lecturer in urban planning at the University of Montreal. His research focuses on the application of distributive justice principles to different aspects of urban street design. So take it away, Gabriel. All right. Uh, thank you, Jason. Hello, everyone. I hope everyone can hear me well, because I'm kind of in a remote location. So uh, is my voice coming through okay in, yep. in an uninterrupted yep. way? All right, great. Yeah, perfect. So let me just share this. Uh, hang on. All right. So uh, like Jason said, I'm Gabriel lefebvre Pars. I am a PhD candidate at Polytechnique Montréal, and this is Research that's carried out with uh, my directors, Catherine Morancy from Polytechnique and Paula Negron from University of Montreal in uh, urban planning. So, um, there you go. I teached online and somehow now I can't, there we go. So uh, today we're gonna talk a little bit about why we should talk about fair street design because that's what this presentation is all about. It was named uh, a needs gap analysis of street space allocation. So why should we talk about fair street design? How do we measure fair street design? Uh, how fair is our current street design in the Montreal area in Canada? And where do we go next with this research? So why should we talk about street design and fair street design? Um, I think most of you have probably seen this image uh, in, on the internet at some point. I think it's a conclusion that we're drawing. A lot of people in our field are drawing that streets are being, uh, sp street space is being distributed uh, in an uneven way, depending on the mode you're using. And uh, you can see here that the driver holds a lot of the space for himself, while other users of other modes are being uh, cramped into smaller spaces and potentially unsafe spaces as well. But how do we quantify that? What are the uh, outcome measures? How can we measure the progress that we're making in uh, allocating the space in, an, in a fairer way between road users? That's the question that's, uh, that started this research. Um, so we've tried to see what Montreal does, and it does, um, Pretty similar to other cities that we've looked at is that uh, this is the downtown strategy. So that's kind of a development document for the downtown borough of Ville-Marie in, in uh, Montreal. 
and has a goal uh, that seeks to rebalance the public realm in favor of uh, active transportation, public transit, and green infrastructure. And we've tried to see what uh, follow-up measures do we have? How do they measure the progress of that goal? And it's basically they're going to measure the total length of streets that have been redesigned. And that's, that's fair but it doesn't really help you understand how much we've improved uh, in the long term. So it's an income measure. There's no existing large scale output measures of street space allocation. How much have we improved the actual uh, distribution and how much fairer is it than it was before? So that's what we're gonna try to do. Uh, how do we propose to measure fair street design? So we started out simple. Um, but we're trying to develop a framework to analyze fair street space allocation and applying this framework uh, using automated and transferable measurement and modeling techniques. So we're going to use data that's already been collected, that's already available, and that could, so the methods could technically be transferable to any other uh, metropolitan region with the same data sets. So uh, we're going to be developing, we've, de we've developed actually automated street uh, space allocation measurement tools. Uh, we're developing a fair street space allocation framework, which we'll see the first results of today. And then eventually we'll be modeling uh, alt alternative fair street design scenarios and seeing what the effect of those is on numerous other things. Um, so we we're using Mon the Montreal area as a study area and specifically 11 boroughs, the ones that you're seeing in dark blue, which are mostly the central neighborhoods with the, uh, I don't know if you can see my mouse, sorry. But this uh, the, towards the, uh, what you would call the Southeast, I guess, is the, um, the downtown area. And that's because that's where we have the most data to actually get a portrait of what, uh, what's in the streets. We're using a data set that's called the Roadway Inventory data set from the city of Montreal that basically catalogs in a polygon format all the uh, roadway or right-of-way surfaces across the island. So roadways, uh, cycle paths, sidewalks, medians, intersections. And so we're able to get a fine-grained view of how much surface is allocated to a roadway, let's say, versus cycle paths, and et cetera. But uh, we, we add on to that parking regulations to see where we have parked cars versus driving cars and from what time to what time, uh, number of lanes, posted speed, um, transit priority lanes, where are they, when are they in function, cycle lanes, bus stops, et cetera. So we're using, we're uh, improving this data set with a lot of other peripheral data sets. So uh, it enables us to see, for instance, this is you know just a street I picked out uh, at random, and it enables us to see that, for instance, in this street, more than 60% of the surface area is allocated to uh, driving cars. Then you get a little 10% to parked cars, uh, a little under 5% to cycling uh, or cyclists, and then the balance a little less, a little under 20% to pedestrians. And you can do the same for another street, and you see that there's less space for pedestrians, more for parked cars, et cetera, et cetera. So that's basically the portrait that we can have for each uh, street segment in the study area. Now we're trying to see, uh, you know, how could we see if, how could we determine if that's a uh, fair allocation? So it's going to depend surely on uh, the number of people that are using the, um, the streets. I see that there's comments. So I'm just going to check this. Okay, that's, uh, that's great. Um, so yeah, how do we know if that's fair? So first, let's just compare it to demand. Does the part of uh, the surface area allocated to a given mode correspond to the demand? So that's the, first, that's the first step that we're taking. So we're comparing that share of street area allocated to a given mode in a given borough. So what I just showed you, but aggregated at the borough level uh, for reasons of, you know, we, we hadn't pinpointed down the um, certain de details yet. So we weren't sure enough that we could go at the street segment level yet. So that's at the borough level aggregated, so share of pedestrian space, cycling space, driving space, and transit space. And we're comparing that to the share of uh, demand. So passenger kilometers traveled for that given mode in that given borough. So we're basically taking the travel, uh, travel survey and then uh, assigning it to the network. And by just subtracting one from the other, we get a, uh, a measure that goes from a um, you know, minus 100 to 100 theoretically, that gives us is the space for that mode in undersupply, in oversupply, or adequate for uh, with regard to the proportion of the demand uh, that this mode constitutes. So, uh, and then some of you might say, well, the observed demand is also a result of how the street is uh, designed at the moment. And so maybe you should look at potential demand. So what would demand look like if street was, if street space was allocated in a fairer way already? So we're, looking at the two profiles, so 
or observed demand, which comes from the uh, 2013 travel survey, the Origin Destination Survey. Um, we're looking at four modes, like I said, drivers, transit, uh, cyclists, and walking. And we include transit access and egress trips in walking trips. So that adds a lot of pedestrian trips to the walking mode. And the potential demand is that we're um, applying a series of criteria that's been developed by my, my advisor and previous students to um, determine if trips, motorized trip, could be plausibly done in uh, an active mode, given if it's you know short enough, if it's coherent as a, if its pur purpose is coherent with active uh, travel, and if the entire trip chain that it belongs to, the tour, does not necessitate at some point a motor a motor vehicle. So you can see the relative shares before and after we switch to that potential demand profile. So it's a profile that's you know heavier in active modes and lighter in uh, motorized modes. So what are the results? How fair is our current street design in Montreal, given this very simple analysis? Um, so I'm going to start with the car. So it says, you can see here, oops, sorry, I'm having trouble with uh, keeping control of Zoom. So uh, between 10 and 15% of the roadway is over allocated to car drivers and passengers when compared to their share observed passenger kilometers traveled. So that tells us that especially in the central neighborhoods, there seems to be more space then uh, the demand requires it when you compare the share of space with the share of demand. So that's kind of intuitive given the image that I showed earlier and I, I think the intuition that we all have uh, in the field. And then when you take people that could, you know, technically do these trips by active mode, so you take out a little of the car demand and, you know, throw it into the uh, cycling and walking bins, then you can see that the, this, Oversupply is actually much higher in most of the boroughs and especially in the central boroughs and some central residential boroughs. You can see the RPP and OU boroughs, which are uh, dark blue. Uh, so that's up to 18% of the roadway that could be considered uh, as an excess allocation when compared to the share of the demand. Um, on the opposite side, transit is actually, well, you see a uh, vast undersupply and especially in boroughs that are peripheral to the center because uh, we're looking only at uh, bus stops and HOV lanes. Uh, so even if a bus drives in a regular uh, driving lane, then it's, that's not gonna be considered a space allocated to transit. And so that's what we see. And then it gets a little less worse when we take out some motorized trips, so some transit trips to put into the uh, active bins. But still you see a major undersupply of, um, of space for transit when compared to its share of the demand. And now you obviously you're going to see the opposite for cycling. Uh, you see the PMR borough is actually the borough in town where the modal share for cycling in the fall, which is the travel survey period, is the highest. So it's around 10%, if I'm not mistaken, 10% of trips uh, in the AM peak, which is what we're looking at right now. And that's where the, uh, the needs gap is the strongest. And if you put all the trips, the motorized trips that could be done by bicycle as well, then you see a massive undersupply uh, in central neighborhoods and then even in some peripheral neighborhoods, even at the tip of the island, which is a um, uh, pretty suburban neighborhood. And uh, now the walking needs gap is an interesting thing because uh, both for, uh, for observed and for potential demand, you can see that there seems to be, according to this analysis, an oversupply of pedestrian space when compared to um, pedestrian demand and so we wonder do we have too many sidewalks and our sidewalks are our sidewalks too large in Montreal and that's not the conclusion that we came at I mean it's mostly that we are very bad at measuring pedestrian demand in travel surveys for short trips for access and egress to park vehicles for instance so we don't have a specific parking location of uh, car trips and so we can't know how far the person has walked to access a car a car um, a car basically. And with a 70% mode share, that means that 70% of trips have some um, active legs that we're not measuring. Uh, also, a lot of uh, uses on the sidewalk that um, are not related to A to B travel or utilitarian travel, but are, you know, window shopping or socializing that we're not measuring as well, that are pedestrian uses of the sidewalks. So that's definitely something that we're going to need to improve. But still, for the other modes, I, I, I think the uh, the the results actually are pretty coherent with what we were expecting. Uh, the fun thing about using travel survey uh, data instead of using, for instance, traffic counts to measure the needs gap between uh, supply and demand for modes is that we can look at where the people that are using the streets 
come from. And so that's what we're doing right here with the Ville Marie borough, which is these, uh, the downtown borough in the, in the AM peak. So you can see that this bar right there is the area with the colors representing the mode. So you've got blue pedestrians, uh, green cyclists, the kind of grayish is bus riders, and then uh, the dark gray is uh, drivers. And you see the needs gap for both observed and potential demand is the two bars uh, right beside it. And you see that the actual, you know, the pedestrian demand, the blue bar is lower than the um, pedestrian area. So that confirms what we saw on the map earlier. But then if you look at, let's say, internal trips only, that's 5% of passenger kilometers traveled in the borough are internal to, this, to the borough. Obviously, you see that active modes are over 50% of trips. So that if you were to design streets looking only to cater to internal demand, that would give you maybe another conclusion to think about. If you're looking at only attracted passenger kilometers traveled, then it's over half of the demand in the morning peak, which is logical because it's the downtown area. Then you can see that active and um, active transport and transit are over 40% of the demand, and uh, produced PKTs more is, a, is quite a small part of the of the demand. And through PKTs, which are a the third of what we observe on the streets in the borough are mostly driving trips and some transit trips as well. So what we propose is that if you look at everything except through trips, so people who are actually, you know, going to the borough, coming from the borough, driving through the borough, so local users and people who actually use the streets as destinations in that borough, then um, that would reverse the, 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 the conclusion that we were seeing earlier, because you can see that pedestrian demand is higher than the area that we allocate to them. And then it increases the needs gap for other modes as well, uh, cars included. So uh, it really, this is the way we have of asking the questions, who do we design streets for? Is it for through users? Is it for people who are actually using the streets in the borough? So I think that's a good way to, uh, to show, uh, to ask that question. So basically what we take away from that is that, well, we have a bias towards car user, toward car users, sorry, in central neighborhoods, especially in our street space allocation. Uh, transit users and cyclists are especially under uh, served, I guess. The, uh, the negative needs gap in favor of active modes and transit will increase when you exclude through trips like we just saw. And uh, we should really keep, um, we should really um, treat with care the results that we're getting uh, regarding pedestrian over or under supply because of how we model uh, pedestrian demand. And that's something that we've been improving since we've uh, written that paper. And so where are we going next? Uh, just to ch touch on that briefly. So we're measuring the street supply as uh, only with the link dimension of the street. So people, you know, coming, going through the street and using it as a transport corridor, but we're not measuring place, environment, uh, dimensions of the street, and we're not measuring the time allocation either. So that's things that we're looking at uh, right now. We're gonna try and get down to a finer grained uh, scale at the corridor and street level, and eventually apply other types of measures, because uh, that's a very equal distribution, egalitarian perspective, and then we're gonna be looking at something else. Eventually, so uh, maybe next year BTR, who knows? So uh, I'm just gonna take the opportunity to Thank all the people that found our research and thank you all for your attention. And I'm here for any questions that you uh, may have. Great. Um, we actually have quite a few questions, which is great to see. Um, so our first question, Devon Jennings wonders, how long are the street segments being analyzed? How long? Um, are we talking about just geometric length of the, uh, are you talking about the length of the total network that we're analyzing or? Um, I assume that's what he means. Yeah. I don't. I don't have the numbers. I. I, I mean, I should, but I don't have the numbers right. Uh, yeah. Oh, okay. Totally yeah. He could, he... I had that in a paper somewhere. I could. Uh, I could look for it if you give me a second. Okay. Because I'm, I'm. That's the kind of thing I'm really bad at remembering. So uh, <laughs> sorry, everyone. But I do have it in a paper that's right here. And I think I'm describing that because my advisor said you should really just describe that variable at some point. Do, 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 do. So I only have it for each borough and that's uh, quite stupid. It's probably something like, 
I'm seeing between two and 3,000 kilometers, linear kilometers is the estimation based on the table that I'm trying to summarize right now. Okay. So probably 2,000 2, linear kilometers, I'd say. Uh, and also wondering, is the paper available to you? Uh, it has been accepted for publication in the Journal of Transport and Land Use while we were uh, waiting for the results here at BTR. So uh, I can uh, I can send a link to the session chair, I guess, when it will be uh, eventually published and available. Okay, great. Um, Pedro Donoso uh, has a question. How do you incorporate um, traveler preferences in order to define fair use in this space? Oh, that'll be a question for the PhD student uh, after me. I'm just trying <laughs> to develop the simple, the building blocks of the method. And then if we want to um, take into account, you know, comfort, uh, the sense of uh, the perceived safety, for instance, is a very important factor in the uh, itinerary choices of active modes. And that's all stuff that we're not considering. We're doing an all, of no all or nothing, very basic assignment. So we're just trying to build uh, the, the basic blocks of the method, and then we'll be able to uh, to see how um, how that diagnosis, let's say, of fair street space allocation would vary if we were taking into account those types of uh, attributes into our uh, routing preferences. Um, but we're not really we're trying to do one thing at a time, so that's not taken um, into account for now. Okay, um, so there's a question about sort of at a detailed sort of street level, how do you account for variation of street space um, within segments? So for example, parking lanes that become left turn lanes or bike lanes that sort of weave into park. Yeah, so uh, that's why we actually use surface area instead of just something like average, uh, average width or just uh, center segment width is that we're actually subdividing the each segment into three meter intervals and then we're measuring uh, the width at that point at, at that transversal axis let's say we're measuring the width of each type of surface mm -hmm. so it we take into account because um, if there's at that specific axis there's a parking um, there a parking lane right there but at the next specific segment you don't find it anymore then that's going to be counted as driving space whereas it would be counted as parking space uh, in the previous segment so that's how we deal with it is that we it's somewhat a finite element method we're just decomposing the street into three meter intervals and measuring each at a time and then aggregating that into surfaces so that's why we chose surfaces instead of just width is that it enables us to have that fine grain uh, um, analysis. I guess. Actually, I have a related question is how do you differentiate between space that's allocated for car versus transit, given that it's often mixed traffic? It is, and that's something that we're uh, looking at right now. But for that specific paper, we were only looking at um, exclusive uh, transit space. So mostly okay. uh, bus stops and uh, Transit priority lanes is what we were measuring, but yeah, there's on, on a lot of streets. Obviously, buses will ride in the um, in the general lanes uh, for most of the day when it's not the peak period when they have dedicated transit lanes. So that's something that we're looking to better measure at the moment. Well, at the moment, I'm on holiday, but you know, in a, in a few weeks. Okay. Um, do you have any insights about how this uh, sort of space allocation will impact on land use? Let me think about it for a moment. Um, well, I definitely think that you can see that streets that have what you would call a fair allocation actually are more dynamic, uh, just commercially, for instance. So I'm pretty sure that we could eventually draw correlations with those uh, measures that we're developing and indicators of uh, commercial activity uh, or even um, residential values or prices. Sorry, English is my second language. So sometimes, you know, little vocabulary issues. But uh, I think that we could certainly correlate that with those, uh, those types of, uh, of values if we had the time to look at it. But certainly, I think fair, you know, streets that are distributed more fairly are intuitively streets that are uh, already attracting more and more um, interesting uses versus streets that are, you know, strodes or 
fast stretches of roadway with uh, tiny sidewalks or maybe less dynamic in an urban commercial um, perspective. Does that answer your question? Yes, I think it does. Um, and then uh, you sort of addressed this on some of your next steps, but there's a question about sort of in addition to area, there's sort of this time allocation of street space. So the example given is, could you consider fair allocation of space with a time, sorry. So the example that's given is sort of if you have car free days on a road, then that sort of from a time perspective would increase the allocation to uh, generally sort of pedestrians and cyclists. And so in terms of comparing fair allocation um, in addition to space, are you considering time? We we would like to. The thing is that the data that we have now is a travel survey that's carried out in the fall period from mm -hmm. September to December. So already we have, a, uh, so it, it, it represents mostly the, the, you know, mobility on a, on an average fall weekday. So we have data for every, ha uh, for the supply side, we have data for every segment for every half hour of the year 2018. So we would be able to capture those variations, you know, daily variations, uh, hourly variations, car free days or car free weeks or car free months on some streets. Uh, but right now we don't have the fine grain yearly demand to compare it with. So on that side, we're kind of, uh, we're waiting for, uh, we're actually working as well on expansion methods to, to uh, annualize travel surveys to be able to do that kind of uh, pairwise comparison. But certainly we're uh, working is also on ways to describe the way um, street allocation changes through time. And we have the data to do it. It's just a matter of finding the time to uh, analyze that as well. Uh, and actually you could do, a, if you had an annual way to measure demand, you could just aggregate that throughout the year and just instead of looking at street space versus uh, passenger kilometer travel, you could look at street space time. So, you know, uh, meters, hours, uh, I don't know if that really works, but anyway, uh, so you could just pile that up on both sides and look on an, on an annual basis, aggregated basis is the, is the distribution fair. And I think that would be an interesting thing to do. We're just waiting on the demand uh, side to be a little, uh, more representative of the yearly mobility because you've got such uh, drastic differences between summer and fall and winter mobility, especially in a city that has a lot of snow in the winter. So of course you're not gonna see as big um, active mode share in January that you're gonna see in June because that's the, there's a drastic impact. I mean, a lot of bike paths will close in the winter, for instance, in Montreal because of snow removal issues. Okay. Um... Does anyone else have any questions or clarifications on their previous question? Okay, um, well then, I'll so thank you for this presentation um, and we'll move on to the next speaker. Thanks everyone. So, for our next speaker, Robin, if you can uh, share your screen. Great. Um, so our next speaker is going to be Robin Workman. He spent uh, 25 years as international road specialist in low income countries. In the last 10 years has been at the Transport Research Laboratory as a UK-based researcher, working on various projects in Africa, Asia, Central America, and the Pacific. He has a master's degree in development studies and specializes in rural roads and development internationally. Uh, his specific interests are in remote sensing and geospatial monitoring of roads. He's currently undertaking a PhD in the assessment of road conditions from satellite imagery. So you can start, start anytime you like. Okay, thanks very much, Jason. You can hear me okay? Yep. Great, okay. Um, okay, so, um, yeah, uh, I'm gonna talk about uh, a concept called uh, accessibility factors, um, which is, uh, sorry, I'm just kidding. Um, 
yeah, the Sesame Effect, which is a concept developed to help with measurement of the Rural Access Index, which is uh, um, an index that was developed um, some time ago um, by the World Bank in order to measure rural access. Um, first, I'll give a, a brief background to, to the RAI. Um, so we, we refer to a rural access index as, as RAI. Um, then I'll look at the accessibility factors, why we need them, what they are, who defines them, and some of the details and components of, uh, of how they work. So just to start off in simple terms, RAI is, is defined as a proportion of the rural population who live within two kilometres of an all-season road. Um, and they define an all-season road as one which is motorable all year by a four-wheeled vehicle, excluding short interruptions due to extreme weather events, which can be up to seven days, uh, seven days a year. So if you look at the, the, the diagram, the, the dark road, dark, the road in dark grey is an all-season road. The shaded light grey band around it represents the area that's two kilometres from the road, so two kilometre of buffer. The road in brown is not an all-season road, um, so it could be a motorcycle trail or, or whatever. And the house symbols represent individual household units. The pale yellow circle represents an urban area, so because it's a rural um, indicator, we're not looking at urban, so we can discount those uh, areas. The six households outside the pale yellow area represent the total rural population. But only two of those households, um, coloured in red, are within two kilometres of the all-season road. So that essentially makes up our, our rural access in index. So uh, that, in this case, it would be 33%. So um, two houses out of six uh, represents 33%. Um, so why is RAI important? It was designed as an indicator of rural accessibility, uh, the knowledge that poverty is often higher in countries with low access to rural areas. Um, in that respect, it's an, an important development indicator. Um, also, households in more remote areas have lower levels of market participation, use less public services, so um, there are underlying factors in, in poverty as well. The REI was originally defined in 2006 by the World Bank uh, in this report shown, um, the key development indicator. The recommended calculation through, um, at that time was through living standard measurement surveys, um, which were conducted by local uh, national statistical offices or NSOs. At that time, there was no specific question that said, how far do you live from an all-season road? So uh, the team tried to interpret other, other questions and answers that uh, uh, they, they could find such as time taken to walk to the nearest bus stop, etc. So you, you can see it wasn't a particularly accurate uh, indicator at the time, but it was uh, measured in 60, I think 64 countries at that time. Um, it, was, it was promoted as, as a, a good indicator at the time, but it wasn't actually measured again till about um, 10 years later. And you can see that it was, it was measured by um, World Bank and um, DFID, and they, they did a pilot in, in eight countries. You can see um, some countries here that it was much higher, like 50% higher or 50% lower. Um, and that's that really sort of threw a, um, some doubt over, over, over the um, figures. So these differences prompted um, uh, rural access, the, the um, research for community access program of, of uh, DFID and World Bank to commission the current project, which is what we've um, been, been working on here. The aim was to produce a more accurate, repeatable and sustain, a sustainable way to measure REI um, here under this project. Uh, and we produced some supplemental guidelines to the 2016 methodology uh, to try and do that. Um, these emphasized involvement in NSOs and the need to coordinate and produce accurate measurements of REI. The guidelines also included a quality assurance process and established how metadata should be recorded and stored so you can revisit how the REI was, was measured. Um, so this new geospatial uh, method is, is calculated using three spatial data sets shown here. So firstly, population distribution, um, second, the road network, and then accessibility data, so essentially all season access. So we're going to be looking at the, the third one here. The methodology essentially consists of, of spatially overlaying the data sets in the, in the geographic information system and performing fairly standard uh, GIS calculations. So it's possible to conduct this analysis on a, on a GIS desktop 
uh, and the supplemental guidelines we produce show, show how to do that. They will be available on the, on the websites. We now um, link to SDGs, um, which are an important set of global indicators to address the 2030 agenda for sustainable development. So these followed on from the Millennium Development Goals, um, which started in 2000, so SDGs um, took over from these in 2015. There's not a specific transport SDG, but transport is actually included in a lot of, of, of the SDGs. There are 17 altogether. So goal nine is related to industry, innovation, and infrastructure. And, and under that indicator 9.1.1, which is essentially the REI uses exactly the same definition. Um, this is the only rural transport indicator. So um, globally, it's quite important uh, for measuring um, rural access. So um, after the adoption of, of SDG 9.1.1 in 2016, um, using World Bank methodology, um, uh, the, the, the custodian uh, of, of, the, of the indicator was established as a World Bank. Um, and there are also partners, so UNECE, UNEP, uh, and more recently Asian Development Bank have become partners in this indicator, so they all help towards um, measuring it. There are other potential partners, as African Development Bank, uh, etc., um, which I hope will come on board soon. So there's a tier system um, for SDGs. The RAI was promoted to tier two in December 2018, which means it's conceptually clear, has an internationally established methodology, but the data is not regu regularly produced by, by countries. So um, one of our aims was to get that promoted to tier one, which would enhance the, the measurement of RAI in a wider range of countries. Um, at the present, we've only found about 35 countries who actually measured uh, RAI. But to get to tier one, you need at least 50% of all UN countries measuring it on a regular basis. So there's quite a, a challenge there to, to promote it to, uh, to the tier one. So moving on to accessibility factors. Um, the, the original definition of RAI defines an all season uh, road. This was clarified um, from the original definition um, to, uh, to say that the road is, is all season if it's is not all season if it's impassable for more than a total of seven days over the course of a year. Because it was a very um, uh, sort of open ended uh, uh, definition before. So, one of the most challenging aspects of RAI is to define the all season status of the road network. It's recognised that road condition data wasn't always available for rural road, rural road networks, especially in, in uh, low income countries where generally they don't have resources to go and measure the condition of their, their rural networks. Um, and where it was available, it, <clears throat> it was often uh, inaccurate or out of date. So we had to find an alternative. We didn't want to put a, a big burden of, of uh, resources to, on the countries to go and collect uh, this data every year or every two years or three years because either it wouldn't be done or it wouldn't be done properly. So and we were looking for an alternative. Uh, this led to the developing accessibility factors as an alternative way to, to identify the all season aspect of a road network. So what are accessibility factors? Well, they, they provide an alternative means to estimate the all season status of networks if condition, condition data is not available. Um, you can use condition data um, if it's, if it's up to date and, and accurate, but um, often it's not, as I said. Um, they represent the, the likelihood of a group or network of roads being all season, and so are uh, closely aligned with the original 2006 uh, allowance of roads being temporarily unavailable. Um, accessibility factors can be based on variables that determine the all season nature of a road. So um, we found three main variables, which are surface type, uh, climate and terrain, and I'll go into those in a bit more detail in, in a moment. Um, to, now, these factors can be defined in a workshop with local engineers, transport operators, etc., without the need for onerous data collection. Accessibility factors are, are combinations um, of factors that are likely to cause a road to become impassable. So, as I said, first surface type, um, many road networks include a high percentage of unpaved roads obviously have a higher risk of being um, uh, not all seasoned uh, than, um, than paved roads. Uh, climate, uh, again, um, significant wet seasons or intense precipitation can cause flooding, landslides, etc. So 
get unpaved roads um, or roads in, in, in um, high rainfall areas are more susceptible to becoming not all season. And uh, again, terrain. So roads through hilly or mountainous areas that are susceptible to landslides or, or flooding in lower lying areas, um, again, are more susceptible to becoming not all season. Um, so, firstly, stakeholders involved in the calculation of REI should be involved in de determining uh, accessibility factors. Um, these stakeholders include road agencies in the country, um, NSOs, uh, any other agencies involved in, in defining REI. Um, but it's, it's essential that they do um, uh, liaise with, with local uh, staff, local engineers to, to determine this, this, this status. Um, so we'll look at surface type to start with. Um, unpaved roads, as I said, are more vulnerable to, to damage. Most road databases include surface type information. Um, so you can break down um, uh, the network between paved and unpaved roads. Um, if the mapping that is available, it's usually possible to produce surface type mapping easily using the standard GIS tools. Um, other Information such as classification of roads and maintenance regimes may also be, uh, be useful. Some roads will be part of a classified network, um, and some will be part of an unclassified network. So, generally, classified roads are, are have a high level of maintenance. Uh, unclassified roads often are not maintained at all. Um, but these definitions vary between countries. There's often uh, three different types of road classification, at least, and often two or three different types of road agency. Uh, responsibility for different uh, classes of road. Um, uh, you can see the, the, the photographs here we took in, in Malawi, which is one of our pilot countries. Um, these roads um, look fairly similar, but they are different, uh, all have different status. Um, in terms of climate, um, uh, we need to def determine the different um, uh, climate risks within a country. Um, there's usually several sources of climate and weather data within the country, so um, it, it should be fairly easy to access. Whoever calculates REI should consult um, perhaps a meteorology department, um, or they can use online sources like the, the Koppen classification system shown here, um, which also provides um, country level data as well as, as um, world level data. So the, the climate zones usually involve zone, identifying uh, zones in terms of risk of deterioration of roads. So uh, the likelihood that roads will be all season or not. It's recommended that countries divide into two categories, categories, so high risk and low risk. Uh, for example, again in Malawi, districts in the extreme south are high risk because uh, they have high intense uh, monsoonal rains. And the rest of the country is generally dry and most roads in the rest of the country are actually all season. So uh, quite a clear definition there. Uh, terrain, um, the third factor, so a country should be divided into areas that in indicate the risk to road deterioration, again high risk and low risk. Although digital terrain models are, are available, um, uh, the local information should be uh, sufficient for determining this risk. So if a road uh, has lots of landslides or slippery materials, then, it, then it's at high risk, um, or if it's uh, uh, in a flat area, it's um, uh, lower risk. These diagrams show how the risk and terrain can be combined to be to produce a, a map of the country. And this this is a this particular case is Myanmar, another one of our sample countries. So you've got climate risk and terrain risk, you overlay them and then you have a, a factor here which I'll explain in the next uh, next slide. So in terms of paved roads and unpaved roads, obviously the risk as I said before would be uh, different. Um, and if you look down the low risk um, for climate and low risk for terrain, often you have one, so 100% of roads should be all season. Uh, where if you, whereas if you have a high road, if, if we look at unpaved roads, you have a high risk of uh, a, you know, intense wet, wet season or a high risk in a mountainous area, then the factor would be something like the 0 0.8, so only 80% of roads would be all season. And these are just um, generic um, examples here, so that would have to be set for each, uh, for each country. Um, and so how do we ground truth those accessibility factors? Well, 
basically the, the district engineers are the ones who know the most about the uh, condition of roads and their, and their climate and their terrain. So um, if the map is complete and there's an in-country GIS capability, then uh, high-level zone factors can be re refined based on identification on the map. Uh, a measurement of lengths of roads that are all season uh, against what not all season can be quite easily worked out. This exercise was carried out in Malawi in the space of about two weeks. You can see they have a map, they've marked on the map um, the black line, um, the road that is um, all season, and then where the crosses are, these roads are, are not all season. So these are roads that are not um, motorable all year, <clears throat> with an allowance of that, uh, those seven days. Um, so we find that the, the, the district engineers are actually the people who know best uh, the local conditions of these roads. So that's how um, uh, accessibility factors are, are, were developed and are defined and are used in, in REI. Um, so I just like to um, there's a few key references there. Um, you can you can see. Hopefully, that the, I think the slides will be made available later. Um, but if I have a couple of minutes, so I'd like to just show an online tool that we've um, developed. Um, this, this presentation. And if I share my screen on my side, hopefully you can see that okay. So this is um online tool has been developed, which is based on open source uh, data for population um, uh, mapping and, and rural urban boundaries. So this is called the Rural Access Index Measurement Tool. Um, and you can see if you hover over the country, it will tell you what the calculated REI is using those um, online tools. And zoom into one of our countries, we've, we've looked at Malawi quite a bit over Malawi. And we'll zoom into Malawi. And you can see here, so um, the background to the, to the country is, is sort of a um, different shade of orange. Um, that is uh, data from a uh, uh, source called WorldPop, which is an open source population um, mapping, uh, which goes down to maps population, um, every country in the world, down to 100 by 100 meter squares. You can see that the um, the white lines um, surrounded by black are the all season roads and the, the black black buffer is a two kilometer buffer to show the, the, the rural access index is if you remember is is uh, population that lives within two kilometers of an all season road. So um, this is the open source data and if I use this put this slide across you can see on the right hand side we've actually got um, the in-country data we use, which is not, not open source, so we're actually comparing here um, in-country data to uh, uh, to open source data. And if you leave it long enough, then the, the, all the small um, roads will show up. Um, the ones that are not within the black buffer are obviously the ones which are not all season roads. Um, you can see here, if you compare the open source data to the in-country data, uh, REI for Malawi was 64% for open data and 63% for in-country data. So they've obviously got quite a good um, mapping source there. So this uses uh, as a mapping basis OpenStreetMap. So obviously OpenStreetMap is quite well developed and, 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 and uh, correlates quite well with the, the actual road, uh, road mapping sources in, in Malawi. Some countries we did uh, didn't uh, match quite so well. Um, um, but that was um, often down to the, to the reliability of the open source source data. And if I find a, yeah, you can see this is urban areas here, which uh, are excluded because they're uh, we're only looking at the rural the rural population. Zoom even further, you can actually see it's quite a good tool to see the areas of population which don't have connectivity uh, to all season roads. Um, which is quite useful for, for planning um, uh, road uh, development, in, in, uh, especially in low-income countries. I and mean, if you looked at this map for the UK, for example, then there's very few orange areas at all. Um, 
pretty much 100% of the country is covered by, is accessible by North Season, North Season Road. So um, obviously this, this indicator is much more relevant for uh, low income uh, countries. So I think that uh, concludes my uh, presentation. I'll stop my sharing there. I'll hand back to Jason to see if there's any um, questions. On the yeah, so we have um, two questions. Um, the first one is from Pedro Donoso, who asks, um, basically, I assume that the, or sorry, I suppose the accessibility indicator can gain much more if you can differentiate it by activities or places that can be reached. What do you think of this? Is it possible? Yeah, so um, this, is, this is generally a network indicator. Um, during our study, we did look at um, the, the possibility for accessing um, uh, services and, and transport services, and, and that was actually seen as um, we would have liked to include it in this indicator because it's already fixed. We weren't able to do that, but we produced a paper um, which, were, which looked at the potential for including other types of services, uh, accessibility, um, specifically for things like uh, motorcycles, uh, um, navigable waterways, which would which do provide access to people, but it wouldn't be within the remit of, of this indicator. So that's actually an important thing to consider is, is other types of access. Um, but I think we concluded that that was more appropriate to actually be either an addition or a supplemental to this indicator or on a, a separate indicator. And actually there's lots of indicators that do look at that, those type of the access to services, but this was um, primarily a network indicator. Okay. Um, and then we have another question um, from Paul Starkey that you partially sort of touched on here. Um, since the RAI was first developed, motorcycles are increasingly used for rural access, can often travel along a lot of these paths and trails that would be considered off-road, um, allowing villages to be sort of effectively on the road. So how would you deal with this issue? Okay, yeah, great, great point, Paul. Um, so there's, um, when the indicator was first developed in 2006, uh, motorcycle use was, I think it was developing in Asia, but it was very limited in, in Africa. And actually, um, even since the 2016 methodology, um, motorcycle use has, has increased uh, massively and people are finding actually very innovative ways to use, to use motorcycles. Um, <clears throat> certainly they, they can reach areas which are um, not accessible by, by um, by normal four-wheel vehicles. Uh, the infrastructure to provide access to motorcycles is actually much cheaper and is easier to, to install uh, and often will lead on to the development of uh, the opening up of, of areas and that initial access um, there. So um, unfortunately our, our, our input into this project is now finished, but some of our recommendations were around um, how you can extend indicators to, 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 to uh, account for these type of um, uh, of alternative means of means of transport. Okay, um, I don't see any other questions in the chat window, but we have a few minutes, so I have a question. Uh, so first, actually, I have kind of a comment that um, I spent some time working for the highway agency in one of the uh, Prairie Canadian provinces in the northern region. So. I'll be very interested to take a look at your uh, maps and see what you have there for northern Canada because I'm I know there's definitely some areas that are either only accessible by airport or by seasonal roads and so you know it's even in a you know highly developed country like Canada there's definitely regions where this is still a consideration. Um, yeah. The question I have um, is in one of the presentations yesterday. Um, one of the presenters talked a bit about um, some work that they're doing in Virginia, looking at um, basically flooding risk on their road network in some of their uh, cities. Um, and so I'm just kind of curious, um, you know, given, you know, expected uh, increases in flood events or sort of changes in some of these factors going forward? Is that something that you've considered in um, some of this work you're doing? Um, okay, well, first I, I posted the address of that website. Um, there's, oh, it's, a, it's open source data, anyone can visit that and have a look at their own country and see where, 
to amenity, um, so what the accessibility is there. But um, <clears throat> just to reiterate, it is based on, apart from four countries, it's based on um, open source data. So, and it's not um, endorsed by by the countries themselves. This is just a, a, a tool to stimulate interest and, and to, to show what, what can be done in REI. Um, but yeah, good point. In terms of um, uh, climate change and flood events, um, we we very much took the um, accessibility factors as the current situation. Um, but I, I, I do think these maps, these type of maps and GIS in particular, um, uh, do lend themselves for um, for for mapping, future mapping of, of uh, and prediction of of, uh, of road accessibility. Um, I think. Um, you know, there's, and also for, for things like um, like COVID incidents of COVID, that you see lots of GIS um, mm -hmm. is used now for, for COVID and prediction of, of uh, areas affected by by COVID. I saw one yesterday with, um, which was comparing population density to uh, building density to, to see the, um, the risks of not being able to social dis socially distance, uh, for example. Um, but I think that would be certainly a good potential use for um, for this type of resource to, to look at. Um, um, uh, uh, potential for for flooding and, and extreme uh, weather events. You know, we, we we very much use the existing open source data we, that we had for for the for the um, uh, climate uh, assessment um, included in this. So, um, uh, you know, there would certainly be something good to to explore in the future. Okay. Um, are there any other questions for Robin? Okay, uh, I'm not seeing any other questions, so thank you very much, and we'll move on to the next speaker. <clears throat> so our next speaker is um, Cheng Cheng, who's a postdoctoral associate at Singapore MIT Alliance of Research and Technology, or SMART. Her research focuses on the relationship between e-commerce demand and passenger and freight trips. She's also interested in using operations research to solve problems. She holds a PhD in civil engineering from the University of Melbourne. So I see you've got your presentation up. Uh, Hello everyone, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, thanks Jason. So I will show, share our research on exploring the relationship between the location, locational and household characteristics and online shopping on behalf of our research team. So my presentation will include five parts, uh, introduction, literature, literature review, method, results, and discussion and conclusions. Let's first start with the background. So as we know, nowadays there are more and more people try to use online shopping to buy their daily goods, especially in the pandemic. And at, this, at the same time, the parcel delivery demand increased a lot. However, the, the uh, impact of the uh, locational factors such as accessibility to shopping opportunities, on online shopping, remains poorly understood. And uh, only a few researchers have uh, explored the use of operational data from shippers or carriers in this kind of study. Therefore, our objectives are to explore the relationship between locational and household characteristics and online shopping driven delivery demand. At the same time, we try to demonstrate the potential potential of using carrier data as an alternative to the data from traditional surveys such as the uh, household expenditure survey and the travel, travel diary survey. From the liter literature review, we found that in the past, uh, case studies have been conducted for only limited number of cities and most of them are from the US or Europe. Only a few are from Asia cities and the majority of the researchers use the survey data, like I mentioned before. And in the, in the papers, the age, gender, and income are the most frequently considered factors. However, only little empiric work is being uh, conducted to identify the effects of locational factors. And in addition, 
we found that the impact of both locational and the personal characteristics are context dependent. It means that based on the resu results we, we, we found from the literature, the, the results can be very different from location to location. So we will add a case study in Singapore and uh, to do the case study, we developed a linear regression model and we analyzed the, analyze the model in the building level. So we consider all the residential buildings in Singapore, which includes around 54,000 of residential buildings. And the de dependent variable uh, is, is, uh, is, is uh, uh, the, de the dependent variable is divided from, from the data connected from a parcel delivery companies in Singapore. And the independent variables are selected based on the literary, literature review and the, the local context of Singapore. For the independent variables, we consider four categories of four independent variables, the organization level, the accessibility, household characteristics, and the housing type, which is uh, unique in Singapore. So for the demand data, the dependent, the, the dependent variable, we connected the data from the a parcel de delivery company, like I mentioned before, and the accessibility data was uh, abstracted from the open street map. The rest of data was connected, was connected from a synthetic population generated for Singapore transport studies. And this data set has been used in a lot of uh, transportation re researches in Singapore. So for the dependent variable, like I mentioned before, we connected the data uh, uh, from a survey, uh, from a deliver company. They provide us three months of parcel delivery records for the whole island. So we use the delivery demand per household for each building in three months as the dependent variable. And from the plots, we can see that the whole island has a good adoption of online shopping. The parts without like parcel demands are undeveloped, undeveloped zones, uh, industrial zones, parks, and uh, airports. For the independent variable, uh, in urbanization level, we consider the two indicators. We use the population density as a proxy of urbanization level, and we use the age of residential buildings as the proxy of the development, development year of the neighborhoods. So from the two distribution of the indicators, we can see that in Singapore, the population density and the residential building age are quite different between different uh, sub-room areas. For accessibility, we, we also include two uh, parameter, accessibility to shopping malls and accessibility to public transport. So you may ask that why we only inc include the like shopping malls in, in the re retail accessibility. Actually, we have did a lot of tests. So we tried different com combination. We also try to use the accessibility to, uh, to street shops, but finally, we decide to use the accessibility to shopping malls because when we use this parameter, we can have a more insightful results. We also plot the, the density for the shopping malls, bus stops, and the rail transit stations. So for shopping malls, this part is the CDB of Singapore, has a very, very high density of shopping malls. For public, trans, for public transport stations, the whole island has a quite good coverage, but there are still like uh, some some areas like the CBD and these three areas with a higher density of uh, rail transit stations. So to calculate the accessibility to shopping malls, instead of we use the number of uh, of shopping malls. Uh, Within a certain distance of uh, POI, we use the uh, uh, network accessibility to 
describe the describe the difference between the accessibility. So in the network accessibility, we consider the contribution of all the shopping malls in the whole island. The closer the shopping mall, the the more they contributed to the accessibility index to the POI. And the reason we use the next the network accessibility is because normally we, we are not only go shopping in the shopping malls that are close to us. We also go to the shopping malls that are like uh, very far away from us. For the accessibility to public transport, so we use the, the methodology de developed by the Singapore Land Transport Authority, which include the following steps. So first we calculated the, uh, first we identify the relevant service access points of a certain POI. These points are all the bus stops within 400 meters and uh, all the MRT or LRT within 800 meters. Then we calculate the working time to, to the SAP one by one. And the next step is to calculate the waiting time. So for waiting time, we need to calculate for all the service lines in uh, SAP. So the wait, waiting time is half of the time interval of two buses or MRTs between uh, in for for a service line and then we can get the total access time which is the sum up of working time and waiting time mm. the next step we can we we can use the total access time to get the equivalent doorstep frequency in one hour then we we can calculate the access index by summing up the the e EDF for all service lines in all the SAPs for one POI. And sometimes we can assign like different factors for different service lines. It depends, uh, like the factors are also recommended by the uh, LTA in Singapore. So for example, if we have three service lines uh, in within one POI and they have uh, like a uh, uh, EDF which equals to three, ten, and five, and uh, based on the on the recommended factors, we we assign the factor one to the to the to the service line with the highest EDF, and the rest of, of them we we assign uh, factors equals to 0. 0.5. Then finally, we will get like uh, the accessibility of the accessibility index of this POI is 14. I hope this part is clear for you. Then we get the distribution of, of accessibility to public transport is like in line with the public, with the density of the public uh, public transport stations. For the household characters, we consider the normal ones recommended in the literature, like household size, household income, and how also had age and also the vehicle ownership. Uh, for housing type, it's a unique uh, variable in Singapore because in Singapore, there are three quite different housing type. There are public housing, pub, which are develop, developed by the government, and the condos, which are, develop, which are apartments, and uh, they are develop, developed by the private property companies and the houses. Houses are also develop, developed by private uh, companies, but they, oh, but normally houses are titled with a piece of land. And the houses are always freehold, but the pub, public housing and the condos are, are normally 99 years old. So in general, condo and houses are much more expensive than public uh, housing. And the majority, majority of Singaporeans lives in the in public housing and normally public housing has better like the environment around public house public housing and the private ho houses are quite different that's why we want to include the housing type as a variable in the model so let's have a look at the results so in general the estimated model has a 
quite good fitness level, and most of the results are in line with the literature. For example, the high, uh, higher population density leads to higher number of parcel deliveries, and more recent de developments are associated with more parcel delivery. For accessibility, both accessibility to shopping malls and accessibility to public transport uh, has negative impact. That's reasonable because people with better accessibility um, will try to shop more on site rather than online. For household characters, uh, household income and household size has positive impacts, which are in line with the literature, but for ages, in our uh, in our results, we found that age age has limited impacts on the parcel delivery demand. But in a lot of researches, they find that age actually has significant impacts. For car ownership, we find a, a positive impacts that may because people have car to people have people uh, use the car to, as a strategy to save time and they may use online shopping as a further strategy to save time. For housing type, we found that people live in public housing shop more online than those living in private housing. That could because we couldn't consider some variables such as uh, the accessibility to Parcel delivery service facilities like the parcel, parcel lockers or parcel delivery and the connection points. And this kind of facility has a positive impacts on online shopping based on the literature. But the, and the, in, in Singapore, public housing has better accessibility to this kind of facility than private, private housing. So the impacts of this kind of uh, these kind of factors may be omitted in the housing type, and for this one we we may need further research to in, to investigate more. To conclude, uh, the influence of the local context on the relationship between a location and household variables on parcel delivery demand is not negligible. And uh, our research demonstrated the potential of using carrier data instead of uh, traditional survey data for this kind of research. So the fu future work, I think we should study the demand, analyze of multiple year years data instead of only one year data. And uh, it could provide valuable insights on the future impacts of online shopping, which is important uh, for the uh, land use planning. That's all from me today. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jane. Um, so we have one question in the chat box. If anyone else has any other questions, they can just post them there. Oh, good. Um, so Robin wonders, so he says, Singapore is quite a unique example. I, it's quite compact with good public transit. Do you think any of these results would be significantly different in an, um, a different city that's maybe not quite as compact or doesn't have the same transit? Uh, actually, the the results could be different from different uh, different uh, like cities, but in terms of the public transit. I, I didn't see like other researchers considered the public transit as a, as a variable, to be honest. Okay. Uh, so I'm, yep. not, I'm not sure in other, in other cities if the, like, uh, if the accessibility to public trans transport will have uh, like impacts on online shopping or not. Um, so June asks, Household incomes may be related to housing type. The income may also affect car ownership. So it's possible the main effect was taken by the income, not the housing type or car ownership. That's but why the model may provide counterintuitive results. So maybe, we, it, maybe, it, yeah, maybe you take a look in the chat window. Um, that might be easier to see. Okay.
I, so basically, I think the question would be um, people's preference for housing type is going to be influenced by their income. And that's also true for car ownership. So richer households would have. Um, yeah, I. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah I agree. That the bigger household may, but the same is that we already control the income and the car ownership in the model, and we still find that like uh, people have the people live in public housing has like a uh, higher uh, online shopping. So we we guess because we didn't uh, like do the like investigation yet. We guess maybe because the the impacts of like. Uh, the variables like the parcel delivery facilities is omitted in the in the variable of housing time. Okay, um, and so Pedro Donoso asks, can you incorporate some of the information about the goods that are delivered? So maybe different goods, depending on the good, it's sort of there's different frequencies of deliveries to different households. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, actually, we try we try to like uh, develop the model for different uh, like goods types, but unfortunately, the the delivery records didn't uh, provide a very like comprehensive uh, delivery type goods goods delivery types data. So we couldn't do this part of the research. But but yeah, we we want to do it. Okay. Um... Uh, and we still have a few more minutes, so I have a question. Um, okay. So you did a linear regression here. So your dependent variable was number of deliveries, right? Yes. Okay. Um, so I'm just curious if you'd explored um, some other uh, model forms, because I suspect that um, deliveries would be non-normal in their distributions and so violate um, the normality assumptions of a linear regression. So did you explore other sort of count regressions that might account for the fact that you might have a long tail where you have sort of a small number of people who are making or who are receiving like a large, receiving a large number of deliveries? Oh, we did lock transform for our variables. Oh, okay, because, okay, yeah, yeah perfect. Because we, we noticed that this uh, problem you mentioned. Perfect. Okay. Um, does anyone else have any other questions? Okay. Um, in that case, thank you very much, Ching, and we'll move thank on you. to the thank next you, presenter. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> so while we transition over, I'll introduce the next speaker. Our next speaker is um, Paul Starkey. He's an international consultant in integrated transport and transport services with 40 years of experience. He's based in the UK and is also a visiting senior research fellow at the University of Reading. He's worked worldwide visiting 150 countries, which I have to say is 148 more than me, so I have a long way to go. <clears throat> and has written many influential papers and books uh, Paul has carried out rural transport service diagnostic studies with policy implications in many African and Asian countries. <clears throat> His work with local researchers to understand the transport issues from the perspective of the user, operator, and regulatory authorities. In the past two years, he's led um, some multidisciplinary teams researching the use of three-wheeler transport services in Pakistan and how rural transport services have responded to changes in the conditions of rural roads in Tanzania, which I believe is what he's going to talk about a bit today, um, Nepal and other countries um, through road investments or road deterioration due to inadequate uh, maintenance. So uh, without for any further ado, um, Paul, if you'd like to start, that would be great. Thank you very much. Can you see the screen all right? Yes, okay, good. So um, I, I'm doing this uh, presentation with my colleagues John Hine and Robin. Robin gave the presentation one ago um, on the T uh, RII and we have been working with TRL undertaking a project for uh, the organization RECAP which is funded by UK Aid. We're looking at the trends in vehicle numbers and rural transport services 
and the implication for planning rural road investments in low-income countries. So a brief outline, I'm going to talk a bit about the research context, um, the different transport services types, the increasing use of motorcycles, the importance of motorcycle trails, and the findings from our surveys in Tanzania, and the implications for policies and practices. Now, um, we put in a uh, peer-reviewed paper for this, um, but for this presentation, I'm going to emphasize photographic evidence, qualitative observations, and the practical implications. I'm well aware that most people involved in this um, uh, are not very familiar with the type of issues that we're dealing with. And so rather than giving all the details, we're talking about the broad brush uh, approach. So the research context is it's a study to uh, uh, gain and disseminate greater understanding on how investments in low volume rural roads impact rural transport services and the mobility of people and their goods. The emphasis is on low income countries, mainly in Africa and Asia. These are countries with a gross national income per capita of over one of under $1,025, so less than $1,000 a head really, which is really, um, these are low income countries. The work involved quite a lot of international li liaison, not just with literature review, but also workshops and consultations and surveys in Nepal and Tanzania and some other countries, and I'll bring those in as well. Our outputs are and will be various reports and guidelines and papers on how transport services issues should be integrated into road planning in low-income countries. The outcome, we hope there'll be a greater understanding of rural transport services issues within the governments and the road authorities in low-income countries. And the impact in the long-term, medium-term, we hope there will be basically better transport services and more suitable roads that will lead to beneficial impacts for the rural communities. So, there is compelling evidence, this is from the literature, from our work, um, but um, in terms of impacts, mainly from the literature, that reduce levels of, um, that connecting villages to the roads or trails leads to beneficial impacts, beneficial impacts for the rural people, the women, the men, the children, including reduced levels of absolute poverty, reduced maternal child mortality, higher school attendance of pupils and teachers, and higher agricultural production. It also leads to positive effects on the national GDP and a positive influence of several of the key sustainable development goals. So rural pe people in low income countries do not generally own their own personal motorized transport. Although motorcycle ownership is increasing, in generally it is far fewer than say five to 10% of households. People rely on transport services, therefore, to reach markets, to reach medical facilities, for educational opportunities, particularly the higher secondary education, employment, and for social events. The rural transport services typically operate between these very small villages and the local market town or to the road network where they can carry on to a city. And they carry both people and freight. For users, the availability, the frequency, and the price are absolutely cu crucial because in the poor area, in the rural areas, the people really are low income people. So men and women in the rural areas want transport services that are timely, they can uh, predict them, they're affordable, very important, they carry their goods then are appropriate and safe. And although some of you would think um, they should be in a different order, this is the order that we get when we are, um, appropriateness and safeness is um, something they would like, but actually the availability, something there is more important. By the way, in many countries, it's illegal to mix passengers and freight in the same vehicle. Um, and yet this is inevitable for rural transport services. So the, op the for the rural transport operators, market demand is a crucial determination um, because this determines whether they're operating at all and what type of vehicle they use. If there are only a few people, you can use a motorcycle or a three-wheeler. If there are more people, you can use a saloon car. More people still, it could be a minibus. And if there are lots of people, which is very unusual in villages, you could have a bus. The operators are all in the informal sector. They um, are 
live on a day-to-day -day basis only. They generally operate their own vehicles or they rent their vehicles on a daily or weekly basis. They don't do accounts. They don't generally uh, produce a uh, report for their income and things like this. The, everything is on a day-to-day -day basis. They often use old vehicles because it's very low capital costs. Often the, the vehicles are over 30 years old, except motorcycles because these are A, low cost. You can get motorcycles new for about $500 in many countries um, and second-hand ones are even cheaper and they're so generally motorcycles that are less than five years old. The transport services generally operate from hubs, um, a classic hub and spoke system, generally the district hubs, the, the market town, and they travel from the villages to that hub and back out again. The safety looks poor but there's actually very dis little disaggregated crash data. Um, basically, the road safety statistics are based on rural roads, and that includes the um, fast roads going through rural areas, as well as these small, um, low volume roads. In fact, although it, it looks poor, and you will see the photographs, and I'll show you these photographs, and not the most dramatic ones, um, it looks as if safety is an issue. On the whole, it's not a big issue because the vehicles are traveling quite slowly because it's a poor road, and they have very few interactions with other vehicles. They're not meeting many other vehicles. And actually, most of the crashes on other roads are due to lots of interactions and high speeds. Rural transport regulatory compliance and enforcement are weak, as you can tell from the photographs. And the enforcers are generally sympathetic. Often they're local police officers who are living in there and they have to use these forms of transport too. Or there's a, maybe a corruption where basically they know that every time um, uh, a, a vehicle that's overloaded comes by, they get a small um, gratuity, should we say. Transport so services, um, the authorities, the national authorities are not really concerned or, or they're not involved with um, rural transport services because they are fairly small and they have to concentrate on the priorities, which for them and for most countries is urban transport, absolutely essential, and interurban transport. And so they don't generally have much time or effort to actually think about what is going on in the rural areas. The road authorities seldom engage with transport services. Well, why should you? It's not their responsibility generally. And so we've got this crazy situation where the roads authorities don't really think about the transport services. The transport service authorities don't really think about the roads and the, and, the, and the transport because they're dealing with other things. And so no one is doing what we are suggesting, thinking about what transport services are going to use the roads and plan the roads suitable for the local transport services. So a quick introduction to the transport services. Um, buses, as I said, you hardly see those in villages because they travel mainly on interurban roads. Um, a few will start off in a big village and travel quite long distances um, along roads because you need to make, um, you have many people and l large mileage, uh, kilometrage, in order to get um, profit on a bus. Um, passenger trucks, uh, they're, you can cram in quite a lot. These are a lot cheaper than the, uh, the buses and they've got high clearance. You have sideways facing seats and they're quite popular in, in, in some areas. They take quite a lot of people. Minibuses by far the most common form of rural transport. On the whole, they require quite good roads. And so on the poorer roads, you generally go for things like with four wheel drive, like Jeeps or pickups and pickups with sideways seat, feet, facing seats. These are kind of coming down to a smaller level of capacity and the lowest level of capacity until we get into the um, intermediate means of transport are the cars, sedan cars or estate cars. These can um, carry surprising numbers of people um, and, and they operate as along routes so that they, they, they operate a lot like buses um, uh, along routes. They're not point to point taxis. They all have their own advantages and disadvantages, their different costs, etc. Um, there are also intermediate means of transport and these are obviously quite common in uh, low income countries. In Asia in particular, power tillers, um, auto rickshaws used to be used mainly in urban centers, but they're increasingly going into rural areas in several countries, including Ethiopia, Tanzania, Nepal. Um, motorcycles, three-wheelers are, are quite good um, if, 
They can carry surprisingly few, many people. You can see it's basically a big motorbike with um, uh, a pickup body on the back that can carry, um, as you see, quite a lot of people, um, uh, 15 to 20 people. Um, motorcycles um, are, are increasingly important. We'll be talking about those. Bicycles um, still are used for transport services. This is actually a uh, bicycle rickshaw and animal power is increasingly like bicycles being replaced by motorcycles and three wheelers. Motorcycle taxes um, uh, are widely used in, in numerous countries. Many of these photos are from countries in Africa, but there's also one from Colombia there, one from Myanmar. You will also see these in Timor-Leste, in Indonesia, in most of Southeast Asia. Um, and, and these are point to point carrying one or two or more people um, um, in the rural areas um, and their goods. And so you'll see at the bottom, there's a, a sheep being carried along with some passengers in Nigeria uh, or Cameroon, sorry. Um, and um, so these are increasingly popular. Um, so one of the things we've been looking at is this um, huge changes since in my question to Robin, you know, since they started the RAI, um, motorcycle numbers have increased incredibly. Um, there, the the vehicle growth, um, uh, this, this graph shows the vehicle growth and the top line are the numbers of motorcycles. Um, and you can see how that has increased. So Tanzania is a, a large country, but with a, a small number of vehicles. Um, the total number of vehicles there is only just over 2 million, um, but the motorcycles have increased. So it was about 2,000 um, motorcycles in the year 2000, and it's now gone up to about 1.3 million. So there's a tremendous percentage increase. Now, if we go to a country like India, which is not a low-income country, um, uh, there we have a, um, uh, a similar type of thing, but the scale is just completely different. Here in, in the year 2000, we're talking about um, uh, uh, 30, 40 million, uh, million motorbikes and now there are over 150 million motorbikes so complete scale difference. Pakistan which is a lower income country um, similar type of thing you can see how um, it's a different scale again um, the motorcycle numbers went up from about 2 million in 2008 up to about 9 million now so um, the same type of thing and you would find this in almost all low income countries some are faster than the others but it is coming and it's because it is so efficient and popular in terms of what the people need for, for their rural mobility. So motorcycles are now often the most common vehicles on rural roads. These are very roads in, in, in Myanmar and Liberia and other places, um, but they, they are, um, this is just typical of, of the countries. And just to give you examples from our surveys, starting off with a survey of eight roads in Pakistan, these are rural roads, um, approximately 24,000 people cost our, crossed our counting, um, sorry, vehicles or cyclists or pedestrians cross the counting points over the days of the surveys. Um, and of these, 62% um, were motorcycles, 12% were vehicles with four vehicles, 12% were three wheelers, and 12% were pedestrians or cyclists. So that shows a, a typical in, in um, Pakistan. In Tanzania, um, uh, this is where we've recently done a survey, um, there were about 12,000 counts on the, um, to, that made the end number for this, the, this information. Um, the, the motorcycle um, component of the traffic was on the different roads, 90%, 84%, 83%, 84%, 95%, 90, 87%. So you can see the tremendous um, uh, importance of motorcycles on these roads. And the interesting thing about motorcycles, or one of the interesting things, is they don't just need roads. They can travel on small bridges, um, what were designed as footbridges, but are now trail bridges, and they can travel along footpaths or specially designed trails. So in countries like Bangladesh and uh, said Myanmar, they've, um, they've actually created special trails that can be used by motorcycles. Um, and, and this is um, extremely important because Motorcycle trails are relatively cheap to build and to maintain. They allow motorized access for the first mile to markets and facilities. So the first mile, so if you're living in a village, say seven kilometers from a, a road, um, if you want to 
to travel anywhere, you, the first seven kilometers, or first mile, as we say, in inverted commas, um, you, you are carrying it on goods on your head. If someone is sick, you're carrying that person. Um, every journey you take, and it's the same when going back. Um, they also um, allow access for the last mile for service providers who want to come in. So, um, and some of the motorcycle trails in Liberia were constructed after the, the um, El Ebola outbreak to allow vaccination teams and, and well, um, uh, 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 medical workers to get into the villages. Um, so they allow service providers to go into the villages um, in, in, to look at water sanit sanitation, etc. Um, and we found that when there are these motorcycle trails built, there is immediate effect on the, the life of the village. In Tanzania, we studied six roads and they had all different types of um, uh, int uh, interventions to make them all season, to make sure that they um, uh, were upgraded, but they were mainly used by motorcycles. So uh, here uh, there's a bridge and uh, a multi-segment box culvert, um, uh, which is a double lane, um, plenty of room, fine for buses and things like this, but really they're nearly all only used every day by motorcycles and just a few vehicles. Again, the road at the bottom, a nice embankment, is a nice wide road, but it's mainly used by motorcycles. Um, and you can actually get by with a much lower standard for the occasional larger vehicle that passes that way. And some road investments we saw in Tanzania were actually particularly poor for um, the, the, um, the, the motorcycles. These are parallel concrete strips with um, joiners across them. And the idea is designed for four wheel vehicles. So you can put two front wheels, two back wheels on and you can drive. And because you don't meet many people, you don't often have to get off it. You can just carry for a long way. And then yes, if you do meet another vehicle, you get off. But now these roads are being used by lots of motorcycles, but also by bicycles as well and some three wheelers. And if you have to get on and off, a surface like this, it's very dangerous. If any of you who go cycling or motorcycling, you will know that if you get a vertical edge like that, either going on it or off it, um, you tend to skid um, and crash. And it's the same with, as a bicycles. And so these things are actually not fit for purpose for the, their main audience because they were designed before people realized there were lots of motorcycles. So our findings from Tanzania, we found that motorcycles are increasing both as personal use and also as motorcycle taxes. Most rural people depend on motorcycle taxes for their, mo their mobility to get to markets, to get to medical facilities, etc. Bus services only operate on arterial roads or long roads linking many villages to a large town. Minibuses are gen generally only on arterial roads or they will serve villages close to the large towns or again on roads connecting many villages to a town. Provided the road is passable, improving road sections did not actually stimulate minibus services unless there was clear demand, which on the roads we studied, there wasn't. We were, had assumed that by improving the road, uh, you'd get better quality transport services. So um, instead of having to use motorcycles, the minibuses would come in. But the minibuses said, no, I'm sorry, there aren't enough people to justify going on, on their own. We'll keep it on other roads. So we learned, and this was surprising to us, it is a new finding to us, and it, although you may think it's absolutely obvious, market demand, rather than road condition is the key limiting factor for these transport services. On several roads, um, lower cost investments would have been adequate, I showed you the examples, and with lower cost investments that could have released fund to construct motorcycle trails. And so they could have actually connected all the, all the villages off the roads to allow them to, to, uh, to be connected. So then every village along that corridor would be connected um, by motorcycle trails. And that would make a huge impact on the rural populations. So the implications for policy and practice, rural people in low income countries depend on rural transport services. Um, rural transport services depend on market demand. So the best way of stimulating them is by somehow increasing or concentrating market demand. 
So our recommendation is that the local government should work with the transport authorities and the road authorities and the local transport operators to plan how to increase or concentrate market demand and some of the examples how to do this um, some of you will know that um, if you're going to an airport in a, a high income country you can there's an app or a phone center where you can call and you can get a shared van um, which is much cheaper than a special taxi and they basically consolidate the load Something like that is perfectly possible either through mobile phones, most villages and most, most um, families own mobile phones. Um, you can get um, low consolidation apps or through the phone. Um, route sharing is another good way of getting them. Basically, you um, agree, and in some countries they do this, that there is one route which is not so good and nobody wants that route, and there's the other route which is much better. But if all the operators get together and say, right, we'll take it in turns, every fifth journey we go on the not so good route, then um, everyone uh, benefits because that route then gets the transport services so that in in total more people are traveling and that and it is equitably shared between the different operators so it takes a bit of organization but it can work and obviously one of the conclusions is where motorcycles are the most common means of transport which is should we say in most low-income countries road investments should be proportionate to their requirements and the traffic Connecting off-road villages by motorcycle trails is cheap and leads to rapid benefits for women, men, and children. So countries should actually consider ensuring that all off-road villages are connected to the road network by motorcycle trails. So thank you very much. That is the recap of the organization that sponsored this. And that is my email address. And I'll be very happy to um, send you information or copies of reports for anyone who wants it. So thank you very much. <clears throat> OK, thank you, Paul. Um, again, if anyone has any questions, they can post them in the, the chat window. Um, we actually have two questions from your, from, uh, your colleague here, from Robin Workman. Um, so his first question is, do you of the motorcycle drivers in the picture were wearing helmets and even less of the passengers were? Is safety seen as an issue? Um, and then also are injuries from crashes recorded for rural areas? Uh, very interesting uh, question, Robin, thank you. Um, yes, um, as you will see in most countries, um, there is very, very little compliance with the helmet rule. It is um, legal in nearly all countries um, for both the driver and the, the passengers. In a few countries, they uh, allow the passengers not to, but um, it, it is actually legal, and yet you don't have it. Um, and sometimes you see, um, and in Colombia, I remember a, um, a, a person with um, two uh, crash helmets on his arms. He wasn't wearing one, but one on the other arm, and he would say, um, you know, basically I've got really good um, arm protectors, um, but I'm not wearing the, the, the thing. He had to have it because if he was stopped by the police, he would have to put one on and the pillion passenger would have to put them on. But um, if it wasn't stopped, they wouldn't bother. And that we've, we've done work um, in many countries in Tanzania. In a few countries, there is compliance in parts of um, Rwanda in particular, there's good compliance. If you drive through Vietnam, you'll find that there are some areas where there's a bit of compliance and other areas it's not. But basically on these remote rural roads and in our survey work in Tanzania, we found that on the more, there is a difference between the road, motor sections of the road and the sections of the road nearer the main road, they're much more likely to be wearing a helmet. It's not much more, not more often, it's just there's 25% chance of them wearing a helmet if they're on that section of the road, but in the very remote sections, it, it goes down to between 15 and 18%. So it's that type of thing. Crashes re re recorded. Um, there is somebody who has been recording this um, in a, a, a survey on it. It's not routinely recorded. A lot of re the crashes in rural areas do not get recorded. Obviously, if there are crashes, um, they can be uh, extremely bad. If people is not wearing a crash helmet, I would always advise people, I always use one if I can when I'm driving um, and I'm being a passenger on a motorcycle taxi. 
um, but it, it's not generally recorded, recorded and it's not. So yes, it's a big issue, but the local people do not regard it as a, uh, a particularly serious issue. So even where there have been crashes, um, you don't find a people often have their helmets as I said people often have their helmets on the handlebars um, but not be wearing it so it's a it is um, a widespread cultural um, lack of compliance. Interesting so Robin has another question do you see any barriers to road authorities and transport service operators working together? Um, well, institutional barriers at the moment are, are huge and, and they have been, they've lived in different silos for many years. They, they, um, if you go to the engineering people, the roads people, they're not very interested in transport services. Um, if you go to the other people, they're not really interested in roads, they're, they're only thinking about licensing their vehicles and things like this. So there is a, a problem, psychological problem and institutional problem because they're different organizations. But I, I think the uh, basically, it will need a policy decision at national level that they ought to collaborate. And then at the district level, this is where the lower level, this is where you're most likely to get active collaboration because the people there know these, exactly what is going on on the ground. Um, so I think there's potential for collaboration, but um, on the whole, um, uh, transport services agencies are underfunded and very small. Um, uh, where in, in, in contrast to the road agencies, which are much bigger, and they've got many more staff and a lot more money. Um, so I don't see any other questions in the chat window, but I have uh, a question and a couple of comments. Uh, first, I think it's really interesting um, sort of how your presentation discusses this idea of uh, improper allocation of road space and our first presentation discusses somewhat of a similar topic in, in a very different sort of context in Montreal. So that was, that was interesting to me to see that connection. Um, the question I have for you, um, so you talked a bit towards the end um, about some of these um, sort of <clears throat> service providers um, through um, sort of shared van services. And I'm curious, um, I know I've, I've heard that in a lot of these countries, um, a lot of people have sort of skipped over the step of having a landline phone and just gone straight to a cell phone. And I wonder if some of the changes we're seeing in, um, you know, in, in North American or European countries in terms of on-demand services, if you sort of see some of these um, maybe rural areas and some of these low-income areas sort of skipping over ownership of sort of a four-wheeled personal vehicle and um, sort of using some of those sort of dynamic services with their phones more. Well, so certainly the, the cell phones are, you know, increasingly used and widely used. And in some ways they're ahead of the industrialized country. For example, um, you can easily send money um, using a mobile phone in most countries and small amounts of money for a, a, a tiny amount of money. And so it doesn't cost you to send $2 to your aunt in the, in the village or something like that. It's very easily done. And so people are doing it um, all the time. And so you could, if you want to book your, your taxi, theoretically you could send a, a $2 example, um, you know, uh, uh, deposit to say, yeah, bring your vehicle to our, our, our village because we now have got 10 people that want to travel. Um, mm -hmm. Or if it's a motorcycle, you don't need that. So yes, cell phones are increasingly um, a viable means of, of, of communications, but also of consolidating transport demand. And also that the people can phone up the markets to find out what the prices are at the market to see whether it's even worth trans tra traveling in in recent bef before they used to go um to the market and find out what the prices and if the prices were bad they would either have to sell it at a low price or go back with their goods but now they just phone up to find out what the prices are in the markets um and and, and then decide whether or not to travel so actually uh, in some ways you know that they are coming along very quickly um with this type of technology but we're talking about an incredibly under-researched area. I mean, you, a lot of you would think this is really just very basic, you know, understanding of rural areas, but actually, um, uh, you know, there are, aren't many people and not many reports that have actually been working on this type of transport services and these type of issues. Um, and so we're, you know, in some ways it's ridiculous to say this, but it's kind of 
pioneering um, and, and so the suggestions like consolidating loads. Um, in the urban areas, it is working already. There are apps like Uber, which are operating for both um, motorcycles and three wheelers, as well as the um, car things. Um, so uh, you can use uh, motor in Lahore in Pakistan, large city in Pakistan, you can actually decide whether you want to take uh, a taxi or a three wheeler or a motorcycle to get you to where you want to go, all through mobile apps. So there's a tremendous, but um, again, the rural areas are very low income areas and the people in the urban areas often don't understand that. So we have, we, have, we have a new question for you um, from Eki, um, and I'm probably going to mangle your last name, and I apologize in advance, but Eki Kurtzberger, is there not a lot to learn from China in the 1980s in rural areas? So bikes going to sort of motorcycles and then small tricycles with motors, their motors also being used in agriculture in order to pump irrigation water, et cetera, also useful to carry people. Yes, exactly. You know, I know. I, I think th um, th that that um, process is already taking place. Uh, but I think the China example is more, um, much more interesting than that. And I've worked with um, the authorities in China on various things. Um, but uh, the, what the problem is that you've got these so-called private companies, which are actually parasitical companies um, uh, operating, and they don't make that. The reason why the I was talking about the minibuses don't go to, to these roads. They don't make enough profit. And, and that is true in China. And so I did one study with the a Asia Development Bank and um, we were looking at um, 40 roads that wanted rehabilitation. Um, and uh, there were no transport services on them. Uh, and the government had prohibited, they used to use, as you say, three wheelers, motorcycle taxis were very common. And um, uh, the, these, two wheel tractors um, or one wheel tra tractors, um, uh, but that all agricultural vehicles, uh, it, you're not allowed to have intermediate means of transport for transport services now. So these are technically illegal. Um, and so there were no transport services. And so the people going say 20 kilometers and because the, as the, the middle schools are now all in towns, not in the villages, um, people were going there on the backs of motorcycles for three or four children on the back of motorcycle um, and you know, this to me was a much less safe way than if they had allowed um, a small minivan to operate privately or a even a three wheeler. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, obviously there, 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 there are issues there, but uh, it, it is it is very interesting how that the um, it's coming to very similar conclusions. The private sector, or in this case, the you know, semi-public sector, um, aren't interested unless there is sufficient demand to make it profitable. Um, and therefore, that is why in most countries in Africa and Asia, um, you're using these smaller means of transport, but they can make a profit. Um, and that is being prohibited in China. Although, of course, um, once you're off the main roads, then many things happen. <laughs> Okay, um, I don't see any other questions. So um, thank you again, Paul, for a very interesting presentation. And um, I'd also like to thank just all of the speakers for uh, their very interesting contributions to the conference. Um, and we have a few minutes now um, until the next session starts, um, which will be starting at, well, let's see, it's two o'clock my time or one o'clock central time. Um, so again, thank you everyone. Um, and we'll take a bit of a break. All right, I guess uh, we can start now. It's uh, almost a minute past uh, 1 p.m. Uh, Central uh, US oh. time. Uh, all right, hello and welcome to the uh, transport economy session of the second online uh, bridging transportation uh, research conference. Uh, I'm Behrang Asemi, postdoctoral research fellow at uh, Queensland University of Technology in Brisbane, Australia. It's uh, the middle of the night here in Australia and it's uh, a bit cold. But uh, I welcome you all to uh, this session. Uh, I have had the privilege of working with uh, amazing organizers of this uh, conference. Um, I attended uh, many of the sessions and uh, they are all uh, very interesting. Uh, 
in this session, I am uh, co-chairing with uh, Dr. M.D. Rakibul Islam, uh, and uh, we have four presentations scheduled for this session. Uh, let's uh, begin with the first uh, presentation of uh, this session uh, by Sanu Mina. Uh, Sanu is an assistant professor at the Department of Civil Engineering, uh, Jai Naran uh, Vayas University in India. Uh, his areas of interest include transportation planning, behavior modeling, four stage travel demand modeling, traffic impact assessment, uh, construction techniques, and real time driving emissions. Uh, he also serves as a reviewer for case studies on transport policy, one of the Elsevier journals. Uh, his presentation today will be about uh, psychological factors affecting car ownership decisions among young adults. Uh, uh, the stage is yours, Sanu. Uh, we are all looking forward to hearing your presentation. Thank you, SME, for the nice. So, everyone can hear me? Yes. Yes, we can hear you. Okay. So, What we are, the topic of our presentation is uh, in fact affecting car ownership decisions of young adults. This is of uh, uh, Jodhpur uh, city. This is a case history of Jodhpur city. In this presentation, I am going to discuss about the problems of topics of the study, the literature review of psychological factor affecting the car ownership decisions followed by a methodology adopted for this study. Then uh, uh, calibration and validation of binary logic model, then key findings and policy recommendations. As we all know that the car is the most important matter of concern for the class because of their various serious and urban and very uh, urban and uh, like New Zealand, USA, Canada, Australia, Japan, and many have car ownership level more than 450 cars per thousand persons. And as per the Ministry of Road Transport and Highway Residential Report, the developed cities of India like Delhi have 157 cars per thousand persons, Chennai have 127 cars per uh, person per uh, thousand persons. Pune have 92, Bangalore have 87, Hyderabad have 72 cars per thousand population. The car ownership and their uses are increases in developing countries mainly because of rising income level as the car uh, they uh, try to uh, buy second or third. Irrespective of income level, there are many, many other factors which are affecting car ownership decision. Like social demographic variables like age, gender, number of persons in the family are affecting car ownership decision. Quality and perception about the public transport are also affecting car ownership decision. Likewise, uh, cost of buying and running cars, general requirement for work trip or non work trip or long short generally for uh, trip for shopping uh, purpose and laser purpose and for long distance, long distance before you would like the first uh, cars. There are also various psychological factors like status, comfort, independence, intention, aspiration, happiness, possessibility, attitude. These which are showing psychological factors of car ownership are related in the developed countries. A company History related to psychological behavior, decisions, what are to be limited in the future. So, this is really tries to identify the psychological factors 
and their effect along with uh, demographic changes in the field of education. This is really mainly concentrated on the young students because they will be the future decision maker of their family. The results of this study will help transport plans and policy makers to develop sustainable transport policies to reduce the car ownership and their uses in the future. The literature review. The very first study uh, about uh, the psychological factor affecting car ownership decisions was done by Wu et al. in 1999. And they found that majorly symbolic factor is affecting car ownership decisions in India. After that, Stag et al. in 2001 and 2005 found that symbolic and affective aspect affecting car ownership decision in the land. Likewise, many other researchers in the in developed and developing country found that various factors like identity, self-image, so social recognition, habit, intention to use a car, convenience, social orderliness, arrogant, uh, sustainability attitude, image conscious, safety, comfort, perception about the public transport are, are affecting car ownership. And the very recent study by Bojani et al. in 2019, they also found that those do not particularly like a car and driving right now, they also intend to purchase a car and want to drive in the future. This pro uh, car attitude shows the car will remain a uh, uh, strong status symbol. Then overall history, uh, and history methodology, this is an overall history methodology chart which I used in this screen. First step is selection of university or colleges for data collection. So I have selected university or college as a student because this history is mainly concentrated on your years between 29 years and generally maximum university students or colleges students lies in this age group. And at the same time, preparation of questionnaire on my card is, uh, is scale related to factor affecting car ownership decisions. So I have used five uh, point like card scale from strongly agree to strongly disagree. And the is to collect data from selected institutions. We adopted pen paper method of data collection to get more reliable data. After the end of data collection process, we will get around 956 responses. After that, the collected data is used for the development of latent variable using factor analysis and SPSS software. We used principal component analysis with very max rotation method for extracting factors. And total nine factor will retain on the basis of eigenvalue and variance explained. And these are the nine factors. First one is tax and environmental sustainability. Third, people, those who are more conscious about taxes and environmental concern, they will less likely to buy a car. In the Second one is comfort. Those who are coming from the comfort background, like those who have already have a car, they have the comfort background. So they are more likely to buy a car. Next one is PR and external influences, traffic concern, image concierge, car obsessed attitude, status seeker, congestion and parking concern. And last one is car machinery. So these nine factors along with demographic variable will used to predict the car ownership decision of young adults in the, in the near future. The next step is selection of independent variable for modeling. The dependent variable is decision to buy a car in the near future in the binary form, or you can say yes or no form. And the independent variable is psychological factor and demographic variable of the day. After that, we use binary logic model because decision maker have only two choices, buy a car or not buy a car in the near future and to calibrate the variable. So the form of So here we have, uh, here you can see that we have only two utility questions. Utility of buying a car in the near future or not buying a car in the near future. Here we assume that utility of not buying a car is zero. So if the utility of buying a car is more than zero, then it will indicate that young adults will going to buy a car in the near future. After that, check the goodness of it of the model equation physical, using logical sign, P value, P value, and McFord and Rowe square value, and select the best model. The model is not statically significant, or the sign of the variable in the utility equation were not logically correct. And it start the selection. 
variable process and repeat the process of processing. Model is again. When the development model is statically significant, so that's what we make up. Assumption side box uh, are the key steps for our owner's issue. After that, keep finding and, uh, and also the foundation of the study. The next session uh, is the uh, result of binder plot for our owner's decision in the near future. As you can see here, this is the utility equation of buying a car. All the variables in the utility equations are statistically significant and logically correct. Those individual whose quali education qualification is higher than post graduation level are more likely to buy a car in the near future with 99% confidence level. Those who are related with are more likely to buy a car in the near future. The future with respect to other post background issues. So, they have a car in their household and try car driving license are more likely to buy a car 95% of confidence. Those individuals have more number of family members and they are more likely to buy a car with 95% of confidence level. But those who are living with family are less likely to buy a car with 90% of confidence level. Maybe because they are already have a car in their household. Frequency of using public transport also influencing car owners decisions. If the individual using public transport at least once in a week are less likely to buy a car with respect to the individual using public transport at least once in a month, very occasionally or never using public transport with 95% of Individual those decisions will influence from the prior or external factors are more likely to buy a car with 99% confidence level. And those who are who have traffic concern are less likely to buy a car with 99% of confidence. Those individuals who are conscious about image and passionate about cars are more likely to buy a car with 95% of confidence level. And those who are who are obsessed with car and status cigarette too are more likely to buy a car with 95% of confidence level. Individual those Who are have a congestion and parking concern are less likely to buy a car with 19% of this car. The goodness, uh, the goodness, these are the goodness uh, of it, uh, of the model. The McFarland Road Square value is 0 0.254, which is lies between 0.2 to 0.4. We can say that the development is good. Fit. This is a prediction success table of the double model. The prediction success table is a cross-section between observed choices and predicted choices. The prediction success rate of buying a car is nearly 78% and for not buying a car is around 81%. The overall prediction success rate of the double model is around 80%. The results of a study found that gender of the respondent had no significant role in the car. And individual whose qualification is higher than post graduation level and background is related to engineering are more likely to buy a car in the near future. Individual having a four-wheeler driving license and can also have higher propensity to buy a car. Frequency of using public transport has a possible impact on conditions. And those who are conscious about paying high taxes, environmental sustainability, and traffic problems are less likely to buy a car in the near future. Individual whose decisions are influenced by peer factors like advertisement or incentives have higher percent to buy a car. Image conscious and status seeker are more likely to buy a car in the near future. Then policy recommendations, awareness program concentrating on the factor uh, environmental sustainability or by imposing a high taxes on purchasing a new car and fuels may decline the growth of uh, new cars in developing countries. Introducing road pricing in the form of kilometer charges will be a much more effective initiative for people to get out, get out from their car and provide education and information about alternative form of public transport. Uh, form of transport. The external factors like advertisement related to consequences 
of cars in daily life and environment can enter the growth of car. The quality of public transport, uh, like comfort, fare, speed, frequency, reliability, also influences user and car owner's behavior. Hence, by improving the quality of public transport as per the user expectations, would increase the attractiveness of public transport with respect to car driving. Like China and other countries' government, the Indian government should develop and implement transport policies that could potentially discourage the use of owning a car without necessity purpose for more sustainable mobility pattern. Policies that make the acquisition and driving a car more expensive and reducing toll taxes would help to decline the growth of cars. These are the some references which are used in this system. Hello. Hello. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Shanu Mina, for your excellent yes. presentation. So, so I think we have already uh, begin to get questions from our participants. Uh, there's a one question from Mr. Fushan. Uh, he is asking, it would be interesting to include the type of car they are interested to buy. Probably uh, he is suggesting on point for you. And also he added that most of the results are as expected. Did you find anything not expected? Uh, according to Indian perspective, uh, I think... Uh, like I found the, like a gender. Okay. Yeah, gender of the respondent uh, is not... Uh, significant so i think gender of the respondents also affecting car ownership decisions like women are more likely to buy a car with respect to men so i surprisingly found that at, at the time at the uh, student level so uh, there is not a, any gender difference like it's, it may be in the future Okay, Mr. Bhushan, did you get your answer or do you have anything uh, more to ask? Uh, probably he also added that what kind of awareness strategy would you try to reduce affinity to buy a car? So the awareness strategy like through the advertisements uh, or through these, uh, some, uh, uh, mainly through the advertisements like uh, many of the persons are thinking think that uh, so like it will improve their symbol or uh, image or status seeker they will so these type of advertisement those who are mainly concentrated on these factors like see uh, like car will not uh, is a status symbol so some of the big uh, uh, big uh, uh, celebrities they will advertise all these things like like car is not a status symbol they will impact the environment as well so many young adults like they will change their decisions okay thank you so do you do you want to include the type of car they are interested to buy in your study no, 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 no. just only a uh, number of cars i just only will buy or not but it will be interesting study if, uh, if we concentrate on the type of Also. I think your connection uh, is not that much stable. We are missing some words from your yes, answer. Here is around eleven to twelve fifty. So, uh, Sanu, I also have a question about your your modeling approach. Uh, you have some factors or latent variables so i was wondering how did you include them in Factor your analysis, yes. model? what again uh, i i have a question regarding your modeling approach uh, because i noticed that you have uh, factors or latent variables and you did some factor analysis uh, before yes. doing your uh, final model development so did you follow a two-step approach? I mean, did you calculate the factor scores and then included them in your uh, choice model or um, you, you had a... Uh, yes, yes, yeah, yeah, I, I, I put factor scores, yes. 
Okay. Yep. Thank you. Okay. There is one more question from um, Win Wee. He wants to know: Is there a paper on this you are publishing? Yes. Uh, Sustainability uh, General of MDPI. Uh, we, we can't hear you clearly. Could you please repeat? Sustainability General of MDPI. Oh, I see. Okay, thank you. So I think we have uh, more time for Mr. Uh, uh, Shanu, uh, Shanu Mina. So if you have any yes. question from the participants, so you can ask. So otherwise we can go for uh, our next presentation. Is there anyone want to ask anything? Okay, thank you, Mr. Shanumina. Uh, it was a great presentation from you. And I think it was also an interesting topic. However, uh, the comments from the uh, okay. participant, I think you can consider uh, to uh, for your future study and hope we can uh, see your good works in future. Thank you. Okay. okay. Uh, now I would like to request uh, Mr. Uh, J. Caesar Aguma uh, to present his uh, uh, paper on a matching mechanism with anticipatory tools for congestion pricing. So. I request J. Cesar Aguma, Emilia Sirigan to present uh, their paper. Yeah, I think you need to you need to unmute yourself, uh, Cesar. Uh, we can't hear you. Uh, still, still we can hear you. We've got yeah. also a brief uh, introduction about him as well. So he's a computer science uh, graduate student at UC Irvine, and his areas of interest include uh, algorithmic game theory, artificial intelligence, and quantum computing. We really look forward to hearing more from you. All right, hi everyone. I hope you can hear me clearly and see me, hopefully. Um, I'll be presenting a paper on matching, matching mechanism with anticipatory tools for continuous pricing. This is a paper written with uh, my colleague and advisor friend, uh, Dr. Amelia Regan, and I am your presenter, Caesar. I hope everyone can hear me. Yeah, um, so um, in this presentation, I'll, I'll begin by defining what condition pricing uh, the problem condition pressing is. I'll outline um, the research question for our research and then after outlining the problem I'll present a solution in, in the sense of a matching mechanism and compare our solution to another solution put forth by another researcher before us which was an auction mechanism and at that point I will wrap up. All right. Please post any questions in the chat and I'll address them at the end of the presentation. All right, so what is condition pricing? I think I feel like um, everyone in this um, chat must have at some point encountered a toll road or like a toll um, cotton somewhere in some city. So condition pricing is basically that, where a toll is put in place to shift the um, marginal social cost of using a road onto the travelers. And um, one would ask why, why would this be, why would this um, be necessary? But if you look at this chart that I have here, hopefully everyone can see this. I don't know if it's like clear enough. Um, we can see that a lot of time and money is being wasted due to, con due to congestion. And this, this chart is from 2017 and has changed a little bit since then. Um, but you can see that over 100 hours um, are wasted in LA alone in traffic. And in New York, over 30, 33 billion is being wasted um, 
in cost to cater for congestion in, in, in the city. So it is a big problem. It is a problem that is also universal um, almost everywhere in the world. In the major cities, there is a congestion problem. Um, and I would even go further to argue that it's not just a time and money problem, but it is also a human um, life uh, or human mortality problem. Because if one looks at the, um, the amount of accidents or amount of pollution caused by congestion, one would see that it's, it's indeed life threatening for, for us to continue living with this problem. So we thought to put for the um, solution. Before I get into the solution, into the solution though, um, I, would, I would just highlight a few examples of popular um, congestion pricing um, making it all solutions. Um, Facility-based tolls, which are normally put in place as a way, like they, you'd have like a, um, a freeway or highway or toll route that has a toll on it. One example is the California State Route 73, right up the UCI campus. Um, I think as, as you're getting onto the route, you charge the toll of about five dollars. Um, there's also area based tolls. These are these, these are common in Europe, more so London and Stockholm, where you'll have some part of the city um, demarcated off to where like if a driver is entering into that, that area of the city, they have charged the toll, and if they're exiting to charge the toll. I cannot remember the exact toll for London, but I think it's about six, 18. Someone will correct me on that, $18, I think, for a day. Um, there's also time varying tolls. This change given the time of day. Another good example is the California State Route 91, as you're going down to San Diego. Um, the toll basically changes given the traffic, con tra traffic conditions. Um, Another example that is only still that's still in the only in the literature is uh, tradable credit schemes, and this this idea is where basically drivers have credits and they trade these credits back and forth in in exchange for road usage. So one driver buys road usage from another driver, and there's no um, there's no government intervention or mid middleman in any of the trading. So then, um, given that we know what condition pricing is and what congestion is, then the, prod, the goal for this research was to design a mechanism that allocates drivers to routes and sets tolls that basically give drivers incentive to only limit their trips down to essential trips. Um, but we also wanted to have a mechanism that is fair to all classes of drivers. For example, when you look at the land and toll, um, it's very, a very common, it's a, it's a very known fact that because of the toll, a lot of like low income drivers cannot drive in some areas of London because they cannot afford the tolls there. So we wanted to set a mechanism that basically puts in place a toll that is fair to low income uh, users, road users. So I'll, if there's no questions that I need to address now, I will, I'll go into defining my model here. So for the matching mechanism, we um, imagine a route R. This route will have um, free flowing capacity K, K of F, where free flowing capacity is the, the capacity the, road, uh, the route can take before there's congestion. Um, they also have a, the route will also have a cost function, um, which, is, which depends on the time um, one takes to drive on the route and also the cost of the route, um, basically the toll that is set on the route. Um, this cost is determined from work done by um, a colleague earlier in 2007, Dong, um, and we get, we envision that this cost would depend on current traffic condi conditions, where these current traffic conditions are um, predicted by a new network. Um, in um, another colleague's work, um, a colleague Assad and Regan, we, they presented, basically they presented a new network that can be used to predict traffic conditions in the short and long term. Um, 
So we envisioned that we would use this neural network to basically determine future traffic conditions and from those from, from that, those predictions, then set uh, an anticipatory toll. Um, on the driver side, the driver would have to set what they think is the maximum toll they, they are willing to pay. And we, one would think of this toll as something synonymous to the value of time, where we think that what a driver is willing to pay is, is um, indicative of their value of time. Um, the driver would also have a utility function uh, where the utility function depends on the time they take traveling on the route and the toll they pay. To determine um, time taken, um, we basically pull this again from past work by, uh, by Chen, Sunday 18. Someone, if, if, if you're interested in looking at that, someone could look at that. We also have to like to mention that a driver is only charged at all if there's congestion on the route. So if there's no congestion, then the driver does not pay any toll. If there's some congestion, then the driver pays a toll that reflects the current traffic conditions. So I'll go into the algorithm for, if we have drivers then going on routes, I'll go into the algorithm for allocating drivers routes and basically how, how, basically how drivers are allocated the routes when they're ready to travel. So when the driver comes online, what happens is all the routes available to that driver, given their, the maximum toll they can pay, are ranked depending on the utility to the driver. And um, the top ranked route is then assigned to the driver with a deadline. So basically a driver comes online, sees all the routes available to them, is assigned the top ranked route that will maximize their utility, and they are given a deadline of about 10 minutes before they before that route assignment is, is um, expires, basically. Um, any violations to the assignment be penalized by some charge greater than what they would have paid if they, if, if they took the assigned route. Basically, so if, if the driver is on a route R and they decide to take a route X, they are charged the penalty greater than the cost of taking a route R. All right. So with the algorithm in place, then we want to ask um, how fair is the algorithm to all drivers? And um, does the algorithm incentivize drivers to tell the truth in, in any case? So for fairness, um, we use something called Pareto optimality, where Pareto optimality is if you have N agents and N resources, and you somehow want to allocate these resources to the N agents, we say that um, an allocation is Pareto optimal if no agent can do better in any other alloc allocation. So if we have two allocations, X1 and X2, and we say that X, X1 is Pareto optimal, then there can, no, there can be no agent that does better in X2. So either all agents do exactly the same as they do in X2, or at least one agent has to do worse in X2. So all agents have to do better only in X1, if that makes sense. Um, so it will be easy to show that the mechanism presented earlier, this algorithm for matching drivers to routes is priority optimal because every driver that comes online is assigned um, a route that maximizes their utility at that time t. So if there was any other route that maximizes their utility, they would be assigned that route. So if we if if our mechanism was not Pareto optimal, if, if, let's say, if, if you get a contradiction that a mechanism is not Pareto optimal, it's impossible to find another mechanism that would use a different assignment but achieve higher, um, higher, get a higher utility for any of the drivers since our allocation gives the, every driver their highest possible utility. Um, and then to go into strategy proofness. Strategy proofness. Um, strategy proofness is a concept in game theory where the only way an agent can maximize the utility is by telling the truth. So if an agent underreports or overreports their preferences or their value of time, they cannot maximize their utility. 
And again, this would be easy to show and it's shown in the paper that we published. If a driver, for example, under report the, the maximum toll they can pay, if they say that I can pay L, but in, in, in essence, they can pay something higher, um, let's say H, it's easy, it's easy to show that the maximum utility they can achieve will be captured um, L. But then if, they, if there are routes that would have been better for them or would have maximized their utility better, but cost more than L, then this driver would miss out on those routes and essentially would not maximize their utility. And if a driver underreported, um, if the driver overreported in the other in the other case, overreported their maximum toll, then we find that to be irrational because if you can only pay if you can only pay ten dollars for 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 a, for a route, but then you report that you can that you want a route that costs fifteen dollars. If you are assigned a route that costs fifteen dollars, you won't be able to pay for that route, and in essence, you would not be able to take the route, which would um, result into zero utility basically. Um, so what we've shown here is that this, ma this matching mechanism is both priority optimal and so it's fair to all drivers because they all get their, like, their best possible route. And is also um, strategy, strategy proof because if a, dri if, if a driver misreports their maximum toll, they won't be able to maximize their utility. Um, we thought it necessary to compare a matching mechanism to an earlier proposed solution that used an auction mechanism. Um, I'll, I'll briefly highlight what the auction mechanism was and then I'll go into comparing the utilities of the two mechanisms. So the auction mechanism, like the matching one, assumes these end drivers traveling from an origin O to, to destination D on a congestible route. So they assume that the driver D has um, a known value of time greater than zero. And um, they define the utility a driver gets from traveling as UT, as shown here. And they also define that if a driver opts out of traveling, then the utility of the driver is zero. So the mechanism goes on to provide an allocation X of how drivers are to routes and, and the payments that the drivers make if they get to travel. So um, without going into much detail, I'll, I'll try to compare the utilities of both the auction mechanism and the matching mechanism. So I begin by basically pulling the auction, the utility for the auction mechanism as shown in that paper by the colleagues Heller, um, where they take the utility to be um, a product of the value of time times the time taken to travel where TF is the time with free, with, without traffic, and TK is the time that, that the driver takes to drive on the route. So if we assume that there's congestion on a route, that, that is, we're assuming that T of K is greater than uh, T of F. So both these cases will be basically negative um, integers. So we can easily show that Our, our the utility, the utility achieved by the matching mechanism is actually higher, or is it that equal or higher than the utility achieved by the auction mechanism? And that is simply by the fact that when you have um, when you have congestion, the cost the the cost for using a route is much is um is much lesser than the, the value of time as shown by the paper in the auction mechanism. Um, I hope that was clear enough. I didn't try, I, I tried not to go deep into the theory of it all, but to summarize, um, we presented a matching mechanism that is priority optimal and strategy proof. We showed that the utility of the matching mechanism is better and, than the, the auction mechanism under congestion. And um, to shout out some of the people that helped me um, in, the, in doing this research, I would like to um, acknowledge uh, Dr. Neil Manano, um, Dr. Uh, J. J. Krishna, and Dr. VJ Bazirani, all at UCI. Uh, future work would go, would probably feature around 
simulations to observe the performance of this matching mechanism um, and the real traffic conditions. Uh, we also intuitively think we could um, apply this to solving the tra uh, dynamic traffic traffic assignment problem and see how well of a solution it gives us. Um, that is my presentation and I'll take any questions now. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Thank you, Mr. Aguma. So your presentation was uh, nicely organized and well explained. Now I would uh, like to um, ask the question from the participant. Here I can see that Dr. Kara Kokelman has asked a question. Are you now working with more realistic networks versus a, sign a single corridor? Um, this this work was purely theoretic, so it has not been simulated on any network as for now. Um, we envisioned that we will try to simulate the work on um, some network as a, as that will be part of our future work. But in the current, it's all theoretical uh, results that have not been simulated on any network. Uh, thank you. Uh, so, uh, Professor Dr. Kara Kokelman, uh, do you want to ask uh, anything uh, more? Oh. Okay, I think I think he says it's all right. So, is there anyone want to ask uh, any question on this uh, topic? Uh, so, so I have one question. Uh, uh, yes. Is uh, Asadi and uh, Asadi and Regan uh, 220 uh, a published work or it is just uh, uh, under uh, working paper? It has been published. Um, I cannot remember the conference where it's published, and Amelia could help me out. But it is, yes, the paper has been published. Okay. Okay. Thank you. You know, um, I'd love to ask Amelia. Do you have anything to add? You're the co-author. Anything you want us to know? Well, no, not exactly, except that if we want to get back to this question of realistic network. So um, the work with um, Asadi looks at realistic networks, right? We take um, loop detector data and do um, sh both very short term and longer term uh, tra traffic predictions, so up to one hour in the future. And we, we do believe that we could use this uh, for congestion pricing in a real network. And we'd like to, for example, compare what we would come up with in terms of tolls to the tolls, the real-time tolls, say, in the uh, DC to Dulles corridor, where they're actually setting real-time tolls currently, and see if our marginal cost pricing um, you know, has some real application. And we think in the future that, that, that we, well, who knows what the future means in transportation, right? But that, um, that we will have this kind of pricing in networks. Thank you. And I did just ask about credit-based pricing because I think one of the big issues of, of payments, you know, although it has good, uh, it has helpful welfare impacts, one of the issues, of course, always remains is sort of equity and, and ability to pay. I, I heard the other day that people in the Netherlands, if they speed, are billed according to their income group. So there's a famous story of a guy paying over a million dollars for his speeding <laughs> ticket, whereas most people pay maybe 200, 300 or something. Uh, dollars and so did, have you looked into the the equity implications closely we have thought about the equity implications this is one of uh Caesar's, um you know topics of real interest but i wouldn't say we've looked into it deeply uh, maybe to add in that um the, the actually the motivating um factors for this paper were ethical equity implications because the auction mechanism that was proposed before this paper um, basically presented this idea where um, I thought the richer would basically prevent um, low income persons from driving by just basically just bidding high, bidding high amounts for road usage. So we thought that taking, just taking that option away where someone could out, just outbid you for road usage would be a good start for an equity solution to for consumer pricing. 
And is this an extension of Amin Mamasani's work? Uh, so that's Hani Mamasani's student, who I think was a graduate student there in economics, Amelia, is that right? Uh, he was a graduate student here in economics. It's not an extension of his work. Did you want to let people know? I, see, I, you guys have a lot of time. You finished early, Cesar, and so I'm trying to um, fill this space here a little bit. So in case people are trying to time their presentation, so um, it, forgive me. I, I hope this is okay with the moderator, but I, I'm just a little bit worried that you're 15 minutes ahead of time. Is that is that correct? Yeah, uh, we, we have time. We have time. <laughs> So um, do you want to tell us a little bit more about what Amin did? I think he had people, students, uh, playing a game over and over to maybe bid one another out of lanes. Um, and so, but it was an economics dissertation. Yeah, um, you know, I consider Amin a friend, but you just <laughs> said more, you just said more than I know about his dissertation research. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> uh, he was, you know, he's, he is a very close friend of, of one of my PhD students and um, who happens to live in the same complex that I live in. So I see him regularly, but he's more of, of a social friend than an than intellectual friend. Sorry about that. Yes, but you are good friends with his dad, who was your <laughs> advisor. So this all comes together. Um, but yes, I mean, presented two years ago at the IATBR conference in Santa Barbara on this topic. And it was very interesting. Uh, so. He and his dad were presenting at the same conference. It's kind of fun. Well, now that I know that, next time he's, um, you know, comes over to where we live, I'll have to pressure him for more information. I didn't realize that there was this overlap, but we should mention that one of the papers that we are, that our work is based on is one of Mamasani's papers. It's the Dong paper in the presentation. One of his PhD students from maybe, maybe nine years ago. Great, great. And yeah, Cesar, if you're bored, you may want to look up the Mamasani dissertation at your university. Uh, I think I have it actually somewhere in my Google Drive. Um, I see a question here in the chat um, about how d how do you feel autonomous vehicles will fit? Um, I Again, thinking of an anticipatory toll and thinking of um, a matching mechanism was very much motivated uh, by um, a future that that was that involved autonomous vehicles, because when I think of that future, I, the only way I could say possible for like people like autonomous vehicles to just get on the road is, with some sort of question pricing would be if there was an automatic matching mechanism that can match them to routes and also assign them a toll given that traffic condition. So I I think autonomous vehicles would very well fit into this mechanism too. Uh, okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Sear, for your nice and excellent presentation. And I want to uh, especially thank Professor Kara Kokelman and Professor Emily Regan for nice conversation and uh, participating actively in this session. Thanks a lot. So I think uh, uh, there is one question from Mr. Bhushan. He wants to know, maybe we can think of uh, rationalization as an approach. Uh, do you have any say, Mr. Sijar, about this? Um, I have to ask what does rationalization mean? What does it? What does that mean? Rationalization. I, I to my head, can they don't know do what that means. Uh, uh, Mr. Fushon, you can talk if you want to uh, uh, explain your question uh, so that uh, Sijar can answer it appropriately. We have around nine minutes in our hand for this session. Okay, uh, I'm trying. Mr. Huang, can you unmute him, Mr. Fushan? Yeah, I've already made him uh, the host. So you can unmute yourself. Yeah, I, what I want to say is uh, uh, rationalization means uh, you know, you, you told about this auction thing where rich rich who can pay more tolls, uh, they kind of take up more space and uh, not give a chance to other people. But when you say rationalization, there is a cap uh, on uh, how much these guys can use, uh, you know, that kind of method. When you cap how much use uh, a rich person can do, 
then there is another extra space created for the uh, other people on the road, right? Like that. So I think you mean rationing. So in, yeah, in rationing, like, rationing, yeah. Yes. So, yeah, rationalization, very different um, in, in interpretation in English. So yeah, rationing, is, um, that's going to be tricky to get off the ground here in the United States, but maybe in Singapore or, or Beijing or something. Um, again, Shanghai would be difficult, I think. Um, so most, most settings would not allow for rationing. Um, but you know, credit base gives you like a free base of, of credits to travel with, and and then you and so that helps bring uh, those of low income up to a basic level of travel, and and they can use that as needed, or they can cash it in for transit passes or electric bikes, shared fleets, and things like that, and maybe even buy their own electric bike or or something like that. So um, I think credit base will probably be the best way uh, rather than a rationing. Yes, thank you. Cesar, any thoughts on that? <laughs> yeah, because um, I wanted to, uh, when you talk about credit base, because I remember when we, when we were thinking about what kind of tool would be set for this kind of matching mechanism after the assignment is made, we did think about credit base, credible schemes or credit base kind of system. And um, we went with an undisputed tool only out of convenience, because we thought an undisputed tool would be much easier to um, implement in the short term at least. But um, we did not think that a credit-based system would be out of question to complement the matching mechanism. Amelia, you're muted. <laughs> okay, I think I'm unmuted now. So um, I, I think it's a great suggestion, Kara. And I think um, it's just natural to include that in, and there's nothing to preclude a credit-based use of anticipatory pricing. It's just uh, people have this credit, they can use it as they, as they like, and you know, wealthy people will increase their credit, and, but other people have some basic amount of credit. I think it's perfect. I think it's um, probably essential to include such a mechanism in uh, whenever we're thinking about these tolls in the future. Yeah, the biggest issue I think we all confront, because I've been studying this for years, is who gets the credit? So if it's just a small application of tolls in a few places, then does everybody in the region really need them? And where is the, where is the end of the region? You know, uh, is it the county? And, and then people who live just a block away are suddenly, you know, out of luck. And so it's, that's tricky. Um, the technology has also been a big issue for a while. And so uh, we're very lucky, you know, to have five, fifth generation cellular and, and, and local. You don't even have to have a cellular, I think, plan to be able to use that locally. Uh, and some of the devices on the vehicles that are going to be coming anyway, you could almost do lane by lane pricing, things like that. Uh, but it takes a long time to turn the fleet over. So we, we need to kind of get this onto the vehicles uh, much sooner than that. And I think Singapore just recently spent about $400 per vehicle in its fleet or, or more to kind of put cell phones on every car and, and get their whole system changed. So it's it's much more than that that equipment that they added to every vehicle in that small island. But um, so the technologies has definitely gotten better, but that's a, always been a huge issue for application of, of any of these. Well, and of course, that's why Singapore is so much more successful in tolling systems because they require that their vehicles be um, taken out of the taken out of the system after 10 years. So that in Cal in California and Texas, where the weather's pretty good, you have 20 year old, 25 year old vehicles driving around, and a, a significant portion of the fleet is old vehicles. And so we can't do that. But in Singapore, where they make, they you know you have to take those vehicles out of out of the system after 10 years, they can turn over the technologies much more quickly. Well, I didn't know that. I knew that their little medallions or those things that you bid for only last like six years or seven years, and then you have to rebid, but I didn't know the vehicle itself had to be retired. Japan had a very strong policy of that to try to prop up its auto manufacturing industry for many years. And thank God removed that finally because that was not very good for their carbon footprint. They were selling all these nice cars to Vietnam every year. Um, but yeah, I didn't, I didn't know Singapore was doing that. It, it does help with some of the safety upgrades, not just some of the technology. And if it's, if, you know, I think it's the length of the medallion. So if I misspoke, if I have misremembered the exact number of years, but it's, it's, it's a much quicker retirement system than we have in other yeah, they places. Don't. 
they don't retire. I mean, only wealthy people generally have them or people who are using them as shared fleets for ride hailing services now. Um, but no, it's, it is shorter than that on the medallion. Anybody who knows, feel free to type it in the chat box. Um, but people will, will not retire the vehicle. They'll just rebid for the medallion. And they can also, I think, sell their medallion on the medallion market. So they can go in and out. It doesn't really matter how old their vehicle is uh, for that. Well, I think we've gotten um, you to time now. Yeah. So I'm going to mute myself. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor uh, Kara and uh, Emily again. So I think uh, it was an excellent and active session. And now we'd like to welcome Mr. Uh, Leon Feng uh, and uh, her team uh, to present modeling the impact of shared autonomous vehicles on land prices in uh, Clyton, Victoria. Um, well, good morning, everyone. So uh, I'm based in Melbourne, and right now it's 5 a.m. Um, yeah, catch some feeling about you know catching a flight before, but right now I haven't. I don't think that I can catch a flight anytime soon. Um, yeah, I'll just share my screen. Uh, um, uh, did I share the you, correct could, one? Uh, the, could you please? Eat? Introduce your teammates a little bit uh, so that uh, our participant can know about the authors of this work. Uh, yes, um, just wonder did I share the correct screen though? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm on behalf of my, uh, I'm a PhD student uh, from Monash University um, in Australia. And today I'll be on behalf of my supervisors, Dr. John Batts and Professor Hai Wu. Uh, to present about uh, work that I've done in my master's degrees, um, which is about building a model to measure uh, land prices in the scenarios of autonomous vehicle in a case study in uh, Victoria. Um, this presentation will break down into four sections. I'll talk about some background uh, about this project, including introduction to autonomous vehicles, current existing issues, and the reason why we want to do this project. And then I'll move on to methodologies, simulation designs, followed by outcomes discussions. And lastly, I will make a conclusion to close up the presentation. And feel free to ask any questions after that. Um, so yeah, autonomous vehicles, um, as the project title suggested, and I will short form it as AVs in the rest of the presentation. There's no doubt that AVs are poised to reshape our transport system. And I probably don't need much introduction about AVs, as I believe most of you have seen them either in movies, heard about them in news, or even some of the colleagues from US might um, try them before, because I heard there are some tests running at the moment and some, some parts in the US. Um, from Tesla's autopilot system to the Waymo um, driverless taxi service, we can see that the industry aims to launch the uh, level five autonomy, uh, autonomous vehicle within the near future. Um, the level five autonomy um, can be interpreted as a full uh, automation, which requires no human interactions while the vehicle is in operation. Um, this project will take this assumption, and when I mention AVs uh, in the rest of the presentation, uh, they are those that features with the level five autonomy. Um, since AVs are not rolled out, uh, well, it is even tested in Australia, there are many assumptions and discussions about how it will be implemented. Um, if we look back 10 years from now, we can see shared mobility has drastically changed our travel styles. Uber, Didi and Lyft, um, this kind of uh, car shared services and platform um, have become our new normals and everyone pretty much tried them before. Therefore, the concept of shared autonomous vehicle it's also developed. 
Um, from then on, there was a lot of studies kicked in. Um, they studied about whether people accepted, like using um, survey papers, or there was a lot of like simulations studies um, to see how, uh, when, when the SAV rolled out, uh, what the conditions would be, would they save money? What kind of good will bring to uh, the new uh, traffic conditions? And among those studies, what makes me interested is um, whether SAV system would save money, do any financial goods to us. Well, there I come across some uh, interesting opinions. Um, if we consider every single uh, commute, uh, the cost of every single commute, it's time and operation. Um, and time, we can further divide it into out of vehicle travel time and the in vehicle travel time, IVTT. Um, what and a, uh, how AVs can try to save our time is by promoting the multitasking. Um, as we see in the traditionally in the traditional in the traditional way of traveling, a driver sit in the car and all the task he or she can perform is driving, and the time he or she spent in the car, which is the IBTT, um, would be with would be with zero productivity, and uh, which means during that time, um, he or she can't think of other things technically, and yeah, he can only focus on driving. However, with uh, the possibility of multitasking featured by AVs, drivers can use this uh, in IVTT, but do a lot more productive stuff, like he or she can work or handle meetings, reply emails, and this productivity can somehow be transformed as part of the income and reduce um, the the travel time um, in this journey. And this opinion is pretty much been supported by a lot of other studies saying that multitasking can reduce the IVTT. Um, also for the operation cost, uh, it could mean um, uh, gas or petrol. Um, a lot of other studies also supported that the AV system can reduce um, the average cost to lowest as 13 cents per mile in US dollars, while an average C then would cost around 75 cents per mile. If SAVs indeed change travel costs, reduce money, the effect will ripple to various views, and one of them would be accessibility. Uh, we touch a little bit of accessibility in my work, and we use the definition from Hansen, um, which means that accessibility is the measurement of how easy to reach opportunities from a location. And transport is one of the deterministic components. And other, other opinions regarding accessibility and land use is accessibility has a tight relationship with house pricing. Just imagine if you go to rent a place, you probably see uh, in the ads, they will say, oh, we have a very convenient uh, access to the public transport. We have our local supermarkets nearby, or we are, for example, close to university. Uh, that's dedicated for the students like me. <laughs> um, we can say that reduced travel time, it's always beneficial to residents even far um, from a surface a congregating region, which um, in the end will create an impact. So we have a hypothesis in our study, which is a low travel cost may incur uh, an increased accessibility and in the end change uh, incur changes in land use. Um, the other side of this background story, it's um, since um, um, obviously the best way to work out the previous hypothesis is we wrote out AVs and see how it actually impact the land, the land price market. However, we couldn't do it at the moment. Well, what we can do is um, do performing a modeling studies. 
um, inset. So there are some issues regarding uh, modeling. Traditionally, uh, transport modeling and urban modeling, they, uh, they perform separately due to uh, different updated cycles. Um, to explain this is uh, travel utilities usually have drastic change when there is a new highway or there is a new road uh, being developed and that usually don't happen annually. But for urban models, they, um, they update cycle, it's annual, uh, it's like, uh, yeah, annually. Um, this opinion was supported by Waddle, which is a, a famous work uh, regarding the development of uh, urban sim. Um, but because of this uh, separated uh, um, simulations, they may miss out some interrelated factors and some of this factor cannot be renewed promptly. Um, lastly, um, some of the previous modeling, they didn't use the agent-based modeling approach because at that time the computer power wasn't uh, that good. But right now agent-based modeling approach, um, it's very popular and they can address the changes in a, in a tiny individual level. Therefore, it would have a better and accurate uh, result. So all the theories and backgrounds, it comes down to um, this project. It's, it's very imperative to understand how SAVs will change land price and how modeling will give accurate prediction before we launch this disruptive technology. Um, the research questions in this work would be, what are the impacts of SAVs on residential land prices uh, in Clayton, Victoria, which is a suburb, and I will dis uh, describe it a lot more in the, in the next section. And the second request question is how to create an accurate model to simulate this impact. Um, so in, in the methodology, um, the overall of the methodology is we propose an integrated framework to exempt the effect on FAB on, on the residential land price and use a populated southeast suburb, Clayton, as a case study. This framework is essentially a transport model coupled with an urban model, which address the, uh, the issue that I just said before. This transport model is implemented in Matsim and the land use model is implemented in urban zip and they are both agent-based simulation um, uh, model, models. We also assume the main change in scenarios of SAV deployment is the travel time. Therefore, travel time is the output parameter from the, the transport model, Matsim. And then urban sim will match, uh, will use the result from math sim and to work out the land price in different scenarios. Um, to be more intuitive, uh, make us little an animations on that. Um, so first, as all of the modeling studies, we want to use a base year, some base year data and to work out predicted data and the time frame in here is one year. So right now we gather all the essential data we need and the simulation one is ready. And then we construct our models using this base year data uh, in MathSim as well as in UrbanSim. And MathSim would use this base year data to work out the travel time and pass this uh, val pass the value to urban sim and urban sim will work out the residential land price. And the residential land price would then feed back to the base year data and update them. Um, simulation two will be ready. So if we want to do a simulation, for example, model uh, land price in 10 years later, um, this is how they keep carrying out the changes until uh, this simulation runs 10 years. And at this moment, one 
simulation well yeah one sequence or simulation one is uh, done and right now when uh, the base year data was updated it means the second year simulation would kick in and the previous procedure will repeat it um, our scenario design and some assumptions in here it's we model the daily routine of commuters uh, where in the morning 6 a.m to 11 a.m they travel from their home to the train station and in the afternoon they come back home from the train the, the train station therefore the travel time is the total commute time from the a.m peak as well as the p.m peak we have uh, 3474 households in clayton and we assume each household has one commuter daily travels to Clayton's train station. Um, we have two scenarios. The first scenario is uh, basically, we, I call it hybrid. It aims to reflect the status quo in Clayton. And the second scenario is the SAV. Um, in the scenarios SAV, uh, it will be the only travel mode. And assumption, more assumptions would be like uh, SAV is available to users. We don't consider waiting time or even travel fees in this uh, this work because um, we aim to because uh, my aim is actually to focus on uh, the the coupling between the two models. So we try to simplify the scenarios of AV a bit. Um, we will have the ground truth price and then. We have scenario one, the status quo scenario, land price, and then the comparison between them is to see how the model uh, would perform. And that potentially answers research question two. And later on, we just change the one uh, parameter, which is the travel time. We work out in the scenarios uh, of uh, SAV uh, second, sorry, the land price in scenario two SAV and then we compare how land price would change um, in scenarios of SAV which potentially answer the research question one it's what exactly the impact of SAV is on land price um, so here is the residential block allocations in Clayton and the highlighted pen it's uh, where it indicates where the train station is. So in the morning, people would travel from all this residential uh, area to the train station, and afternoon they would yeah go back home. So Maxim's result it's travel time, and um because it, it we have like three thousand household but I try to do an average time in each block. So it will, is easier to present. But when I run the simulation, uh, it's not based on block, it's actually based on each, each household. Uh, but as we can see in a scenario two, um, travel time is almost half of, uh, in, in the scenarios where they have, they can walk, they can drive. Um, but in, in the SAV scenarios where they can only travel with SAV, um, time it's uh, like uh, the deduction of the time, it's quite high. And we expect there will be some changes in the land price. Um, here's the results from Urban Sim, but it's a bit hard to show the actual changes. So I do a screenshot and show you is there is some changes happens in both scenarios um, here is the first one where we consider as the status quo and the second one is the SAV um, this one this diagram would be easier to see what exactly the changes are um, the, uh, the the way urban seem worked out the land price is using head only regression. Therefore, we can use R square value as indicator of the goodness of fit. 
um, we can compare the ground truth and scenario one, uh, which is the blue dot and the gray dot. And we can see it's mm, quite low actually. Um, from block one to block 13, it basically doesn't follow any trace, but we can see from block 14 to uh, block 64, it does exhibit a uh, similar trend. Um, so there's some more analysis would be, uh, uh, would be later. And from, uh, if we compare the both scenario, which we want to see how exactly the reduced travel times impact on land prices, uh, we can see that our square value is quite high and um, you barely can see any blue dots because the red dot it's overlapped with each other. And that indicates uh, it's the impact, it's not so uh, much, uh, not so huge. So a reduced travel time doesn't really uh, impact much on the, on the land price. To be exact, um, the deployment of SAV we incur uh, 2,500 Australian dollars in equipment in each residential land. That's approximately a 0.22 percentage equipment due, uh, compared to the medium land price. And the low R square value indicates incompatibility between the ground truth and scenario one. We need more calibrations on that, uh, but since the focus is more on developing the coupling between two models. So this would be, was simplified. And lastly, as we said, as I said before, uh, the SAV scenario is too simplified because we assume only travel, it's the only travel mall and we ignore the waiting time, the price, the uh, parkings and so on and so forth. So a, a lot of things with, was actually uh, ignored in developing this scenario. And uh, that's why they, we could have like an uh, inaccurate estimation of travel time and the eventually affects the land price prediction. Um, so in conclusion, this research is an attempt to simulate the impact of SAVs on the populated suburb Clayton. Um, since we not it's feasible to collect empirical data, we have uh, used this, the simulation study instead. And the results suggest that a uh, land price of each residential land incurs a minor, very small uh, increment. Um, however, this is just um, uh, an attempt to develop uh, integration integrated framework so we hope this work can inspire some of the colleagues and further research can extend it and to investigate and investigate and evaluate the impact of change in land use from uh, AVs because that is because AV is definitely coming soon and changing a lot of um, things that we currently not know yet. Um, here's the reference that I've used um, in this presentation. And thank you for your attention. Uh, I can see that there's a lot of question things uh, flagging. So I will stop sharing and see. Uh, okay, thank you, uh, Feng. Uh, so uh, I think uh, it was a nice presentation and there are some questions from uh, Richard Young. He want to know, uh, did you say how many SFs there were in the fleet? Or did you just assume there are always so many SFs and they could always arrive instantly no matter how many were requested. If there were uh, limitation in SFs ability, wouldn't it, that affect your model results uh, substantially? Um, I think yes. I, um, we don't really limit it. It's, it's always uh, instantly available to uh, whoever it's calling it. Or we, as you can assume that there is always a lot of SAVs running around in the suburb. Um, let's see, let me see if the other, is there a limitation on this? 
Uh, I think so. Uh, regarding uh, Richard Young's second question, if there were limitations in SAV availability, yes, it does. Um, but I think the main uh, the goal of this project, like I said before, is to integrate, to develop an integrated framework. And obviously, this frame, if this framework would um, mature enough, it, yeah, it can just inspire other colleagues to use uh, better scenarios to measure the impact. Uh, but I think my main goal is to develop this the framework. Okay. Okay, we can see a question from Professor Kara Kokelman. He she wants to know: uh, Do Urbanism and Med Sim work together? Uh, is anyone else running these two uh, together? Uh, is uh, sorry, because I just need to call a bit. Because <laughs> um, uh, I've received a feedback uh, from reviewers. The, uh, someone said that it's technically not an integration. It's just passing one outcome to um, uh, as the in, uh, one output from MatSim to input uh, to UrbanSim. Um, he suggests that it's not really an integration. Um, but uh, I think when I work with my professors and they said this is kind of like a like lowest level integration and they actually do work quite well because yeah, I simply just pass results between two models. So they actually work okay. I don't really, I don't really, um, have much difficulties in developing it, but I think the time consuming part would be develop the, the models in urban sim because it really requires a lot of like detailed information for each household if you want to have a nice result. Oh, I see a lot of questions popping through. Yeah, yeah, I think so. So there is a so hush for like 5 a.m. person. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it, it's, it's okay. So much of travel is increasingly not work commute related. Will you revisit in a later study and simulate for recreational use in the model? Uh, much of the travel is increasingly not work. Um, well, I'm actually doing a PhD on that though. <laughs> I'm I'm looking into accessibility right now in my uh, PhD, but I think some part of them would be addressing the uh, SAV's impact on um, la land use. That is actually my PhD now, but we'll look into from the angle of accessibility in this time, rather than just the the ILUT model, like the integrated land use and transport, uh, trans transport models. But um, yeah, definitely it's an extension from this work. Um, not sure it answers your question. <laughs> uh, okay, thank you. So how much access measures impact on land prices in comparison to the other prices drivers in the current implementation of urbanism, urban sim? Uh, it's from Pedro, uh, uh, Pedro Sierra. Can you see it, the question? Yeah, how much access it measure impacts on land prices? Uh, uh, sorry, I don't really get this one though. How much access measures impact on land prices in comparison to other prices drivers in the current implementation of urban sim. Do you mind explain a little bit? I want to know if the low impact is due to the land model. Yeah, um, I think uh, definitely we didn't do much uh, calibrations on the models when we when I said that we de develop the. Okay, yeah. Sorry. Um, yeah, it's 5 a.m. now, anyway. <laughs> um, 
uh, yeah, we didn't do much of the calibrations on the model uh, because it was uh, not, um, it was a lot of time was put in developing the urban sim models. And yeah, I didn't really want to mention because it was in my master degrees uh, a few months ago. Um, I think the main goal at that time for the project was to yeah, learn how to do research. But right now um, I'm in a PhD position. And when I look back this work, I, I do change a lot and uh, yeah, refine a lot when I submitted to this conference. But I think, yeah, I couldn't really redo a lot of things. But right now in at that time, at this time, when I look back to the work, I can tell that there is a lot of defects inside. Um, but I suggested my for my for my uh, supervisors the, the the work it's mainly to develop the integrated framework, and yeah, hopefully it could inspire someone to think of there is connections between SAVs or AVs and land use and land prices, and use these two agent based mod simulation uh, modeling approach. They can yeah have good better results than previously people just use single uh, either urban or transfer uh, modeling so an uh, integrated framework would have more interesting results uh, okay thank you Luan Peng for your uh, excellent presentation and I think uh, there are some interest from the participant on your work so uh, there since there is a time limitation we can uh, discuss this further in our hangout session. Thank you so much okay. for your presentation. Thank you. Okay. So now I would like to uh, request Adam Wiss uh, to introduce his team and uh, present works on accounting for preference heterogeneity for high occupancy tool lens in a Canadian city, a Latin class approach. All right, uh, so hopefully everyone can hear me and everyone can see my screen. Yeah, we can hear you and see your screen. Okay, perfect. Uh, so uh, thank you for the introduction. Yeah, I'd like to uh, acknowledge my co-authors. So that's uh, Mohammed Ansari, who's now a postdoc uh, at University of Calgary, and then uh, Shahab Najad, who's a PhD student, uh, and both of them and myself are working uh, with uh, Professor Lena Katan, also at the University of Calgary. Um, Adam? Adam, we're also seeing your next slide. So if you ah. can toggle to where it's a single slide. That's gotcha. gotcha. OK, hang on just one moment. Uh, da, da, da. That's the curse of double monitors, I guess. Uh, display settings. There we go. Does that work? Yes, perfect. OK. Um, so uh, before we get into sort of the meat of the presentation, I'll give you a bit of a, a background uh, on uh, what the presentation is going to cover. So we'll talk a little bit about what high occupancy toll lanes are and how high occupancy toll lanes and high occupancy vehicle lanes in general are implemented in Canada. It's a little bit different than, say, the U.S. or other places in the world. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about modeling uh, the use of HOT lanes and, and sort of how uh, it's typically done within the literature. Uh, and then particularly focusing on capturing preference heterogeneity using a different set of approaches. So mixed logit being the most common approach, uh, and then the work that we did, which was sort of combining mixed logit with latent class modeling. Uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about uh, the sort of case study and the study area that we did, go through the modeling exercises uh, that we've done, uh, present the results, talk about some key policy implementations, and then sort of conclude and present some areas for future work. Um, so hopefully most of you are, are familiar with the, the concept of, of an HOT lane. It's quite similar to an HOV lane uh, in that uh, uh, vehicles that have multiple occupants, two, three, depending on the jurisdiction, can use the lane for, for free, basically. Uh, transit vehicles as well, emergency vehicles, these sort of things. Uh, but uh, vehicles that don't meet that, uh, that capacity requirement are also able to use the lane, assuming they're willing to pay a small toll. So here, here's an example uh, of an HOT lane set up. Uh, I believe uh, it's in the US somewhere. I'm not quite sure where. Um, but um, uh, there are a lot of benefits associated with 
having these HOT lanes relative to sort of a more standard HOV lane. So you get, you're getting the benefits of the, the HOV lane and that you're encouraging transit use uh, and carpooling because th those vehicles can then use the lane and sort of not have to sit in congestion or traffic for an extended period of time. But you're also increasing mobility options for individuals that can't necessarily use the lane, the HOV lane normally for whatever reason. They can't carpool, they can't find a carpool partner or, or they need their car for, for whatever reason. Um, so the combination of being able to allow both um, sort of traditional HOV lane users and users that are willing to pay a nominal fee actually gives you potentially better use of the, the roadway relative to an HOV lane. You'll see sort of in the next slide a, an image of a, a more standard HOV lane uh, where it's not being utilized nearly as effectively. It's fast, of course, in that lane, but it's not necessarily um, being utilized uh, as much as it could be. Uh, and then finally, uh, you can also get revenue from the tools and you can use that to fund uh, either road maintenance on the, the, the lane itself or other infrastructure projects. Some of the, the literature I've read on this has said that um, uh, that's basically a drop in the bucket when it comes to major infrastructure projects, but every little bit counts. Um, so in the context of Canada, uh, HOT lanes are, are not really a thing. Uh, there's one pilot project in Ontario uh, that started after the data for this study uh, was collected. Um, so in general, um, toll lanes and tolls are, are quite disliked by Canadians. Canadians don't have a, a good history with them. Uh, there, there's generally sort of a lot of uh, anger and frustration about having to pay for something that you've already paid for um, uh, through your taxes or that was once free. Uh, and there's also a lot of resentment around toll booths slowing things down. You're, in the, you're paying the toll because you want to go faster, and then you have to stop and pay this toll at the toll booth, so it's defeating the purpose a little bit. Uh, and ultimately, uh, that leads to a lot of sort of political backlash when, when uh, tolls are adopted. So there was a, a, a case in uh, the province of British Columbia uh, in sort of a suburb of Vancouver where a toll bridge was implemented, and then uh, uh, the government that implemented it got kicked out in the next election. So th this sort of thing happens quite regularly in Canada. Um, where, where there's sort of limited political will to, to adopt um, tolls. Um, despite these misgivings, uh, there are still opportunities, like I was saying in that last slide, uh, to properly implement HOT lanes. And, and uh, particularly in the context of connected vehicle fleets, that's getting away from uh, the toll booth issue because you've got sort of the ability for, to have automated payment systems uh, and also use some more dynamic pricing, which can uh, potentially solve a lot of these issues. Um, uh, and and on, on top of, of HOT lanes, I do want to comment that HOV lanes um, are, are slightly more accepted uh, in the context of Canada. Not always, but slightly more accepted. So in Calgary, where this, this work was done, there are sort of a small number of HOV lanes that have been implemented in the last few years. Um, so when we're talking about modeling users' willingness to use HOT lanes, uh, the, the sort of the most common approach uh, that's used within the literature is using stated preference surveys and then a discrete choice model. Um, so uh, the use of that, that this sort of approach uh, uh, where you're modeling the explicit choice of which lane to travel in uh, allows uh, the analyst to calculate value of travel time savings. And that gives you some context for pricing at either a dynamic or static rate uh, when you're implementing the tool. Um, so Recently, in the sort of the last 10 years within the literature on this, uh, there's been a movement away from using sort of standard ML type approaches to more uh, uh, models that can account for preference heterogeneity. So mixed logit is sort of the, the most common method for doing that, but there are some pros and cons with this approach. Um, so the pros really are that it is quite flexible in how you're, you're specifying the, uh, the mixing distribution. You can do it to a subset of variables, you can do an error correlation model, um, it, it is sort of seen as the most flexible uh, modeling structure uh, in a lot of uh, circles. Uh, you've also got increased parsimony relative to sort of the latent class approach. You're, you're basically adding in a single additional variable. You do have to do typically maximum simulated likelihood if you're using this approach, uh, um, which can add to sort of the computational intensity uh, of estimating the model and, and potentially applying it. But as far as the actual parameters you're estimating, uh, that's a little bit lower. Uh, the cons of this approach are that it does potentially lead to unwanted assumptions, i.e. you could have sort of a negative value of travel time savings. So either you're, you're willing to pay more to travel more, uh, which is not necessarily a realistic uh, assumption, typically. 
Uh, you also are generally lacking behavioral interpret interpretability when you're using a mixed logit. You're getting sort of a, a sense of that there is a distribution in preference in the population, but you don't really have a sense of where or why that preference is occurring. Uh, and you compare this to sort of a more latent class modeling approach, uh, there's a fair bit of evidence suggesting that you're actually improving your overall fit relative to mixed logit uh, using um, indicators like Bayesian information criterion. Um, and you're also getting um, uh, insight into uh, why you're basically seeing heterogeneity through the parameterization of the class membership functions. So you can say that these people uh, explicitly, because of these behavior, uh, because of these uh, sociodemographic variables typically, are less willing to pay or more willing to pay. Uh, the cons of this are that, you know, your IIA assumption inherent with MNL holds within class, assuming that uh, your within class model is a, an MNL model. Uh, and you're also approximating what the true uh, continuous preference distribution of the population is, because you're basically saying uh, that um, it's a discrete distribution where a certain segment of, or a certain percentage of the population has this preference and, and a certain segment of the population has that preference. Um, there is a possibility uh, to combine both models. So you can have a mixed logit within some or all of the latent classes. And ultimately, this is the approach that we ended up taking for, for the work that I'll be presenting in a few slides. Um, so as far as uh, the, the study area that we wanted to look at, we wanted to do sort of a state and preference uh, survey, and um, uh, we were doing it in Calgary. Um, so uh, Calgary is a, a city in uh, the province of Alberta in Canada, so it's in sort of western Canada, and you can see sort of a, a map of uh, a Canada uh, in the bottom left of the screen, and then Calgary's location there. Um, so in particular, we were looking at uh, uh, a section of freeway that passes through um, the um, uh, eastern end of, of Calgary. So the downtown of Calgary, I'll just sort of see if I can mark it, here is right here. And so the, the section of, of freeway that we were looking at is uh, along the Deerfoot Trail, which is sort of a uh, three to four lane uh, freeway uh, that sort of passes through the eastern edge of uh, downtown Calgary. Um, so, uh, in order to collect this data, we, we can, uh, conducted a, a state of preference survey. I believe it was conducted in, in 2016 or 2017. To be perfectly honest, I wasn't involved in the, the actual data collection. Uh, it was before uh, I came to the University of Calgary. Um, so I'm, I'm not 100% sure. I would have to maybe go and check the paper. Uh, but uh, in total, we were looking at sort of a, a, a binary response between either traveling in a high occupancy toll lane or a general purpose lane. Uh, so it was a binary uh, choice between the two. Um, and in total, each respondent answered, I believe, uh, 15 different um, choice scenarios. So each uh, respondent would have to pick uh, between either HOT or GP lane uh, 15 times. Uh, so these are the attributes that we, we used. Uh, I believe uh, the uh, experimental design was done sort of using uh, a constrained random factorial approach. Um, uh, and um, so, so things like uh, five minute travel time on the HOT lane versus 30 minute travel time on the, the GP lane with a, with a price of, of $1, I think, wasn't something that was included. There, there were some constraints around, around sort of making sure things didn't um, make no sense. Uh, and then a number of sort of uh, trip characteristics were also tested. Um, so uh, uh, I think the only one that maybe needs a little bit more explanation here is the total travel distance. Um, um, uh, attribute. Um, so the respondents were traveling along that section of the Deerfoot Trail, uh, but they were, that was part of a larger trip that was uh, potentially, you know, under 10 kilometers, 10 to 20 kilometers, 20 to 40, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so here are some descriptive statistics of the sample. Uh, uh, the key thing I want to note here is that this is very much a, a choice-based sample. It, it was not sort of a representative of the population. And that, that has some, some pros and cons. It, the pro is that it is much easier to collect the, the data. Uh, the con is, unfortunately, uh, that if you're trying to use it for forecasting, that can be a little bit more challenging. So some key places where it's not necessarily representative of the population is that we drastically oversampled uh, the number of uh, respondents that um, uh, had high uh, educational attainment. So bachelor's degree or more uh, right here. Uh, I believe the, the, um, 
uh, average population rate for a bachelor's degree or more within the population is closer to, to 30% uh, for Calgary. Uh, the other thing that's uh, sort of unfortunate about this sample is that uh, we weren't actually able to sample anyone over the age of 65. Um, so, well, technically I've got here percentage of the, the sample that's over the age of 50, that's f technically 50 to 65. I don't think there was anyone or there was maybe only one or two responses uh, within the entire sample that were over the age of 65. So it is not necessarily a truly representative sample of, of, of the population and that does present some challenges. Um, um, so as far as the actual modeling work that we did, we estimated uh, a number of different models. Um, so we've got sort of a standard MNL model, um, and then uh, a random parameter mixed logit model, uh, and then um, a two class latent class model, three class latent class, four class, five class, and then a three class random parameter latent class model, um, where uh, I believe class two had um, uh, a random uh, mixed logit rather than a, an MNL, uh, as you would do with sort of the more standard latent class approach. Um, so uh, all the models were sort of tested based on, on overall goodness of fit and looking at uh, the Bayesian information criterion. Uh, the one thing that I will note here is that it does look like class five beats out class four slightly in the, the BIC. Um, however, what we ended up finding was that a number of parameters ended up being quite, quite insignificant, whereas in class four, they were all significant. So uh, if you read sort of the uh, Green and Hencher paper that sort of talks about the development of, of latent class models, they say that, um, parameters sort of stopping, uh, no longer being significant is potentially a sign of, of overfitting. So we ended up sort of scrapping that, that five class model and just sort of using the four class model. So in, in, the, in the paper, we presented uh, both sort of the, the four class model and then the three class random parameter model. And I'll be focusing more so on the three class random parameter model for the, for the rest of the, the presentation. Um, so here are the model results. I'm not gonna spend too much time talking about uh, the table. I know that kind of gets boring. Uh, I don't generally like it when presenters do that in conferences. I, I find it uh, is more interesting to more talk about the re results more sort of um, uh, in, in sort of a, a text format where you're discussing it a little bit more clearly. The one thing I will say is that uh, most if not all of the parameters were, were significant and sort of had a, a correct or sort of a, a rational or, or, or um, a, a intuitive sign. Uh, that's the word I'm looking for. Um, so um, what I really want to do want to talk about is sort of the class membership discussion, because I think that's where the, the key policy insights uh, from this, this work uh, can be sort of uh, gained. Um, so what we found for class one was that it tended towards uh, 30 to 50 year old men who didn't have a university degree, who were only making one or two trips a day, uh, and who uh, uh, never carpool and not being in the lowest income bracket. Uh, conversely, we found class two were women under the age of 30, again, no university degree, making multiple trips a day, uh, sort of middle income range, and then also individuals not placing uh, a lot of value on uh, time savings, travel enjoyment, or travel reliability. And then class three, we treated as our reference, so we didn't, it was basically everybody else within the population. Uh, we're also able to calculate uh, value of travel time and elasticities for each of our classes. Um, so. Uh, what we found for class one and class two was that their um, value of travel times were well below uh, sort of the average wage, wage rate in Calgary, which is I think in sort of the 20 to 25 Canadian dollars an hour range, and, and even well below the minimum wage rate, which is I believe $14 an hour. Uh, and then class three is much more in line with what we're sort of expecting uh, people would be willing to pay. Um, so uh, we also calculated elasticities. We didn't do this for the three class random parameter um, model. Uh, and that's because uh, there's a, a fair bit of computational burden associated with calculating elasticities for mixed logit. So effectively I was a little bit lazy and just said, okay, well, we'll do it for the four class and forget it for the three class. Um, and really this can also be justified because uh, particularly for class one and class two, um, uh, the membership functions for these classes were quite similar between the three class random parameter and the, the four class model. Uh, and basically the, the key finding here is that we're seeing an inverse in time and cost sensitivity from class one and class two to class three and class four. So class one and class two are, are quite insensitive to time relatively. Uh, and then class four uh, and class three and class four rather are, are uh, much less sensitive to time and much more sensitive 
uh, are much more sensitive to time, ra rather, and much less sensitive to cost. So um, ultimately, the combination of the class membership functions, the, the value of travel times, and the elasticities suggests that there's actually a degree of polarization and preference and willingness to use uh, the HOT lanes. Um, members of, of, of class one and class two are basically much less likely to value time savings associated with these lanes uh, than the rest of the population, and therefore they're probably not going to use them. So if you implement them, they, they probably won't be interested. Um, so this actually raises a number of policy questions if we're thinking about implementing these lanes. Um, so how are these groups represented in the population of Calgarians, and, and more particularly the, the users of Deerfoot Trail? Uh, and if uh, these groups are sort of widely represented in the population, what can we potentially do to encourage them to, to use uh, um, HOT lanes uh, if they are implemented? Um, so one of the things we can do, given that we don't actually have a, a representative sample, is sort of look at um, overall census data for, for Calgary. Um, um, the, the downside of this is that we only have a subset of the variables uh, used to define class membership. Um, and the census is quite aggregate and there's limited ability to cross tabulate to get a, a, a percentage of the people that are probably members of, of one class versus the other. Um, uh, that being said, we can look at the marginal distributions uh, of certain key variables and we'll do that for class one on the next slide and, and, and basically use that to get some insight into the prevalence of different factors influencing class membership within the population. Um, so as I alluded to early, uh, approximately 33% of the population have a university uh, degree or a bachelor degree, uh, and class one membership is defined by not having one of these degrees. Um, so that 33% is higher actually than the provincial rate, uh, but it still places basically two thirds of the population into class one, potentially. Um, we also note that there's lower commuting carpooling rates, uh, and it seems to be quite gender dependent. So only 3% of men versus 7% of women uh, are carpooling for commuting purposes. Uh, well, we can't say for sure that this means they'll never carpool. This does suggest a, a certain amount of unwillingness to carpool, um, uh, potentially suggesting that th there is a, a significant number of people that are in uh, class one again. Uh, we've got sort of a, a you know, a, a slightly higher than um, uh, normal or sort of Canadian average rate of men falling into that 30 to 50 age category, which is also a marker for class one. Um, for trip rates, we had to sort of move away from census because uh, that's not information that's collected. Uh, but there was sort of a, a summary report from household travel surveys in 2001, noting a decrease in overall trip rates per person relative to 2001. So we're potentially seeing Calgarians travel less um, uh, overall. Uh, and again, that's sort of a marker for class class one membership. And then finally, uh, we do see sort of the vast majority of households having uh, an income above sort of that, that 30,000 Canadian a year. Uh, this does suggest that there are a significant number of individuals who fit some of the markers for class one membership, but we can't necessarily confirm absolutely. It does sort of imply that, that we do have something to worry about. We are uh, implementing HOT lanes as far as encouraging people to use them or be okay with them. Um, so what can we do to address this? Um, so we can pilot and let the benefits become apparent. Um, so uh, another thing we can do within this is if we are adding HOT lanes, maybe we tie the uh, uh, HOT lane implementation to the construction of new lanes. And that sort of limits that sense of paying for something that was once free uh, that we were talking about earlier. Um, we could also use dynamic time of day pricing. Um, so make the HOT lanes general purpose during off peak periods. Uh, initially, and then maybe move towards sort of more 24-hour um, HOT lanes, and that'll allow uh, these individuals time to adjust. We could target advertisements to, uh, you know, uh, demographic indicators uh, of people that are unwilling to, to use the lanes. Uh, and then finally, uh, it does seem that uh, um, both class one and class two members are um, um, a little bit more cost sensitive. Um, uh, versus time sensitive. Uh, so maybe creating an express transit service that's going to be cheaper than sitting in sort of 30 minutes of congestion uh, that can use the, the HOT lane um, uh, might encourage them. Though again, that is sort of a limitation of our study and that we're only looking at um, the binary choice between uh, GP lanes and, and HOT lanes. And then 
you know, I'd be very interested to hear if the audience has any other suggestions. One of the, the criticisms we got in the review was that our, our policy analysis was a little bit weak. The modeling was, was interesting, but more policy would be good. So if anyone's got any advice, that would be great. Um, so as far as limitations for the study, um, I mentioned one already in that we're only considering that binary choice. It'd be nice to consider carpooling or express transit service. Um, uh, we also missed a couple of key attributes in the data collection. So it'd be nice to have sort of employment categories. One of the sort of initial hypothesis, hypotheses we were thinking about was that, you know, it's potentially tied to individuals working in the oil and gas sector who sort of rely on uh, driving to, to, you know, uh, keep their jobs. Uh, and they're going to be less willing to have to pay for, for driving uh, more than they already do. Uh, and then finally, you know, we do have a convenient sample that makes it a little bit difficult to apply the, the model for forecasting. Um, so uh, with that, you know, thank you for, for your attention. I'd be very happy to take questions at this point, and I'll just uh, stop sharing my screen. Okay. Thank you, Adam, for your excellent presentation. Now I will take on question from uh, uh, Jason. He wants to know, I, I assume there is no RP data here because there is no hot HOT now. Will that bias your WTP measures? Uh, yes, of, of course. Um, you know, I, I know, Jason, that you were at um, the, the last IATBR in Santa Barbara. And, you know, uh, uh, there was a, a keynote uh, session, I think, on, on the, the last day or the second day talking about, you know, strong issues with um, uh, SP data and it being sort of biased uh, as far as willingness to pay. Um, it is a limitation. One, one thing we could do is estimate uh, or, or compare uh, these numbers to um, uh, uh, willingness to pay or value of time measures that you would get from sort of a, a model estimated on, on RP data. Um, we haven't done that, uh, though that could be something that we could add in the paper pretty easily, I'm pretty sure. Uh, okay, thank you. So is there anyone who wants to ask anything? We have uh, still five to eight minutes. Around. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Doctor. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Adam Weiss, uh, for your nice presentation. And I think I I, I also want to thank all the participants uh, in this session. Uh, particularly, I would like to mention my co-moderator, uh, Dr. Uh, Asemi, uh, to cooperate with me. And also, I would like to um, uh, uh, thank uh, Professor Dr. Kara Kukelman, uh, whose active participation has made this uh, session more uh, engaged and uh, lively. So, and, uh, Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, my name is Ali Reza Ermagan, and I'm co-hosting this session with my colleague, Aditi. Uh, we hope you have enjoyed our virtual conference. This is our last session, as I said, and uh, as you know, we kept always the best for the last. Uh, we have two fascinating presentations around the theme of uh, travel behavior. Uh, our first presentation uh, by Montahit is about biking speed in a city in the south of Canada's British Columbian province. Uh, he used uh, machine learning techniques to prepare the data and develop a set of regression models for his analysis. And I hope you are as excited as I am to hear uh, his findings. Our, our second presentation by Shopayan is about uh, understanding the traffic demand distribution using an agent-based model. Uh, you will hear how and to what extent the commuter's tolerance towards congestion affects the traffic demand during his presentation. So without wasting any more time, I'm going to uh, give a brief introduction about our first presenter and uh, would ask uh, Mantiha to share the screen and to start his presentation. So Montahit Orvin uh, recently received his Master of Science degree and uh, currently is a civil engineering PhD student at the University of British Columbia. Uh, his research interests include the travel behavior of shared mobility users and integrated land use and transportation planning. 
he likes playing football. I'm not sure though that you know he meant soccer or football, but he likes playing football and exploring new places. So um, I would like to ask Montagui to uh, start the presentation and uh, I hope all you enjoy uh, this presentation. Thank you. Uh, so good, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I am presenting uh, my research work, uh, Modeling Bicyclist uh, Speed Choice. And the outline I will follow uh, starts with uh, an introduction, uh, followed by the background and literature review. And after that, uh, objectives, uh, followed by data, methodology, and results. And finally, uh, the con conclusions. So this study basically develops uh, a model for bicyclist speed uh, using the GPS data. And uh, this study also in, uh, improves the GPS data cleaning procedure technique by applying a machine learning algorithm. And it develops a Latin segmentation based linear regression model and advanced regression model for analyzing the bicyclist speed. And during this modeling technique, it formulates a flexible segment allocation model uh, within the Latin segmentation linear regression framework. Furthermore, it also captures uh, unobserved heterogeneity by allocating the trip points into discrete Latin segments. And finally, this study also tests the effects of weather built environment and accessibility characteristics on bicyclist speed. So uh, bicycle is prepared as a comparatively faster commute mode uh, for traveling shorter distances and speed is an important level of service measure uh, for the urban transportation network. Now uh, it is critical to predict the speed of the bicyclist to promote uh, the bicycle uh, as an effective alternative mode and ensure effective uh, infrastructure investment decision making. In recent times, technological advancement have newer and emerging data sources such as the GPS data and the prediction accuracy of bicyclist speed largely depends on the accuracy of the GPS trip trajectory. Therefore, it is important to develop advanced method to improve the trip trajectory identification procedure of the GPS records. And it is also important to analyze the disaggregate level bicyclist speed for varying special and temporal uh, characteristics. Now, uh, for liter uh, the literature review, uh, in the case of modeling, uh, previous uh, study examined how average speed varies uh, by bicycling facility types and surrounding environment along the road network. Another study developed multi-level uh, linear mixed model uh, to analyze the bicycle speed for Toronto. So, uh, based on these studies, it is identified that majority of the existing research uh, have adopted an aggregate approach by considering the average speed of the bicyclist. And another research gap is that uh, most of the stud previous studies developed a normal regression model, which actually uh, cannot capture the unobserved heterogeneity. In the case of a GPS data processing technique, a previous study uh, used a rule-based approach to identify the erroneous GPS records. And another study followed this kind of technique and uh, the results suggested that they eliminated a high percentage of trip points during the filtering process of the GPS data, which in many cases are not uh, or might not be erroneous. So, Further research is uh, required to develop advanced uh, uh, techniques such as machine learning algorithm to improve the GPS data uh, processing method. Now this study evolves within uh, the two uh, objectives. Uh, the objective one is adopting a machine learning algorithm to improve the trip trajectory identification procedure of the GPS records and the objective two is uh, to develop a, an advanced regression model to investigate bicyclist speed. 
Now the primary source of data, uh, City of Kelowna, in partnership with Job Bike, a Canadian-based bike share company, uh, operated dockless bike share service in Kelowna uh, from July to November of 2018. And those dockless bikes uh, were equipped with GPS devices that actually enables uh, so many uh, uh, raw GPS data, which actually include information regarding the trip ID, time stamp, and coordinates of the trip trajectories. This data actually utilized uh, to uh, generate the instantaneous speed of the bicyclist. And uh, uh, from the data, it is observed that almost 19,601 uh, trips uh, were uh, recorded uh, with a point, almost approximate uh, 0.6 million trip points or trip projected points. Now, uh, some other data sources are also collected from uh, various uh, sources. Uh, such as the weather attributes, uh, which include uh, temperature, rainfall, uh, snowfall, uh, wind chill index, are actually extracted from Environment Canada. Uh, neighborhood features, which include uh, employment density, population density, dwelling type, among others, are collected from Statistics Canada. And the transportation infrastructure and land use characteristics, such as bicycle infrastructure, bus stop, land use types, sent, uh, Central Business District etc. Uh, information are collected from City of Kelowna. Here, uh, two indexes are also calculated: the bike index and the land use index. So, bike index is basically generated by using uh, a number of indicators, which actually influences the bikeability, and it is actually ranges from a value zero to one. So, a bike index value closest to one signifies that uh, higher bike friendliness area. And uh, if it is close to zero, that means uh, lower uh, bike bikeability in that region. Similar uh, to bike index, land use index also varies uh, from zero to one. And a value closer to one actually denotes a heterogeneous uh, land, land mix. And a value closer to zero uh, denotes uh, almost homogeneous land use. Now, the location of activity points are also collected uh, uh, from DMTI special, and these data include uh, the recreational activity points, uh, food store, school, park, lake, and retail stores, etc. Now, uh, a brief data analysis. Uh, this is the distribution of speed uh, for uh, temporal and spatial characteristic, as you can see. Uh, the average speed is uh, comparably higher in bike lane and cycle track uh, than uh, that of shared uh, path. Uh, also, it is observed that uh, during weekday, the 85th percentile speed is found as almost 25 km per hour. And during the weekend day, the 85, uh, 85th percentile speed is found as uh, about 18 km per hour. And it is also observed that uh, during the off-peak hour, uh, the average speed is comparatively higher uh, than the morning peak period. Uh, here, uh, the variation of the speed for several built environment attributes are illustrated. As you can see, with the increase of ADT, uh, the speed is decreasing uh, to some extent. Uh, also, uh, in the case of distance to intersection, with the increase of the uh, distance of the bicyclist from the intersection, the speed is uh, increasing. So the uh, bicyclists are more uh, likely to travel faster away from the intersection. And uh, for the mean elevation, as you can see, uh, if the elevation is increased, the bicyclist is traveling slower, which is expected. And also uh, with the increase of the length of cycle facility, the bicycle speed is also uh, found uh, higher. Now the GPS data processing method. Uh, here a density-based special clustering algorithm uh, is utilized, uh, which is actually a DB scan algorithm, density-based special clustering of application with noise. And uh, it actually detects the dense uh, region by classifying the data points closer to each other based on the distance measurement. And it identifies the outliers uh, quite effectively. And there are actually basically two parameters uh, in this DB scan algorithm, which is uh, the neighborhood radius R and the number of uh, minimum points uh, within that neighborhood uh, radius R, which is N. Now, there are actually three types of points. One is the core point, uh, 
other one is the border point and the last one is the noise point as you can see the core point uh, is is considered as a core point if it has more than n number of points within that r uh, radius now the border point has a fewer number of uh, points uh, uh, few, uh, n, uh, fewer than n number of points within that r radius however it includes at least one core point so this is actually a core point and this is actually a border point because it includes fewer than n number of points and includes at least one core point here a point neither a border point nor a core point is considered as a noise point so this division algorithm identifies these noise points and we actually discarded those noise points from the trip trajectory and we use uh, that filtered data for uh, the modeling modeling and the validation purpose Now, uh, the modeling method, uh, the linear regression framework for the speed uh, choice model uh, can be expressed uh, like this. Here, this is the error term here, and X is the built environment uh, attribute, and beta S is the segment specific constant. And the segment uh, allocation model can be expressed like this. Here, alpha is the segment membership coefficient, and phi is the segment membership, uh, uh, segment membership coefficient and alpha is the segment membership constant and x is the segment membership uh, attribute the unconditional probability can be written like this and finally the parameter estimation is uh, 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 est uh, the parameters are estimated uh, by using the maximum log likelihood uh, 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 method by using this log likelihood function Now the GPS data processing result, the db scale algorithm discards about 8% of the trip points and uh, we also applied a rule-based method, uh, some arbitrary uh, rules uh, to eliminate uh, the uh, uh, noise points and uh, that actually eliminates almost 39% uh, of the trip points, which is uh, very higher compared to the db scale algorithm. Now the db scale algorithm actually compared with the uh, rule-based method uh, by using a goodness of fit measure uh, wealth t test and uh, the results suggested that division method outperformed the rule-based method and the sample result for the db scan algorithm as you can see in the figure uh, this is the trip trajectory the raw from the raw data and the db scan method actually identifies these two points as the noise points so we discarded these two uh, points and ultimately uh, this trip trajectory is used uh, for the modeling purpose now as you can see some of these points are not aligned to the road network so uh, we used a geometric map matching algorithm uh, by using the uh, ArcGIS uh, to map match these points within the aligned uh, road network. So this is the uh, result after we apply the map matching algorithm uh, for a particular intersection. Now the goodness of fit measures of the uh, models, uh, uh, the number of segments are determined based on the AIC and BIC measures. As you can see, for two Latin segment, uh, the AIC uh, is lower comparatively to the, uh, also the BIC and AIC, both are actually lower comparatively uh, to the three segment uh, linear regression model. So as we, as we know, the lower AIC and BIC fits the data best. So, for the further discussion, this two Latin segment linear regression model is uh, used. And this model is also compared with the OLS, uh, the ordinary least square regression and random parameter linear regression model. And based on the AIC measure, uh, it can be concluded that the two Latin segment linear regression model outperform the other models. Now, this is the segment allocation result. The segments are allocated by using the trip characteristic, land use, and neighborhood features. As you can see, the morning peak is showing negative sign in segment one. Uh, that means there is higher likelihood to include the morning uh, peak period in segment two. Now, weekend actually uh, showing positive sign in segment one, which means segment one has higher likelihood to include in segment one. Here for the segment allocation model, the segment two is acted as a reference uh, segment. Now in summary, uh, uh, it can be concluded that segment one has higher likelihood to include recreational suburban trips made in summer season. And segment two has higher likelihood to include
include urban peak or weekend trips made in fall and winter season. Now, the parameter estimation results uh, confirm the effects of weather, uh, road infrastructure, and built environment and accessibility uh, measures uh, on bicyclist speed. I will discuss uh, some uh, key findings from this parameter estimation result. As you can see, the for uh, the bike index with interacted with local road uh, is showing positive sign in both segment one and in segment two. That means there is higher likelihood of bicyclists traveling faster if uh, a higher bikeable environment is present. Uh, with the increased bike index, the bike, bicyclist might travel faster in both segments. The similar result is observed here. Now for distance to intersection, uh, similar positive relationship is observed. That means bicyclists might travel faster if they are actually away from the intersection. And uh, similar positive result is also found for distance to CVD. As you can see, uh, it is uh, showing positive sign in both segment one and segment two, which means bicyclists might travel faster uh, away from the uh, city center or the central business district. Uh, this uh, can be explained by the fact that uh, within the city center, uh, during the congested hour, bicyclists might travel slower. Now, in the case of uh, mean uh, percentage rise of elevation, it is showing negative sign. That means uh, if uh, there is uh, the elevation is higher, the bicyclists might travel slower, which is expected. Now, uh, interestingly, heterogeneity is observed for maximum temperature uh, and variable representing the protected cycle track. As you can see, for protected cycle track, uh, segment one is showing negative sign. On the other hand, segment two is showing positive sign here. So this implies that uh, if a cycle track is present uh, uh, in the urban areas, uh, the, the bicyclists might travel faster. But if it is, uh, uh, if in the case of segment one, which is actually including the recreational suburban trips, the bicyclists might travel Slower, uh, slower, even if there is a cycle track present there. Similar heterogeneity is observed for maximum temperature. As you can see, segment one is showing negative sign. So that means during a summer season, uh, bicyclists might travel slower if uh, hot and humid temperature is existing there. Now uh, for segment two, it is showing positive sign. That means during the fall and winter, if the temperature is increased, bicyclists might uh, be traveling faster. So the model is validated by using a holdout sample and the predictive performance uh, is evaluated uh, in terms of mean absolute deviation and mean squared uh, percentage error uh, measures. As you can see, the MAD, uh, mean absolute deviation value is 3.98, uh, 3 uh, which is uh, lower than that of the random parameter linear regression and OLS regression model. So the Latin segment linear regression model actually predicting uh, comparably better than the other models. And as you can see, uh, the predicted speed using the LSLR model for the validation sample is illustrated here in this figure. And it is observed that bicyclists might travel slower within the urban center and also near uh, the intersection. So this further confirms the satisfactory uh, uh, predictive, uh, predictive performance of the developed model. So uh, the summary of contributions are actually this uh, study develops a machine learning algorithm that improves the trip identification procedure from the GPS records. And uh, this uh, algorithm outperforms the rule-based method in terms of goodness of fit measures. And uh, it develops an advanced regression model that confirms unobserved heterogeneity. And it confirms the effects of weather, road infrastructure, built environment, land use, accessibility, neighborhood, and trip characteristic on bicyclist speed. And the future research scope are uh, comparing the results of this TV scan algorithm with some other machine uh, learning algorithm and uh, focusing on developing advanced map matching technique that include a uh, topological algorithm. And finally, I would like to acknowledge uh, the NSAC Discovery Grant uh, for the funding and also City of Kelowna uh, for uh, providing that data.
Thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, if you have any questions, that's a moment that uh, we take uh, questions and please post on the chat box. We have kind of five, six minutes for questions. Uh, one of the attendees asked that uh, with GPS, are you really able to pinpoint that it was on a sidewalk? And I think your colleague kind of responded that, but I mean, the general question is, uh, did you have any accuracy assessment for your built environment detection algorithm or not? So actually, uh, 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 what is observed in the data is that uh, some of the uh, trip points are actually um, uh, not aligning in the road network or the sidewalk or any bike infrastructure. So. Uh, some of them uh, might be erroneous and some of them uh, might not be erroneous. We actually uh, don't know that uh, uh, before uh, applying uh, the DBSCAN algorithm and the map matching algorithm. Now, uh, the DBSCAN algorithm basically uh, makes a cluster of those points which are actually uh, closer, uh, closer to each other and uh, some of the points are observed such that which are actually uh, not uh, within uh, matching with the aligned uh, trip trajectory of that particular trip. So those points are actually uh, considered as a noise point uh, by the DBSCAN algorithm and the clustering uh, goodness of fit is actually measured by the davis boldon index, DBI index. We actually measured that because we have actually two parameters for the DBSCAN algorithm, which is uh, the radius R and the number of uh, points N. So if uh, this N and R is not uh, detected correctly, uh, uh, the DBSCAN algorithm uh, might not uh, cluster it effectively. So we act, uh, the lower the DBI index and the better is the clustering as we know. So we actually uh, uh, set uh, make a trial for a combination of this R and N which actually uh, yields the lower DBI. And the, well, uh, the combination of R and N which actually uh, yields us the lower DBI, we actually took that combination for uh, the DBSCAN clustering. Now, even after the DBSCAN clustering, some of the points are actually deviating from the road network or the bicycle infrastructure network. That's why we, have, uh, we actually go for the geometric map matching algorithm of ArcGIS, which actually uh, matching those points, which are actually uh, 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 a bit uh, closer uh, to those road network points and it, it actually snaps uh, from uh, that point to the closest uh, road segment. It might be sidewalk, it might be bicycle uh, lane or it might be cycle track or it might be the sidewalk. Yeah. Sounds good. Uh, any other questions? Okay, uh, I, I have a question. Uh, yeah. So when you did your analysis and you tested different variables, your temporal and spatial uh, variables, uh, was there anything that surprised you in the findings or things that did not work out in the way that you hypothesized for any variables? Uh, yeah, there were some actually, uh, because uh, for the final model, uh, I actually tested uh, for several attributes and uh, I only included uh, those variables which are actually coming uh, reasonably uh, significant and explainable. Uh, like, uh, as you can see, uh, the bike index is showing positive sign in uh, both segment uh, in our uh, estimation result. But surprisingly for a cycle track, uh, it is showing uh, heterogeneity in uh, across the segments. So. It is not that uh, only cycle track actually influencing the bicyclists to travel faster. Uh, the fact is uh, uh, the overall bike friendliness environment uh, might be contributing uh, to the bicyclist speed uh, to a great extent. Uh, that is what actually uh, the result actually suggests. So this is actually an interesting finding in terms of uh, policy making and investment, uh, and investment decision making uh, because uh, uh, most of the actually uh, city planners are uh, are actually investing a lot in the only the cycle uh, building the cycle track or uh, developing the bike lanes. But the thing is that uh, 
the overall bike friendliness environment it might uh, because this bike index thing is actually a contribution of several factors you know the uh, presence of park the presence of lake presence of activity points the heterogeneous land mix number of uh, bus stops within the neighborhood all are actually uh, contributed to generate this bike index and uh, if we can actually generate uh, this bike friendliness environment i think uh, the bicyclist uh, speed uh, might be improved yeah. and it, and it will be also helpful for uh, designing the uh, bicyclist uh, uh, signal in the intersection as well Thank you so much. Uh, if you have any more question or any questions uh, for this presentation, you can join uh, the discussion room, uh, the, uh, the, the room chat and talk about it and discuss the uh, results or talk with the author later or feel free to reach out to the author later. Uh, yeah, sure. And for your presentation, uh, Montahit, uh, we will move to our last presentation uh, by Shubhayan Okil. Uh, Shopayan's presentation, as I mentioned earlier, is about how traffic demand distribution in peak hours is uh, impacted by commuters' tolerance towards congestion. Uh, while Shopayan is preparing uh, the slides for presentation, I'm going to give a brief uh, introductory about him. He's currently working uh, with the World Resource Institute in India, but he will start his PhD in urban and regional planning at the University of Michigan this fall. So, uh, Shopayan, I encourage you to be in touch with uh, Aditi. Uh, she is a research assistant professor in the Department of Civil Engineering. Uh, so, and I'm sure that you share a lot in common in terms of research interests. Uh, Shupayan's research interests uh, are primarily in analyzing the influence of non-financial cost factors on travel behavior. And the fun fact about him is he likes to release his adrenaline by scuba diving, skydiving, and bungee jumping. So uh, I, I would like to welcome you and uh, we are excited to hear your presentation. Thank you, Dr. Morgan. Uh, yeah, I'll share my screen now. So hello everyone. Uh, so primarily the motivation behind this study was uh, actually analysis I did uh, for peak spreading uh, using the Illinois tollway data. We found that due to the construction happening on a toll road, uh, the traffic actually had shifted to an alternate toll road during peak period and which over a period of time we found that had the peak traffic had actually uh, diverted to the shoulder hours. And uh, we've, through the study, we have tried to actually simulate the same using an agent-based modeling approach. So the outline for this study is that I'll start with explaining the need for the study and why agent-based model has been used as a tool to do the study. Then I'll delve into the model details, explaining the environmental environment, model environment, the parameters, uh, then the framework and the decision rules used as part of the modeling framework. And finally, I'll explain the sense study results and the scenarios and uh, uh, conclude with the future scope of the study. So, um, I think... So, sorry, uh, sorry to interrupt. We cannot... Uh, can you guys see the big screen showing the slides? I, I cannot see that. And then we can also see your notes. Do you mind to oh, uh, uh, shift sorry. to the, the view mode? I, okay, sorry. Yeah. Okay, that's right. Is it fine now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So I think uh, all of us are aware about congestion being a big issue in a lot of metropolitan areas, which is definitely lead leads to delay and impacts the economy and the environment. So the graph here shows uh, the average delay experienced by commuters in the top 10 metropolitan areas across the United States with uh, Los Angeles area topping the list with having 119 hours of delay per year for a commuter. Uh, there have actually several uh, tedium strategies have been used to combat congestion. And in addition to these strategies, commuters also try to self-regulate their travel uh, so as to avoid traffic congestion by either ch changing their travel route or time or the travel mode. 
So change in departure time is uh, actually a very popular choice made by commuters so that they can reduce the congestion they experience. And uh, this uh, reduces the peak hour traffic as a result and the commuters shift to the shoulder hours, which is essentially what the phenomenon of peak spreading is about. Uh, coming to the literature, uh, they, they have been studies which have actually tried to include peak, art, uh, peak spreading phenomenon as part of traffic forecasts uh, using annual K factors or discrete choice models. Uh, there have also been studies which have actually done uh, use agent based models to model the departure time choice and how it leads to peak hour uh, traffic spread using uh, empirically defined search rules. Uh, and have tried to actually analyze the agent level, level interactions, which I would like to call as decoding the black box essentially. But uh, they've really actually looked at how the demand, uh, traffic demand distribution percentage uh, changes between the peak and the shoulder hours. Also, uh, most of these studies have actually assumed that the decision rules to change the departure time is similar for all commuters. Uh, uh, dependent on the travel environment they face or there exists a uh, categorical heterogeneity that is the agents are categorized based on their inherent and socioeconomic characteristics. Uh, to my knowledge, uh, these uh, studies which have uh, tried modeling peak uh, spread using ABM and looked at its impact on traffic distribution during the peak period hours have not actually done it using a continuous heterogeneity distribution of these uh, inherent and socioeconomic characteristics. Therefore, through this study, what we have tried to analyze is the role of continuous heterogeneity distribution in inherent and socioeconomic characteristics amongst the commuters on the agent level interactions and the traffic demand distribution between the peak hours. So why ABM? We would know that discrete choice models are uh, able to incorporate the differences in the inherent and socioeconomic characteristics to the socioeconomic variables, as well as using different statistical distributions. However, the, we are not able to actually understand, it's difficult to understand the agent level behavior interactions through uh, discrete choice models. So ABM actually helps in understanding these micro level behavioral mechanisms, uh, which will help, which particularly for this study would help to understand how this leads to shift of the travel hours from peak to shoulder hours, and uh, which can be helpful in evaluating and designing policies uh, that are aimed at mitigating congestion. So the main research questions which I've tried to uh, uh, answer through the study is that how uh, the traffic demand distribution in the peak period is impacted if commuters who constitute the demand can withstand congestion and if it, the, uh, their tolerance towards congestion is heterogeneous amongst the commuters. The second question we've tried to answer through this is how uh, through the study is how the toll value or the percentage of people who are able to pay toll uh, changes with the varying traffic demand as well as variation in the heterogeneity uh, of tolerance uh, towards congestion amongst the commuters. So the uh, model was actually uh, developed uh, on NetLogo, which is a programmable agent-based modeling environment. The, it is a very stylized prototype model, and the focus was on developing a synthetic simplified environment, uh, which has simple decision structures for the agents. Uh, the model environment has uh, a highway link, which consists constitutes of 264 patches representing a highway, uh, which you can see on the uh, 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 slide here in the interface, and uh, which uh, this link connects the origin and the destination. And uh, so the link capacity is actually assumed to be 264 vehicles per hour. Uh, the model tries and simulates uh, the traffic distribution during the morning peak period of a workday for three different intervals, uh, pre-peak, post-peak, uh, peak, and the post-peak hour, each having a duration of one hour. So uh, as the focus of this study was not on uh, tr uh, trying to predict the traffic demand, we, have, uh, we did not use exact departure times. Instead, we have used time intervals in the peak period so as to simplify the, uh, mo the model and reduce the computation burden. We also have a fourth time interval, which is the beyond post-peak hour which is actually the time interval in which commuters who are not able to travel in either of the three hours get to travel. So the combined link capacity for this, uh, uh, the, uh, for the three hours is uh, 792 vehicles, uh, as, with, as the uh, each hour capacity was 264 vehicles. The, the agents simulated in this uh, model are cars. Uh, we took the combined link capacity at 792 vehicles and as, uh, took that uh, as the maximum number of commuters 
that could travel from the origin to the destination, uh, assuming every person can travels alone in the car. Also, as uh, the commuters are assumed to be heading to work, we don't really expect to change their travel hours very drastically beyond the post uh, in the peak period. So the model is actually run for 300 ticks or a period of 100 days with each three ticks representing the three hours uh, travel hours of the day. The model parameters, uh, firstly, percentage of working population uh, is a global parameter, which actually defines the percentage of population who commute to work. It also indirectly gives the total demand, which is there in the three hours with respect to the total capacity. The cycle actually defines number of days uh, each commuter travels in the same hour before uh, evaluating if there's a need to change the travel hour. So the default value was set to five days because we found that the parameter is not, the model is not very sensitive to this parameter. Uh, then the list of agent level parameters, preferred travel hour, which is uh, the, which defines the hour in which a commuter wishes to travel. Uh, for this, for the first cycle, we have, we, it was calculated, uh, it is calculated for each agent by assigning a P car as the preferred travel hour for 60% of the agents and the rest 40% were assigned uh, one of the shoulder hours either the pre-peak or the post-peak car randomly. Then the tolerance towards congestion uh, actually defines the ability of a com uh, commuter to withstand congestion before deciding to change the travel hour. Uh, we could have calculated as a function of the characteristics of the travel traveler and the contextual factors. However, as we are more interested in understanding how analyzing the impact of heterogeneity in the tolerance towards congestion amongst the commuters, we have used a truncated normal distribution to estimate the uh, tolerance value for each of the agents. Uh, the next parameter uh, was ability to pay toll, which defines if a commuter is able to, uh, can travel in the peak hour or not based on their ability to pay toll if a toll is charged. Uh, randomly selected agents uh, based on the percentage value were assigned uh, ability to pay toll and the rest of them were not allowed to pay toll. Uh, 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 and finally, the actual travel hour is the hour in which a commuter actually travels. So uh, the modeling framework, when the first day actually begins, uh, the commuters are produced at the origin based on their uh, percentage of working population and they're assigned a, a preferred travel hour. The first day is actually randomly uh, assigned to each commuter amongst the five days of the first cycle. This is done so as to stagger the day at the end of the cycle on which commute, each commuter evaluates their travel, if a travel hour change is needed or not. So that not all the commuters who want to change their travel hour actually do it on the same day. So based on their initial preferred travel hour, they either get to travel in the pre peak hour or the peak hour uh, or, or the post peak hour in a sequential manner. Uh, in this process, they experience congestion and may get deferred to a subsequent hour if the traffic demand in that hour is more than the uh, link capacity for early link capacity. Uh, to simplify this process, we have actually not gone ahead and simulated the actual movement of the cars because uh, to calculate the congestion because our main focus was on the demand distribution between the three hours. So each commuter travels for the length of the cycle and uh, then uh, updates their travel hour based on it. Uh, the commute hour in each cycle is decided based on the on frequentist inference and average congestion for the cycle is actually calculated based on the, this commute hour. So uh, these are the decision heuristics or the rules which each commuter uses to uh, decide if the, they want to update their travel hour or not, and which is the travel hour they would be choosing for the next cycle. So we've actually, rather than using data to derive these rules, we have designed a more stylized model. We're using behavioral theory and logical decision-making, so as to define these rules. Um, definitely, there's a more empirical research needed to uh, uh, improve the model conceptually. So firstly, to decide if a change in travel hour is required or not, uh, the commuter, uh, there were four main conditions. Uh, firstly, if a commuter gets to travel in their preferred hour or not, if they experience congestion or not, if they can pay toll or not, and if they get def deferred to the uh, beyond uh, peak travel period or not. So, so I won't delve into the how exactly uh, they, for based on each condition, they decide that which travel hour for the, they choose for the next cycle, but some of the high level characteristics based on which they choose the travel hour for the next hour is, firstly, if there's a high, they have a higher preference for peak hour as compared to shoulder hours, uh, if a commuter gets deferred and does not face congestion, they update their travel hour to this new hour. 
uh, commuters are more sensitive to being late as compared to work as compared to uh, arriving early. Therefore, they would want to start early if they face congestion. Hence, pre-peak has a higher preference than the post-peak hour. Uh, then if the commuters land up in the peak hour, if, and if they are not able to pay toll, they keep a track of it and uh, use it to update their travel hour for the next cycle. Finally, the commuters actually retain their original travel hour if the changing it still defers them to the next hour. So uh, uh, the, we've used actually three evaluation metrics in order to understand the individual and aggregate level equilibrium. They were the distribution of traffic demand between the three peak period hours, then the queue at the end of the peak period, and the number com of commuters who are changing their preferred travel hour in each cycle. So uh, in order to understand the individual and the combined impacts of different parameters, we've actually tried doing several sensitivity tests. The first parameter is percentage of working population. Uh, so we found out that as the percentage of working population increases, the commu uh, the uh, uh, the over the aggregate level uh, uh, traffic uh, gets at an equilibrium, as we can see in this graph. However, at an individual level, commuters uh, start changing their travel hour more frequently because of uh, more uh, the increasing congestion levels. Uh, so uh, in order to uh, uh, for us to uh, Yeah, so uh, in order to for us to uh, under, uh, understand the sensitivity of other parameters, we have assumed that 60% uh, as the minimum working population for testing the sensitivity of other parameters. So the next parameter we tested was tolerance towards congestion. Sorry. Yeah, tolerance towards congestion, uh, which has a, which the parameter has a mean and a standard deviation. So we found that uh, the increase in the mean value of uh, tolerance towards congestion uh, amongst the commuters with a working population of 60% or of above increases the amplitude of traffic demand across days that the traffic demand is not stable across the days but it actually decreases the frequency of change in their travel hour. Hence, uh, uh, there's an agent level equilibrium as mean tolerance increases but aggregate level equilibrium decreases as the commuters are able, able to withstand their congestion. So, uh, what, uh, so in order to test if uh, further that if uh, there's an uh, agent level equilibrium as well, we further tested the uh, heterogen the uh, sensitivity by increasing the heterogeneity uh, of tolerance amongst commuters or increasing the standard deviation. So, uh, to explain this uh, uh, heterogeneity parameter for uh, this uh, analysis as well as for the further scenario results. We uh, we have uh, from agent level perspective, as the heterogeneity or standard deviation increases, they, uh, it results in three categories of commuters. Firstly, those who have their uh, tolerance equal to the mean. Secondly, those who have their tolerance higher than the mean, and the third ones have their tolerance lower than the mean value of congestion. Uh, it is to be noted that the standard deviation of the tolerance actually only becomes uh, effective if there's high value of a mean tolerance towards congestion, because at low mean uh, tolerance towards congestion every commuter has low tolerance so that does not really make any difference so if with high mean towards tolerance if the standard deviation is low and all the commuters have homogeneous uh, tolerance then uh, the traffic demand is even across days because uh, 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 because all of them are highly tolerant uh, sorry it's not even across days because all of them are highly uh, tolerant so at an agent level, there's an equilibrium, but at a aggregate level, there's not, there's no equilibrium. But as the heterogeneity increases, commuters who have lower tolerance, they start changing their travel hour and balance out the traffic demand. So now there's, uh, which results in an aggregate level equilibrium. The next parameter we uh, tried was uh, percentage of uh, people who can pay toll or the toll value. So we were able to validate through the model that as the traffic demand increases, the percentage of people who need to pay toll should be decreased or the toll value needs to be increased. Then together with the mean tolerance towards congestion parameter, we found that when the tolerance is low amongst commuters, mean tolerance is low, percentage of commuters who sh should pay toll uh, is should be less because uh, commuters in the sh shoulders are specifically, they keep changing their travel hour frequently and it keeps the traffic demand even in the shoulder hours. But if the mean tolerance is high amongst the commuters, the toll value should be decreased 
because the commuters are highly tolerant and they will change their travel hour only when the traffic demand increases uh, significantly. So based on the scenario results, we tested out two scenarios, a behavioral scenario, which looked at the impact on individual and aggregate le level equilibrium of increasing traffic demand when, when the heterogeneity in tolerance towards congestion amongst commuters also increases and a policy scenario of the percentage of commuters who can pay toll uh, with, uh, when uh, traffic demand is varied with increase in the heterogeneity of tolerance uh, towards congestion amongst the commuters. So for the behavioral scenario, we uh, uh, tried by, uh, we increased the demand in increments of 20% working population and made the tolerance uh, uh, het heterogeneous amongst the commuters. So the model results actually showed that uh, they, gave an, uh, they give an equitable distribution of traffic demand uh, with individual and aggregate level equilibrium uh, when the mean of tolerance to its congestion is heterogeneous amongst the commuters and it actually increases proportionately with the traffic demand. So we tried this particularly for the results show, show, uh, show particularly for the critical working populations of 60% and 80% because uh, below 60% there's no impact of, uh, tra of uh, traffic demand on congestion and above 100% is practically not feasible. So. Uh, we found that for these 60% 80% working populations, the mean tolerance towards congestion uh, should be around 50% and 70%, and the traffic demand gets stabilized as the uh, heterogeneity in tolerances increase or the standard deviation is increased. The table below actually shows the three evaluation metrics. We can see that with increase in the heterogeneity at the mean tolerance levels, the traffic distribution is almost equal in the three hours. And the queue uh, uh, and the queue at the end of the peak period and the number of commuters who change their travel hour actually decrease with increase in the standard deviation of the tolerance. Uh, the next uh, scenario was uh, the toll value under varying heterogeneity in tolerance with congestion. So we already know from the sensitivity test that when you increase when we increase the traffic demand, the percentage of commuters who should pay toll needs to be decreased. So we tested the impact of increasing the heterogeneity in tolerance with increasing demand uh, on a uh, percentage of people who can pay toll for the same working populations of 60 and 80 percent and mean values of uh, uh, tolerance for 15 70 percent which we took from the previous scenario for which we found that the traffic demand was stable so the base uh, standard deviation was set uh, to eight and all the impacts were measured relative to it so uh, we found that uh, when the mean tolerance is just below the percentage of working population with 60% traffic demand, as the heterogeneity in tolerance increases, the toll value should be decreased. The, if we try to understand this from an agent level perspective, uh, when the heterogeneity increases, it in, results in the three categories of the commuters which we had uh, mentioned previously. So the commuters who have a higher tolerance now are actually and but cannot pay toll are actually stuck in the shoulder hours and because of their higher tolerance level they continue travel in the same hour which results in uneven traffic demand across days in these shoulder hours so if we reduce the toll value these commuters will be distributed in the three hours from the initial days of the travel and and uh, that will balance out the traffic in the three hours however when the traffic demand increases to 80 percent uh, we found that the toll value needs to be increased, uh, which divides the commuters into all three hours equitably. From an agent level perspective, in the, this uh, case, the commuters whose tolerance is actually lower than the mean value are come into play, and they need to be restricted to their travel hours or the shoulder hours. Uh, so, in order, so in for that, uh, the toll value needs to be increased. Although they'll not be at, uh, they'll not be uh, a agent level equilibrium, but at an aggregate level, the traffic demand will be even. So finally, the behavior results particularly show that uh, the traffic demand will be from the first scenario. The traffic demand will be at equilibrium, and uh, it will be equitably distributed if uh, commuters have a heterogeneous tolerance to its congestion, and it increases with the growing traffic demand. But the tolerance percentage is slightly lower than the traffic demand percentage for uh, there in order for there to be a scope for to have an intervention from the policy level scenario we could conclude that when the working population percentage increases to a critical value for congestion to occur if the demand is in the lower band of the critical percentage of working population and the mean tolerance is heterogeneous and just below percentage of traffic demand the focus should be on congestion congestion tolerant commuters 
However, if the demand is in the higher band of critical working population, the focus should be shifted to commuters who are intolerant towards congestion. So the main idea behind this study was to get more insights into the system-wide uh, patterns through an agent level understanding, uh, especially uh, which emerged from heterogeneity in the individuals based on their ability to withstand congestion and with changing incentives and the other environmental parameters. So if you're able to for inform this study with uh, appropriate empirical data related to individual agent behaviors, uh, this can be used by policymakers in examining the effectiveness of uh, other de demand management strategies such as time variant tolling or shared travel. Uh, for future work uh, would involve developing more realistic environments, uh, empirically, definitely empirically estimating the parameters in the model to give more realistic results, as well as trying different statistical distributions to define the heterogeneity intolerance. Uh, uh, another thing we would want to explore is varying the cognitive memory amongst the commuters. Uh, so for now, the uh, commuters base uh, their congestion over a period of five days. But we know that there are differences in the way commuters experience memory decay and they weigh older experiences. So if we are able to vary that, that will give us more realistic results. So to sum it up, the study has been primarily more exploratory in nature. And if we, based on the above mentioned things, if you're able to make it more realistic, uh, this will be really helpful for uh, examining uh, uh, several other uh, choices and especially the interaction between the commuters and their behaviors. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, that's it from mine. Thank you, Shopayan, uh, for the presentation. Please, again, if you have any question for Shopayan, please uh, post it on the uh, chat box here so we can ask the question. Are you right now in the States or are you in India? I'm in India. Okay, and uh, how would you travel for you uh, if your classes start in fall? Uh, I'm starting them remotely as of now, but uh, I'll be, I mean, uh, the embassies are still closed. So once they open up, uh, I'll be applying for the visa and traveling. Hopefully by the next semester, I'll be able to travel. Hope so. Okay. Uh, Ali Reza, uh, can I ask a quick take, question? Sure. Go ahead, Aditi. So, uh, Shubhan, I think um, this is a very nice presentation. Thank you so much for presenting. Um, it, it's very interesting. I think you mentioned, but I might have missed, um, about the behavioral models for the agents. Could you right. um, give a little more details on like what kind of behavior models? First of all, is this a data that's like directly from the toll plaza? Like, are you having the social demographic information, or like, how is mm. that? No, so uh, 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 the first uh, question, uh, so uh, answering your first question. So this is more uh, of a theoretical model and we have actually developed the decision heuristics based on uh, existing uh, secondary literature sources. So uh, because we were not able to get the social economic data from the uh, Illinois Tollway, we only got more of a aggregate level data. So we, using which we were able to validate the aggregate level equilibrium results, but not the agent level results we didn't have. So uh, if once uh, like that's uh, why uh, I was, I, uh, if you were able to pro procure empirical uh, like uh, observations of on socioeconomic data, then we can uh, empirically estimate the pat parameters in the model. So that will make it more realistic. So that's why as of now I have used a uh, normal truncated normal distribution, but uh, that uh, was one of the future scope that if we are able to understand what's the actual distribution of, of the uh, heterogeneity amongst the commuters that will make the results more realistic. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, uh, I have a question. So your approach is uh, trying to, uh, I mean, stable the travel demand, and I assume that, you know, it's gonna help the travel time reliability, but Assume that you know uh, uh, I am a DOT, Department of Transportation. You want to sell the point that how you can get the results with you know with this modeling, how you can uh, because your assumption is that you know if the users have a heterogeneous uh, tolerance, how you can change that or you, how you can get to this uh, change in behavior to then see the results uh, uh, on the travel demand. 
So uh, the heterogeneity actually depends on a variety of factors, primarily their arrival time, uh, which is there, the their income levels, the type of work they do, if they have, uh, it's, uh, it's a single uh, family, like a single person household, or they have kids or not. So that will actually uh, 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 vary how much they can tolerate congestion or not. Whether if they have like if they have more flexible work timings, then they'll have they can uh, like that makes them more tolerant to a congestion towards congestion. So, yeah, based on that, uh, primarily a like parameter which we I was able to understand was that when you're like looking at this specific uh, scenario where you the traffic is moving from a suburb or origin to a destination, which would be a CBD, the type of uh, housing you are doing in the housing land use uh, planning which you're doing at the origin of the uh, suburbs if it's a more of a mixed planning of a more with more different uh, like uh, mixed socioeconomic groups that will results in more heterogeneity in the tolerance levels amongst the commuters so which would actually uh, so that's one uh, aspect of it the other would be more from a perspective of these uh, examining the policies such as uh, the tolling policy how it varies uh, with uh, when the heterogeneity increases in the commuters and other policies such as like uh, one thing which we want to want to try or probably wanted to try was ride sharing and how uh, if uh, commuters who was within the same staying within the same family household or within the same community how if uh, they are doing ride sharing how would that impact so together with that uh, if there's a difference in the tolerance towards congestion at a household level how would that impact so that's uh, those like that's another level of segment of it where we can explore how heterogeneity impacts the other parameters it makes sense. So we are going to have a couple minutes just that we are uh, ending this session and uh, the conference. Again, I hope you all enjoyed uh, this session and all the session of this conference. So I would like to ask Aditi if she uh, has uh, something to conclude the session. And I would, I hope that you know you all enjoyed the presentations. Um, well, I think Aliza. Um concluded it very well. Um, there had been a lot of sessions. Um, both of the, um, all of the presentations had been nice. And uh, since I am uh, moderating this session with Ali Reza, I'm particularly biased towards this session. So this has been the best session. And um, really nice presentations. Thank you so much for um, your time. All the presentations will be available in the YouTube channel, um, I believe. Um, yeah, Yanjo has put it on the chat window also. So you can uh, check those presentations out later and uh, we hope to see you next year in PTR3. Thank you so much.